section sixteen of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section sixteen book four part two now it seems to be very obscure why the mystical figure of jawantapal whom miss miller in a note compares to the control spirit of the spiritualistic medium is found in such a disreputable neighbourhood that his nature name was brought into relation with this particular part of the body in order to understand this possibility we must realise that when we produce from the unconscious the first to be brought forth is the infantile material long lost in memory one must therefore take the point of view of that time in which this infantile material was still on the surface if now a much honoured object is related in the unconscious to the anus then one must conclude that something of a high valuation was expressed thereby the question is only whether this corresponds to the psychology of the child before we enter upon this question it must be stated that the anal region is very closely connected with veneration one thinks of the traditional feces of the great mogul an oriental tale has the same to say of christian knights who anointed themselves with the excrement of the pope and cardinals in order to make themselves formidable a patient who is characterized by a special veneration for her father had a fantasy that she saw her father sitting upon the toilet in a dignified manner and people going past greeted him effusively the association of the anal relations by no means excludes high valuation or esteem as is shown by these examples and as is easily seen from the intimate connection of faeces and gold here the most worthless comes into the closest relation with the most valuable this also happens in religious valuations i discovered at that time to my great astonishment that a young patient very religiously trained represented in a dream the crucified on the bottom of a blue flowered chamber pot namely in the form of excrements the contrast is so enormous that one must assume that the valuations of childhood must indeed be very different from ours this is actually the truth children bring to the act of defecation and the products of this an esteem and interest which later on is possible only to the hypochondriac we do not comprehend this interest until we learn that the child very early connects with it a theory of propagation the libido afflux probably accounts for the enormous interest in this act the child sees that this is the way in which something is produced in which something comes out the same child whom i reported in the little brochure uber conflicta der kindlichen seel and who had a well-developed anal theory of birth like little hans whom freud made known to us later contracted a habit of staying a long time on the toilet once the father grew impatient went to the toilet and called do come out of there what are you making whereupon the answer came from within a little wagon and two ponies the child was making a little wagon and two ponies that is to say things which at that time she especially wished for in this way one can make what one wishes and the thing made is the thing wished for the child wishes earnestly for a doll or at heart for a real child that is the child practised for his future biological task and in the way in which everything in general is produced he made the doll himself as representative of the child or of the thing wished for in general 
from a patient i have learned a parallel fantasy of her childhood in the toilet there was a crevice in the wall she fantasied that from this crevice a fairy would come out and present her with everything for which she wished the locus is known to be the place of dreams where much was wished for and created which later would no longer be suspected of having this place of origin a pathological fantasy in place here is told us by lombroso concerning two insane artists each of them considered himself god and the ruler of the world they created or produced the world by making it come forth from the rectum just as the egg of birds originates in the egg canal one of these two artists was endowed with a true artistic sense he painted a picture in which he was just in the act of creation the world came forth from his anus the membrum was in full erection he was naked surrounded by women and with all insignia of his power the excrement is in a certain sense the thing wished for and on that account it received the corresponding valuation when i first understood this connection an observation made long ago and which disturbed me greatly because i never rightly understood it became clear to me it concerned an educated patient who under very tragic circumstances had to be separated from her husband and child and was brought into the insane asylum she exhibited a typical apathy and slovenliness which was considered as effective mental deterioration even at that time i doubted this deterioration and was inclined to regard it as a secondary adjustment i took especial pains to ascertain how i could discover the existence of the affect in this case finally after more than three hours hard work i succeeded in finding a train of thought which suddenly brought the patient into a completely adequate and therefore strongly emotional state at this moment the affective connection with her was completely re-established that happened in the forenoon when i returned at the appointed time in the evening to the ward to see her she had for my reception smeared herself from head to foot with excrement and cried laughingly do i please you so she had never done that before it was plainly destined for me the impression which i received was one of a personal affront and as a result of this i was convinced for years after of the affective deterioration of such cases now we understand this act as an infantile ceremony of welcome or a declaration of love the origin of chawantapal that is to say an unconscious personality therefore means in the sense of the previous explanation i make produce invent him myself it is a sort of human creation or birth by the anal route the first people were made from excrement potter's earth or clay the latin lutum which really means moistened earth also has the transferred meaning of dirt in plautus it is even a term of abuse something like you scum the birth from the anus also reminds us of the motive of throwing behind oneself a well-known example is the oracular command which deucalion and pyrrha who were the only survivors from the great flood received they were to throw behind them the bones of the great mother they then threw behind them stones from which mankind sprang according to a tradition the dactyli in a similar manner sprang from dust which the nymph Anchiala threw behind her there is also humorous significance attached to the anal products the excrements are often considered in popular humour as a monument or memorial which plays a special part in regard to the criminal in the form of grumus murdy every one knows the humorous story of the man who led by the spirit through labyrinthian passages to a hidden treasure after he had shed all his pieces of clothing deposited excrement 
as a last guide-post on his road in a more distant past a sign of this kind possessed as great a significance as the dung of animals to indicate the direction taken simple monuments little stone figures have taken the place of this perishable mark it is noteworthy that miss miller quotes another case where a name suddenly obtruded itself parallel to the emerging into consciousness of chewantipal namely ahama rama with the feeling that it dealt with something assyrian as a possible source of this there occurred to her a surabama who made cuneiform bricks those imperishable documents made from clay the monuments of the most ancient history if it were not emphasized that the bricks are cuneiform then it might mean ambiguously wedge-shaped bricks which is more suggestive of our interpretation than that of the author miss miller remarks that besides the name ashurabama she also thought of ahasuerus or ahasverus this fantasy leads to a very different aspect of the problem of the unconscious personality while the previous materials portrayed to us something of the infantile theory of creation this fantasy opens up a vista into the dynamics of the unconscious creation of personality ahasver is as is well known the wandering jew he is characterized by endless and restless wanderings until the end of the world the fact that the author has thought of this particular name justifies us in following this trail the legends of ahasver the first literary traces of which belong to the thirteenth century seems to be of occidental origin and belongs to those ideas which possess indestructible vital energy the figure of the wandering jew has undergone more literary elaboration than the figure of faust and nearly all of this work belongs to the last century if the figure is not called ahasver still it is there under another name perhaps as count of st germain the mysterious rosicrucian whose immortality was assured and whose temporary residence the land was equally known although the stories about ahasver cannot be traced back any earlier than the thirteenth century the oral tradition can reach back considerably further and it is not an impossibility that a bridge to the orient exists there is the parallel figure of chitter or al chitter the ever youthful chitter celebrated in song by rukert the legend is purely islamitic the peculiar feature however is that chitter is not only a saint but in sufric circles rises even to divine significance in view of the severe monotheism of islam one is inclined to think of chitter as a pre-islamitic arabian divinity who would hardly be officially recognized by the new religion but might have been tolerated on political grounds but there is nothing to prove that the first traces of chitter are found in the commentaries of the koran bukhari and tabari and in a commentary to a noteworthy passage of the eighteenth sura of the koran the eighteenth sura is entitled the cave that is after the cave of the seven sleepers who according to the legend slept there for three hundred and nine years and thus escaped persecution and awoke in a new era their legend is recounted in the eighteenth sura and divers reflections were associated with it the wish fulfilment idea of the legend is very clear the mystic material for it is the immutable model of the sun's course the sun sets periodically but does not die it hides in the womb of the sea or in a subterranean cave and in the morning is born again complete the language in which this astronomic occurrence is clothed is one of clear symbolism the sun returns into the mother's womb and after some time is again born of course this event is properly an incestuous act of which in mythology clear traces are still retained not the least of which is the circumstance that the dying and resurrected gods are the lovers of their own mothers or have generated themselves through their own mothers christ as the god becoming flesh has generated himself through mary 
mithra has done the same these gods are unmistakable sun gods for the sun also does this in order to again renew himself naturally it is not to be assumed that astronomy came first and these conceptions of gods afterwards the process was as always inverted and it is even true that primitive magic charms of rebirth baptism superstitious usages of all sorts concerning the cure of the sick etc were projected into the heavens these youths were born from the cave the womb of mother earth like the sun gods in a new era and this was the way they vanquished death in this far they were immortal it is now interesting to see how the koran comes after long ethical contemplations in the course of the same shura to the following passage which is of a special significance for the origin of the chitter myth for this reason i quote the koran literally remember when moses said to his servant i will not stop till i reach the confluence of the two seas or for eighty years will i journey on but when they reached their confluence they forgot their fish and it took its way in the sea at will and when they had passed on moses said to his servant bring us our morning meal for now we have incurred weariness from this our journey he said what thinkest thou when we repaired to the rock for rest then verily i forgot the fish and not but satan made me forget it so as not to mention it and it hath taken its way in the sea in a wondrous sort he said it is this we were in quest of so they both went back retracing their footsteps then found they one of our servants to whom we had vouchsafed our mercy and whom we had instructed with our knowledge moses said to him shall i follow thee that thou teach me for guidance of that which thou hast been taught he said verily thou canst by no means have patience with me and how canst thou be patient in matters whose meaning thou comprehendest not translation rodwell page one eighty eight moses now accompanies the mysterious servant of god who does divers things which moses cannot comprehend finally the unknown takes leave of moses and speaks to him as follows they will ask thee of dul carnine the two-horned say i will recite to you an account of him verily we established his power upon the earth and we gave him a means to accomplish every end so he followed his way until when he reached the setting of the sun he found it to set in a miry forest and hard by he found a people now follows a moral reflection then the narrative continues then he followed his course further until he came to the place where the sun rises if now we wish to know who is the unknown servant of god we are told in this passage he is dul carnine alexander the sun he goes to the place of setting and he goes to the place of rising the passage about the unknown servant of god is explained by the commentaries in a well-defined legend the servant is chitter the verdant one the never tiring wanderer who roams for hundreds and thousands of years over lands and seas the teacher and counsellor of pious men the one wise in divine knowledge the immortal the authority of the tabari associates chitter with dal carnine chitter is said to have reached the stream of life as a follower of alexander and both unwittingly had drunk of it so that they became immortal moreover chitter is identified by the old commentators with elias who also did not die but who was taken to heaven in a fiery chariot elias is helios it is to be observed that ahasver also owes his existence to an obscure place in the holy christian scriptures this place is to be found in matthew sixteen twenty eight first comes the scene where christ appoints peter as the rock of his church and nominates him the governor of his power after that follows the prophecy of his death and then comes the passage verily i say unto you there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom here follows the scene of the transfiguration and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light and behold there appeared unto them moses and elias talking with him 
then answered peter and said unto jesus lord it is good for us to be here if thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles one for thee and one for moses and one for elias from these passages it appears that christ stands on the same plane as elias without being identified with him although the people consider him as elias the ascension places christ as identical with elias the prophecy of christ shows that there exists aside from himself one or more immortals who shall not die until parosi according to john twenty one twenty second verse the boy john was considered as one of these immortals and in the legend he is in fact not dead but merely sleeping in the ground until paros sigh and breathes so that the dust swirls round his grave as is evident there are passable bridges from christ by way of elias to chitter and ahasuerus it is said in an account of this legend that dull carnine led his friend chitter to the source of life in order to have him drink of immortality alexander also bathed in the stream of life and performed the ritual ablutions as i previously mentioned in a footnote according to matthew seventeen twelfth verse john the baptist is elias therefore primarily identical with chitter now however it is to be noted that in the arabian legend chitter appears rather as a companion or accompanied chitter with dal carnine or with elias like unto them or identified with them there are therefore two similar figures who resemble each other but who nevertheless are distinct the analogous situation in the christian legend is found in the scene by the jordan where john leads christ to the source of life christ is there the subordinate john the superior similar to dal carnine and chitter or chitter and moses also elias the latter relation especially is such that Vollers compares chitter and elias on the one side with gilgamesh and his immortal brother Iabani, on the other side with the dioscuri one of whom is immortal the other mortal this relation is also found in christ and john the baptist on the one hand and christ and peter on the other the last named parallel only finds its explanation through comparison with the mithraic mysteries where the esoteric contents are revealed to us through monuments upon the mithraic marble relief of Klagenfurt, it is represented how with a halo mithra crowns helios who either kneels before him or else floats up to him from below mithra is represented on a mithraic monument of osterberken as holding in his right hand the shoulder of the mystic ox above helios who stands bowed down before him the left hand resting on a sword hilt a crown lies between them on the ground cumont observes about this scene that it probably represents the divine prototype of the ceremony of the initiation into the degree of miles in which a sword and a crown were conferred upon the mystic helios is therefore appointed the miles of mithra in a general way mithra seems to occupy the role of patron to helios which reminds us of the boldness of hercules towards helios upon his journey towards Geryon, helios burns too hotly hercules full of anger threatens him with his never-failing arrows therefore helios is compelled to yield and lends to the hero his sonship with which he was accustomed to journey across the sea thus hercules returns to erethia to the cattle herds of Geryon. on the monument at Klagenfurt, mithra is furthermore represented pressing helios's hand either in farewell or as a ratification in a further scene mithra mounts the chariot of helios either for the ascension or the sea journey cumont is of the opinion that mithra gives to helios a sort of ceremonious investiture and consecrates him with his divine power by crowning him with his own hands this relation corresponds to that of christ to peter peter through his symbol the cock has the character of a sun god after the ascension or sea journey of christ he is the visible pontiff of the divinity he suffers therefore the same death crucifixion as christ 
and becomes the great roman deity sol invictus the conquering triumphant church itself embodied in the pope in the scene of malchus he is always shown as the miles of christ to whom the sword is granted and as the rock upon which the church is founded the crown is also given to him who possesses the power to bind and to set free thus christ like the sun is the visible god whereas the pope like the heir of the roman caesars is solus invicti comus the setting sun appoints a successor whom he invests with the power of the sun dog carnine gives chitter eternal life chitter communicates his wisdom to moses there even exists a report according to which the forgetful servant of joshua drinks from the well of life whereupon he becomes immortal and is placed in a ship by chitter and moses as a punishment and is cast out to sea once more a fragment of a sun myth the motive of the sea journey the primitive symbol which designates that portion of the zodiac in which the sun with the winter solstice again enters upon the yearly course is the goat fish sign the i Palpos. the sun mounts like a goat to the highest mountain and later goes into the water as a fish the fish is the symbol of the child for the child before his birth lives in the water like a fish and the sun because it plunges into the sea becomes equally child and fish the fish however is also a phallic symbol also a symbol for the woman briefly stated the fish is a libido symbol and indeed as it seems predominantly for the renewal of the libido the journey of moses with his servant is a life journey eighty years they grow old and lose their life force libido that is they lose the fish which pursues its course in a marvellous manner to the sea which means the setting of the sun when the two notice their loss they discover at the place where the source of life is found where the dead fish revived and sprang into the sea chitter wrapped in his mantle sitting on the ground according to another version he sat on an island in the sea or in the wettest place on earth that is he was just born from the maternal depths where the fish vanished chitter the verdant one was born as a son of the deep waters his head veiled a kabir a proclaimer of divine wisdom the old babylonian oannes ea who was represented in the form of a fish and daily came from the sea as a fish to teach the people wisdom his name was brought into connection with john's with the rising of the renewed sun all that lived in darkness as water animal or fish surrounded by all terrors of night and death became as the shining fiery firmament of the day thus the words of john the baptist gain especial meaning i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire with volors we may also compare jitter and elias moses and his servant joshua with gilgamesh and his brother iabani gilgamesh wandered through the world driven by anxiety and longing to find immortality his path led him across the seas to the wise Atnapishtim noah who knew how to cross the waters of death there gilgamesh had to dive down to the bottom of the sea for the magical herb which was to lead him back to the land of men when he had come again to his native land a serpent stole the magic plant from him the fish again slid into the sea but on the return from the land of the blessed an immortal mariner accompanied him who banished by a curse of utnapishtim was forbidden to return to the land of the blessed gilgamesh's journey had lost its purpose on account of the loss of the magic herb instead he is accompanied by an immortal whose fate indeed we cannot learn from the fragments of the epic this banished immortal is the model for ahasver as jensen aptly remarked again we encounter the motive of dioscuri mortal and immortal setting and rising sun this motive is also represented as if projected from the hero the sacrificium mithriacum the sacrifice of the bull is in its religious representation very often flanked by the two dadophores cautes and cautopates 
one with a raised and the other with a lowered torch they represent brothers who reveal their character through the symbolic position of the torch cumont connects them not without meaning with the sepulchral erotes who as genii with the reversed torches have traditional meaning the one is supposed to stand for death and the other for life i cannot refrain from mentioning the similarity between the sacrificium mithraacum where the sacrificed bull in the centre is flanked on both sides by deiphores to the christian sacrifice of the lamb ram the crucified is also traditionally flanked by the two thieves one of whom ascends to paradise while the other descends to hell the idea of the mortal and the immortal seems to have passed also into the christian worship semitic gods are often represented as flanked by two paradroi for example baal of edessa accompanied by aziz and monimotes baal as the sun accompanied by mars and mercury as expressed in astronomical teachings according to the chaldean view the gods are grouped into triads in this circle of ideas belongs also the trinity the idea of the triune god in which christ must be considered in his unity with the father and the holy ghost so too do the two thieves belong inwardly to christ the two dedophores are as cumont points out nothing but offshoots from the chief figure of mithra to whom belongs a mysterious threefold character according to an account of dionysus areopagita the magician celebrated a festival tone patella mythopa of the threefold mithra an observation likewise referring to the trinity is made by plutarch concerning ormuz having expanded himself threefold he departed from the sun the trinity as three different states of the unity is also a christian thought in the very first place this suggests the sun myth an observation by macrobius one eighteen seems to lend support to this idea in latin now these differences in the seasons refer to the sun which seems at the winter solstice an infant such as the egyptians on a certain day bring out of their sanctuaries at the vernal equinox it is represented as a youth later at the summer solstice its age is represented by a full growth of beard while at the last the god is represented by the gradually diminishing form of an old man as cumont observes cautes and catapetes occasionally carry in their hands the head of a bull and a scorpion taurus and scorpio are equinoctial signs which clearly indicate that the sacrificial scene refers primarily to the sun cycle the rising sun which sacrifices itself at the summer solstice and the setting sun in the sacrificial scene the symbol of the rising and setting sun was not easily represented therefore this idea was removed from the sacrificial image we have pointed out above that the dioscuri represent a similar idea although in a somewhat different form the one sun is always mortal the other immortal as this entire sun mythology is merely a psychologic projection to the heavens the fundamental thesis probably is as follows just as man consists of a mortal and immortal part so the sun is a pair of brothers one being mortal the other immortal this thought lies at the basis of all theology in general man is indeed mortal but there are some who are immortal or there is something in us which is immortal thus the gods a chitter or a saint germain are our immortal part which though incomprehensible dwells among us somewhere comparison with the sun teaches us over and over again that the gods are libido it is that part of us which is immortal since it represents that bond through which we feel that in the race we are never extinguished it is life from the life of mankind it springs which well up from the depths of an unconscious come as does our life in general from the root of the whole of humanity since we are indeed only a twig broken off from the mother and transplanted since the divine in us is the libido we must not wonder that we have taken along with us in our theology ancient representations from olden times which give the triune figure to the god we have taken this patadalaf threefold god from the phallic symbolism the originality of which may well be con uncontested the male genitals are the basis for this trinity it is an anatomical fact that one testicle is generally placed somewhat higher than the other 
and it is also a very old but nevertheless still surviving superstition that one testicle generates a boy and the other a girl a late babylonian bas-relief from la jarde's collection seems to be in accordance with this view in the middle of the image stands an androgynous god masculine and feminine face upon the right male side is found a serpent with a sun halo round its head upon the left female side there is also a serpent with the moon above its head above the head of the god there are three stars this ensemble would seem to confirm the trinity of the representation the sun serpent at the right side is male the serpent at the left side is female signified by the moon this image possesses a symbolic sexual suffix which makes the sexual significance of the whole obtrusive upon the male side a rhomb is found a favorite symbol of the female genitals upon the female side there is a wheel or felly a wheel always refers to the sun but the spokes are thickened and enlarged at the ends which suggest phallic symbolism it seems to be a phallic wheel which was not unknown in antiquity there are obscene bas-reliefs where cupid turns a wheel of nothing but phalli it is not only the serpent which suggests the phallic significance of the sun i quote one especially marked case from an abundance of proof in the antique collection of at verona i discovered a late a late roman mystic inscription in which are the following representations these symbols are easily read sun phallus moon vagina uterus this interpretation is confirmed by another figure of the same collection there the same representation is found only the vessel is replaced by the figure of a woman the impressions on coins where in the middle a palm is seen encoiled by a snake flanked by two stones testicles or else in the middle a stone encircled by a snake to the right a palm to the left a shell female genitals should be interpreted in a similar manner in Lajard's researches the cult of venus there is a coin of perga where artemis of perga is represented by a conical stone phallic flanked by a man claimed to be men and by a female figure claimed to be artemis men the so-called lunus is found upon an attic bas-relief apparently with the spear but fundamentally a sceptre with a phallic significance flanked by pan with a club phallus and a female figure the traditional representation of the crucified flanked by john and mary is closely associated with this circle of ideas precisely as is the crucified with the thieves from this we see how beside the sun there emerges again and again the much more primitive comparison of the libido with the phallus and a special trace still deserves mention here the data for katapatis who represents mithra is also represented with the cock and the pineapple but these are the attributes of the phrygian god men whose cult was widely diffused men was represented with pileus the pineapple and the cock also in the form of a boy just as the dataphores are boyish figures this last named property relates them with men to the kabiri men has a very close connection with attis the son and lover of cybele in the time of the roman caesars men and attis were entirely identified as stated above attis also wears the pileus like men mithra and the dataphores as the son and lover of his mother he again leads us to the source of this religion creating incest libido namely to the mother incest leads logically to ceremony castration in the attic cybele cult for the hero driven insane by his mother mutilates himself i must at present forego entering more deeply into this matter because the incest problem is to be discussed at the close let this suggestion suffice that from different directions the analysis of the libido symbolism always leads back again to the mother incest therefore we may surmise that the longing of the libido raised to god repressed into the unconscious is a primitive incestuous one which concerns the mother through renouncing the virility to the first beloved the mother the feminine element becomes extremely predominant hence the strongly androgynous character of the dying and resurrected redeemer that these heroes are nearly always wanderers is a psychologically clear symbolism the wandering is a representation of longing of the ever restless desire which nowhere finds its object for unknown to itself it seeks the lost mother the wandering association renders the sun comparison easily intelligible also under this aspect the heroes always resemble the wandering sun which seems to justify the fact 
that the myth of the hero is a sun myth but the myth of the hero however is as it appears to me the myth of our own suffering unconscious which has an unquenchable longing for all the deepest sources of our own being for the body of the mother and through it for communion with infinite life in the countless forms of existence here i must introduce the words of the master who has divined the deepest roots of faustian longings unwilling i reveal a loftier mystery in solitude are throned the goddesses no space around them place and time still less only to speak of them embarrasses they are the mothers goddesses unknown to ye the mortals named by us unwillingly delve in the deepest depths must thou to reach them tis thine own fault that we for help beseech them where is the way no way to the unreachable ne'er to be trodden away to the unbeseechable never to be besought art thou prepared there are no locks no latches to be lifted through endless solitudes shalt thou be drifted hast thou through solitudes and deserts dared and hadst thou swum to farthest verge of ocean and there the boundless space beheld still hadst thou seen wave after wave in motion even though impending doom thy fear compelled thou hast seen something in the barrel dim of peace lulled seas the sport of dolphins swim hadst seen the flying clouds sun moon and star naught shalt thou see in endless void afar not hear thy footstep fall nor meet a stable spot to rest thy feet here take this key the key will scent the true place from all others follow it down twill lead thee to the mothers descend then i could also say ascend twere all the same escape from the created to shapeless forms and liberated spaces enjoy what long ere this was dissipated there whirls the press like clouds on clouds unfolding then with stretched arm swing high the key thou art holding at last a blazing tripod tells thee this that there the utterly deepest bottom is its light to thee will then the mothers show some in their seats the others stand or go at their own will formation transformation the eternal mind's eternal recreation forms of all creatures there are floating free they'll see thee not for only wraiths they see so pluck up heart the danger then is great go to the tripod ere thou hesitate and touch it with the key end of section sixteen section seventeen of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section seventeen chapter five part one of symbolism of the mother and of rebirth the vision following the creation of the hero is described by miss miller as a throng of people this representation is known to us from dream interpretation as being above all the symbol of mystery freud thinks that this choice of symbol is determined on account of its possibility of representing the idea the bearer of the mystery is placed in opposition to the multitude of the ignorant the possession of the mystery cuts one off from intercourse with the rest of mankind for a very complete and smooth rapport with the surroundings is of great importance for the management of the libido and the possession of a subjectively important secret generally creates a great disturbance it may be said that the whole art of life shrinks to the one problem of how the libido may be freed in the most harmless way possible therefore the neurotic derives special benefit in treatment when he can at last rid himself of his various secrets the symbol of the crowd of people chiefly the streaming and moving mass is as i have often seen substituted for the great excitement in the unconscious especially in persons who are outwardly calm the vision of the throng develops further horses emerge a battle is fought with silberer i might accept the significance of this vision as belonging first of all in the functional category because fundamentally the conception of the intermingling crowds is nothing but the symbol of the present onrush of the mass of thought likewise the battle and possibly the horses which illustrate the movement the deeper significance of the appearance of the horses will be seen for the first time in the further course of our treatment of the mother symbolism the following vision has a more definite and significantly important character miss miller sees a city of dreams 
c'était de rêve the picture is similar to one she saw a short time before on the cover of a magazine unfortunately we learn nothing further about it one can easily imagine under this cité de rêve a fulfilled wish dream that is to say something very beautiful and greatly longed for a sort of heavenly jerusalem as the poet of the apocalypse has dreamed it the city is a maternal symbol a woman who fosters the inhabitants as children it is therefore intelligible that the two mother goddesses rhea and cybele both wear the wall crown the old testament treats the cities of jerusalem babel etc as women isaiah forty seven one through five come down and sit in the dust o virgin daughter of babylon sit on the ground there is no throne o daughter of the chaldeans for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate take the millstones and grind meal uncover thy locks make bare the leg uncover the thigh pass over the rivers that thy nakedness shall be uncovered yea thy shame shall be seen sit thou silent and get thee into darkness o daughter of the chaldeans for thou shalt no more be called the lady of the kingdoms jeremiah says of babel fifty twelve your mother shall be sore confounded she that bear you shall be ashamed strong unconquered cities are virgins colonies are sons and daughters cities are also whores isaiah says of tyre twenty three sixteen take an harp go about the city thou harlot thou hast been forgotten and how does it come to pass that the virtuous city has become an harlot we come across a similar symbolism in the myth of ogyges the mythical king who rules in egyptian thebes and whose wife was appropriately named phoebe the boeotian thebes founded by cadmus received on that account a surname ogygian this surname was also given to the great flood as it was called ogygian because it occurred under ogyges this coincidence will be found later on to be hardly accidental the fact that the city and the wife of ogyges bear the same name indicates that somewhere a relation must exist between the city and the woman which is not difficult to understand for the city is identical with the woman we meet a similar idea in hindu lore where indra appears as the husband of urvara but uvara means the fertile land in a similar way the occupancy of a country by the king was understood as marriage with the ploughed land similar representations must have prevailed in europe as well princes had to guarantee for example a good harvest at their accession the swedish king domaldi was actually killed on account of the failure of the harvest inglinga saga eighteen in the rama saga the hero rama marries sita the furrow of the field to the same group of ideas belongs the chinese custom of the emperor ploughing a furrow at his ascension to the throne this idea of the soil being feminine also embraces the idea of continual companionship with the woman a physical communication shiva the phallic god is like mahadeva and parvati male and female he has even given one half of his body to his consort parvati as a dwelling-place inman gives us a drawing of a pundite of our danari iswara one half of the god is masculine the other half feminine and the genitals are in continuous cohabitation the motive of continuous cohabitation is expressed in a well-known lingam symbol which is to be found everywhere in indian temples the base is a female symbol and within that is the phallus the symbol approaches very closely the grecian mystic phallic basket and chests compare with this the eleusinian mysteries the chest or box is here a female symbol that is the mother's womb this is a very well-known conception in the old mythologies the chest basket or little basket with its precious contents was thought of as floating on the water a remarkable inversion of the natural fact that the child floats in the amniotic fluid and that this is in the uterus this inversion brings about a great advantage for sublimation for it creates enormous possibilities of application for the myth-weaving fantasy 
that is to say for the annexation to the sun cycle the sun floats over the sea like an immortal god which every evening is immersed in the maternal water and is born again renewed in the morning frobenius says perhaps in connection with the blood-red sunrise the idea occurs that here a birth takes place the birth of a young son the question then arises inevitably whence comes the paternity how has the woman become pregnant and since this woman symbolizes the same idea as the fish which means the sea because we proceed from the assumption that the sun descends into the sea as well as arises from it thus the curious primitive answer is that this sea has previously swallowed the old sun consequently the resulting myth is that the woman sea has formerly devoured the sun and now brings a new sun into the world and thus she has become pregnant all these sea-going gods are sun symbols they are enclosed in a chest or an ark for the night journey on the sea frobenius often together with a woman again an inversion of the actual situation but in support of the motive of continuous cohabitation which we have met above during the night journey on the sea the sun god is enclosed in the mother's womb oftentimes threatened by dangers of all kinds instead of many individual examples i will content myself with reproducing the scheme which frobenius has constructed from numberless myths of this sort to devour west east heat hair to slip out to open to land west to east movement sea journey she journey to to set on fire or to cut off the heart frobenius gives the following legend to illustrate this a hero is devoured by a water monster in the west to devour the animal carries him within him to the east sea journey meanwhile he kindles a fire in the belly of the monster to set on fire and since he feels hungry he cuts off a piece of the hanging heart to cut off the heart soon after he notices that the fish glides upon the dry land to land he immediately begins to cut open the animal from within outwards to open then he slides out to slip out in the fish's belly it had been so hot that all his hair had fallen out heat hair the hero frequently frees all who were previously devoured to devour all and all now slide out slip out a very close parallel is noah's journey during the flood in which all living creatures die only he and the life guarded by him are brought to a new birth in a melopolynesian legend frobenius it is told that the hero in the belly of the king fish took his weapon and cut open the fish's belly he slid out and saw a splendour and he sat down and reflected i wonder where i am he said then the sun rose with a bound and turned from one side to the other the sun has again slipped out frobenius mentions from the ramayana the myth of the ape hanuman who represents the sun hero the sun in which hanuman hurries through the air throws a shadow upon the sea the sea monster notices this and through this draws hanuman toward itself when the latter sees that the monster is about to devour him he stretches out his figure immeasurably the monster assumes the same gigantic proportions as he does that hanuman becomes as small as a thumb slips into the great body of the monster and comes out on the other side in another part of the poem it is said that he came out from the right ear of the monster like rabelais gargantua who also was born from the mother's ear hanuman thereupon resumes his flight and finds a new obstacle in another sea monster which is the mother of rahus the sun-devouring demon the latter draws hanuman's shadow to her in the same way hanuman again has recourse to the earlier stratagem becomes small and slips into her body but hardly is he there than he grows to a gigantic mass swells up tears her kills her and in that way makes his escape thus we understand why the indian firebringer matarikvan is called the one swelling in the mother the ark little box chest cask vessel etc is a symbol of the womb just as is the sea into which the sun sinks for rebirth from this circle of ideas we understand the mythologic statements about o gyges 
he it is who possesses the mother the city who is united with the mother therefore under him came the great flood for it is a typical fragment of the sun myth that the hero when united with the woman attained with difficulty is exposed in a cask and thrown into the sea and then lands for a new life on a distant shore the middle part the night journey on the sea in the ark is lacking in the tradition of ogyges but the rule in mythology is that the typical parts of a myth can be united in all conceivable variations which adds greatly to the extraordinary difficulty of the interpretation of a particular myth without knowledge of all the others the meaning of this cycle of myths mentioned here is clear it is the longing to attain rebirth through the return to the mother's womb that is to say to become as immortal as the sun this longing for the mother is frequently expressed in our holy scriptures i recall particularly the place in the epistle to the galatians where it is said four twenty six but jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all twenty seven for it is written rejoice thou barren that beareth not break forth and cry thou that travailest not for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband twenty eight now we brethren as isaac was are the children of promise twenty nine but as he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now thirty nevertheless what saith the scripture cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of a bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of a free woman thirty one so then brethren we are not children of the bondwoman but of the free chapter five one stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith christ has made us free the christians are the children of the city above a symbol of the mother not sons of the earthly city mother who is to be cast out for those born after the flesh are opposed to those born after the spirit who are not born from the mother in the flesh but from a symbol for the mother one must again think of the indians at this point who say the first people proceeded from the sword hilt and a shuttle the religious thought is bound up with the compulsion to call the mother no longer mother but city source sea etc this compulsion can be derived from the need to manifest an amount of libido bound up with the mother but in such a way that the mother is represented by or concealed in a symbol the symbolism of the city we find well developed in the revelations of john where two cities play a great part one of which is insulted and cursed by him the other greatly desired we read in revelation seventeen one come hither i will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth on many waters two with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication three so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and i saw a woman sit on a scarlet coloured beast full of the names of blasphemy and having seven heads and ten horns four and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colours and decked with gold and precious stones of pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication five and upon her forehead was a name written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth six and i saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus and when i saw her i wondered with a great admiration here follows an interpretation of the vision unintelligible to us from which we can only emphasize the point that the seven heads of the dragon means the seven hills upon which the woman sits this is probably a distinct allusion to rome the city whose temporal power oppressed the world at the time of the revelation the waters upon which the woman the mother sits are peoples and throngs and nations and tongues this also seems to refer to rome for she is the mother of peoples and possessed all lands just as in common speech for example colonies are called daughters so the people subject to rome are like members of a family subject to the mother in another version of the picture the kings of the people namely the fathers commit fornication with this mother revelation continues 
eighteen two and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying babylon the great is fallen is fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird three for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication thus this mother does not only become the mother of all abominations but also in truth the receptacle of all that is wicked and unclean the birds are images of souls therefore this means all souls of the condemned and evil spirits thus the mother becomes hecate the underworld the city of the damned itself we recognize easily in the ancient idea of the woman on the dragon the above-mentioned representation of echnida the mother of the infernal horrors babylon is the idea of the terrible mother who seduces all people to whoredom with devilish temptation and makes them drunk with her wine the intoxicating drink stands in the closest relation to fornication for it is also a libido symbol as we have already seen in the parallel of fire and sun after the fall and curse of babylon we find in revelation nineteen six through seven the hymn which leads from the under half to the upper half of the mother where now everything is possible which would be impossible without the repression of incest six alleluia the lord god omnipotent reigneth seven let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready eight and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints nine and he saith unto me write blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb the lamb is the son of man who celebrates his marriage with the woman who the woman is remains obscure at first but revelation twenty one nine shows us which woman is the bride the lamb's wife nine come hither i will show thee the bride the lamb's wife ten and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from god having the glory of god it is evident from this quotation after all that goes before that the city the heavenly bride who is here promised to the son is the mother in babylon the impure maid was cast out according to the epistle to the galatians so that here in heavenly jerusalem the mother bride may be attained the more surely it bears witness to the most delicate psychologic perception that the fathers of the church who formulated the canons preserve this bit of the symbolic significance of the christ mystery it is a treasure house for the fantasies and myth materials which underlie primitive christianity the further attributes which were heaped upon the heavenly jerusalem make its significance as mother overwhelmingly clear one and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of god and of the lamb two in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations three and there shall be no more curse in this quotation we come upon the symbol of the waters which we found in the mention of ogyges in connection with the city the maternal significance of water belongs to the clearest symbolism in the realm of mythology so that the ancients could say in greek the sea is the symbol of birth from water comes life therefore of the two gods which here interest us the most christ and mithra the latter was born beside a river according to representations while christ experienced his new birth in the jordan moreover he is born from the fenon the sempiterni fons amorous the mother of god who by the heathen christian legend was made a nymph of the spring the spring is also found in mithraism a pannonian dedication reads fonti perenni an inscription in apulia is dedicated to the fons eterni in persia our Vicura is the well of the water of life ard Anahita is a goddess of water and love 
just as aphrodite is born from foam the neo-persians designate the planet venus and a nubile girl by the name nahid in the temples of anaitis there exist a prostitute hieroduli's harlots in the sakain in honour of anaitis there occurred ritual combats as in the festival of the egyptian ares and his mother in the vedas the waters are called matrita ma the most maternal all that is living rises as does the sun from the water and at evening plunges into the water born from the springs the rivers the seas at death man arrives at the waters of the styx in order to enter upon the night journey on the sea the wish is that the black water of death might be the water of life that death with its cold embrace might be the mother's womb just as the sea devours the sun but brings it forth again out of the maternal womb jonah moted life believes not in death in the flood of life in the torrents of deeds i toss up and down i am blown to and fro cradle and grave an eternal sea a changing web a glowing life goethe faust the eternabon the wood of life or the tree of life is a maternal symbol which would seem to follow from the previous deductions the etymologic connection of tau ton bios in the indo-germanic root suggests the blending of the meanings in the underlying symbolism of mother and of generation the tree of life is probably first of all a fruit-bearing genealogical tree that is a mother image countless myths prove the derivation of man from trees many myths show how the hero is enclosed in the maternal tree thus dead osiris in the column adonis in the myrtle etc numerous female divinities were worshipped as trees from which resulted the cult of the holy groves and trees it is of transparent significance when attis castrates himself under a pine tree that is he does it because of the mother goddesses were often worshipped in the form of a tree or of a wood thus juno of thespii was a branch of a tree juno of samos was a board juno of argos was a column the carrion diana was an uncut piece of wood athena of lindus was a polished column tertullian calls ceres of pharos brutus pallas et informe lignum sine effigy athenaeus remarks of latona at dalos that she is anaton anthapoth a shapeless piece of word tertullian calls an attic palace crucus a wooden pail or mast the wooden pale is phallic as the name suggests palthon palace the palace is a pale a ceremonial lignum carved out of figwood as are all roman statues of priapus pavos means a projection or centerpiece on the helmet later called panos just as avananabatias signifies bald-headedness on the fore part of the head and thalapas signifies bald-headedness in regard to the Pathos nonomas of the helmet a semi-phallic meaning is given to the upper part of the head as well palapanas has beside palathos the significance of wooden powers anayas cylinder palalas a round beam the macedonian battle array distinguished by its powerful impetus is called palathos moreover the finger joint is called palalos palathos is a whale now pathos appears with the meaning shining brilliant the indo-germanic root is bala equals to bulge to swell who does not think of faust it grows it shines increases in my hand that is primitive libido symbolism which shows how immediate is the connection between phallic libido and light the same relations are found in the rig veda in rudra's utterances rig veda one one fourteen three may we obtain your favour thou man ruling o urinating rudra i refer here to the previously mentioned phallic symbolism of rudra in the upanishads for we call for help below to the flaming rudra to the one bringing the sacrifice him who encircles and wanders wandering in the vault of heaven to the seer two thirty three five he who opens up the sweet who listens to our calls the ruddy one with the beautiful helmet may he not give us over to the powers of jealousy six i have been rejoiced by the bull connected with marut the supplicating one with strong force of life eight sound the powerful song of praise 
to the ruddy bull to the white shining one worship the flaming one with honour we sing of the shining being rudra may rudra's missile arrow not be used on us may the great displeasure of the shining one pass us by unbend the firm bow or hard arrow for the princes thou who blessest with the waters of thy body generative strength be gracious to our children and grandchildren in this way we pass from the realm of mother symbolism imperceptibly into the realm of male phallic symbolism this element also lies in the tree even in the family tree as is distinctly shown by the mediaeval family trees from the first ancestor there grows upward in the place of the membrum viral the trunk of the great tree the bisexual symbolic character of the tree is intimated by the fact that in latin trees have a masculine termination and a feminine gender the feminine especially the maternal meaning of the forest and the phallic significance of trees in dreams is well known i mention an example it concerns a woman who had always been nervous and who after many years of marriage became ill as a result of the typical retention of the libido she had the following dream after she had learned to know a young man of many engaging free opinions who was very pleasing to her she found herself in a garden where stood a remarkable exotic tree with strange red fleshy flowers or fruits she picked them and ate them then to her horror she felt that she was poisoned this dream idea may easily be understood by means of the antique or poetic symbolism so i can spare information as to the analytic material the double significance of the tree is readily explained by the fact that such symbols are not to be understood anatomically but psychologically as libido symbols therefore it is not permissible to interpret the tree on account of its similar form as directly phallic it can also be called a woman or the uterus of the mother the uniformity of the significance lies alone in the similarity to the libido one loses one's way in one cul-de-sac after another by saying that this is the symbol substituted for the mother and that for the penis in this realm there is no fixed significance of things the only reality here is the libido for which all that is perishable is merely a symbol it is not the physical actual mother but the libido of the son the object of which was once the mother we take mythologic symbols much too concretely and wonder at every step about the endless contradictions these contradictions arise only because we constantly forget that in the realm of fantasy feeling is all whenever we read therefore his mother was a wicked sorcerer the translation is as follows the son is in love with her namely he is unable to detach his libido from the mother imago he therefore suffers from incestuous resistance the symbolism of water and trees which are met with as further attributes in the symbol of the city also refer to that amount of libido which unconsciously is fastened to the mother imago in certain parts of revelation the unconscious psychology of religious longing is revealed namely the longing for the mother the expectation of revelation ends in the mother nai pat atna veta ona athesis and there shall be no more curse there shall be no more sins no repression no disharmony with one's self no guilt no fear of death and no pain of separation more thus revelation echoes that same radiant mystical harmony which was caught again two thousand years later and expressed poetically in the last prayer of dr marianus penitence look up elate where she beams salvation gratefully to blessed fate grow in recreation be our souls as they have been dedicate to thee virgin holy mother queen goddess gracious be goethe faust one principal question arises at the sight of this beauty and greatness of feeling that is whether the primary tendency compensated by religion is not too narrowly understood as incestuous i have previously observed in regard to this that i consider the resistance opposed to libido as in a general way coincident with the incest prohibition i must leave open for the present the definition of the psychological 
incest conception however i will here emphasize the point that it is most especially the totality of the sun myth which proves to us that the fundamental basis of the incestuous desire does not aim at cohabitation but at the special thought of becoming a child again of turning back to the parents protection of coming into the mother once more in order to be born again but incest stands in the path to this goal that is to say the necessity of in some way again gaining entrance into the mother's womb one of the simplest ways would be to impregnate the mother and to reproduce one's self identically but here the incest prohibition interferes therefore the myths of the son or of rebirth teem with all possible proposals as to how incest can be evaded a very simple method of avoidance is to transform the mother into another being or to rejuvenate her after birth has occurred to have her disappear again or have her change back it is not incestuous cohabitation which is desired but the rebirth which now is attained most readily through cohabitation but this is not the only way although perhaps the original one the resistance to the incest prohibition makes the fantasy inventive for example it was attempted to impregnate the mother by means of a magic charm of fertility to wish for a child attempts in this respect remain in the stage of mythical fantasies but they have one result and that is the exercise of the fantasy which gradually produces paths through the creation of fantastic possibilities in which the libido taking an active part can flow off thus the libido becomes spiritualized in an imperceptible manner the power which always wishes evil thus creates a spiritual life therefore in religions this course is now raised to a system on that account it is exceedingly instructive to see how religion takes pains to further these symbolic transferences the new testament furnishes us with an excellent example in regard to this nicodemus in the speech regarding rebirth cannot forbear understanding the matter very realistically john three four how can a man be born when he is old can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born but jesus endeavours to raise into purity the sensuous view of nicodemus's mind moulded in materialistic heaviness and announces to him really the same and yet not the same five verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god six that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit seven marvel not that i said unto thee ye must be born again eight the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth so is every one that is born of the spirit to be born of water means simply to be born from the mother's womb to be born of the spirit means to be born from the fructifying breath of the wind this we learn from the greek text where spirit and wind are expressed by the same word panathawa that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit the spirit bloweth where it listeth this symbolism rose from the same need as that which produced the egyptian legend of the vultures the mother symbol they were only females and were fertilized by the wind one recognizes very clearly the ethical demand as the foundation of these mythologic assertions thou must say of the mother that she was not impregnated by a mortal in the ordinary way but by a spiritual being in an unusual manner this demand stands in strict opposition to the real truth therefore the myth is a fitting solution one can say it was a hero who died and was born again in a remarkable manner and in this way attained immortality the need which this demand asserts is evidently a prohibition against a definite fantasy concerning the mother a son may naturally think that a father has generated him in a carnal way but not that he himself impregnated the mother and so caused himself to be born again into renewed youth this incestuous fantasy which for some reason possesses an extraordinary strength and therefore appears as a compulsory wish is repressed and conforming to the above demand under certain conditions expresses itself again symbolically concerning the problem of birth or rather concerning individual rebirth from the mother in jesus as challenge to nicodemus we clearly recognize this tendency think not carnally 
or thou art carnal but think symbolically then art thou spirit it is evident how extremely educated and developing this compulsion toward symbolism can be nicodemus would remain fixed in low commonplaces if he did not succeed in raising himself through symbols above this repressed incestuous desire as a righteous philistine of culture he probably was not very anxious for this effort because men seemed really to remain satisfied in repressing the incestuous libido and at best to express it by some modest religious exercises yet it seems to be important on the other side that man should not merely renounce and repress and thereby remain firmly fixed in the incestuous bond but that he should redeem those dynamic forces which lie bound up in incest in order to fulfil himself for man needs his whole libido to fill out the boundaries of his personality and then for the first time he is in a condition to do his best the paths by which man may manifest his incestuously fixed libido seem to have been pointed out by the religious mythologic symbols on this account jesus teaches nicodemus thou thinkest of thy incestuous wish for rebirth but thou must think that thou art born from the water and that thou art generated by the breath of the wind and in this way thou shalt share in eternal life End of section 17section eighteen of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section eighteen chapter five part two thus the libido which lies inactive in the incestuous bond repressed and in fear of the law and the avenging father god can be led over into sublimation through the symbol of baptism birth from water and of generation spiritual birth through the symbol of the descent of the holy ghost thus man becomes a child again and is born into a circle of brothers and sisters but his mother is the communion of the saints the church and his circle of brothers and sisters is humanity with whom he is united anew in the common inheritance of the primitive symbol it seems that at the time in which christianity had its origin this process was especially necessary for that period as the result of the incredible contrast between slavery and the freedom of the citizens and masters had entirely lost the consciousness of the common bond of mankind one of the next and most essential reasons for the energetic regression to the infantile in christianity which goes hand in hand with the revival of the incest problem was probably to be found in the far-reaching depreciation of women at that time sexuality was so easily attainable that the result could only be a very excessive depreciation of the sexual object the existence of personal values was first discovered by christianity and there are many people who have not discovered it even in the present day however the depreciation of the sexual object hinders the outflow of that libido which cannot be satisfied by sexual activity because it belongs to an already desexualized higher order if it were not so a don juan could never be neurotic but the contrary is the case for how might those higher valuations be given to a worthless despised object therefore the libido after having seen a helen in every woman for so long a time sets out on a search for the difficult to obtain the worshipped but perhaps unattainable goal and which in the unconscious is the mother 
therefore the symbolic needs based on the incest resistance arise again in an increased degree which promptly transforms the beautiful sinful world of the olympian gods into incomprehensible dreamlike dark mysteries which with their accessions of symbols and obscure meaningful texts remove us very far from the religious feelings of that roman graeco world when we see how much trouble jesus took to make acceptable to nicodemus the symbolic perception of things that is to say really a repression and veiling over of the actual facts and how important it was for the history of civilization in general that people thought and still think in this way then we understand the revolt which it raised everywhere against the psychologic discovery of the true background of the neurotic or normal symbolism always and everywhere we encounter the odious realm of sexuality which represents to all righteous people of to-day something defiled however less than two thousand years have passed since the religious cult of sexuality was more or less openly in full bloom to be sure they were heathen and did not know better but the nature of religious power does not change from cycle to cycle if one has once received an effectual impression of the sexual contents of the ancient cults and if one realizes oneself that the religious experience that is the union with the god of antiquity was understood by antiquity as a more or less concrete coitus then truly one can no longer fancy that the mortar forces of a religion have suddenly become wholly different since the birth of christ exactly the same thing has occurred as with the hysteric who at first indulges in some quite unbeautiful infantile sexual manifestations and afterwards develops a hyperesthetic negation in order to convince every one of his special purity christianity with its repression of the manifest sexual is the negative of the ancient sexual cult the original cult has changed its tokens one only needs to realize how much of the gay paganism even to the inclusion of unseemly gods has been taken into the christian church thus the old indecent priapus celebrated a gay festival of resurrection in st tycon also partly in the physicians saints cosma and damian who graciously condescended to accept the membra virilia in wax at their festival st Vallus of old memories emerges again to be worshipped in country chapels to say nothing of the rest of the paganism there are those who have not yet learned to recognize sexuality as a function equivalent to hunger and who therefore consider it as disgraceful that certain taboo institutions which were considered as asexual refuges are now recognized as overflowing with sexual symbolism those people are doomed to the painful realization that such is still the case in spite of their great revolt one must learn to understand that opposed to the customary habit of thought psychoanalytic thinking reduces and resolves those symbolic structures which have become more and more complicated through countless elaboration this means of a course of reduction which would be an intellectual enjoyment if the object were different but here it becomes distressing not only aesthetically but apparently also ethically because the repressions which are to be overcome have been brought about by our best intentions we must commence to overcome our virtuousness with the certain fear 
of falling into baseness on the other side this is certainly true for virtuousness is always inwardly compensated by a great tendency towards baseness and how many profligates are there who inwardly preserve a mawkish virtue and moral megalomania both categories of men turn out to be snobs when they come in contact with analytic psychology because the moral man has imagined an objective and cheap verdict on sexuality and the unmoral man is entirely unaware of the vulgarity of his sexuality and of his incapacity for an unselfish love one completely forgets that one can most miserably be carried away not only by a vice but also by a virtue there is a fanatic orgiastic self-righteousness which is just as base and which entails just as much injustice and violence as a vice at this time when a large part of mankind is beginning to discard christianity it is worth while to understand clearly why it was originally accepted it was accepted in order to escape at last from the brutality of antiquity as soon as we discard it licentiousness returns as impressively exemplified by life in our large modern cities this step is not a forward step but a backward one it is as with individuals who have laid aside one form of transference and have no new one without fail they will occupy regressively the old path of transference to their great detriment because the world around them has since then essentially changed he who is repelled by the historical and philosophical weakness of the christian dogmatism and the religious emptiness of an historical jesus of whose person we know nothing and whose religious value is partly talmudic partly hellenic wisdom and discards christianity and therewith christian morality is certainly confronted with the ancient problem of licentiousness to-day the individual still feels himself restrained by the public hypocritical opinion and therefore prefers to lead a secret separate life but publicly to represent morality it might be different if men in general all at once found the moral mask too dull and if they realized how dangerously their beasts lie in wait for each other and then truly a frenzy of demoralization might sweep over humanity this is the dream the wish dream of the morally limited man of to-day he forgets necessity which strangles men and robs them of their breath and which with a stern hand interrupts every passion it must not be imputed to me that i am wishing to refer the libido back by analytical reduction to the primitive almost conquered stages entirely forgetting the fearful misery this would entail for humanity indeed some individuals would let themselves be transported by the old-time frenzy of sexuality from which the burden of guilt has been removed to their own greatest detriment but these are the ones who under other circumstances would have prematurely perished in some other way however i well know the most effectual and most inexorable regulator of human sexuality this is necessity with this leaden weight human lust will never fly too high to-day there are countless neurotics who are so simply because they do not know how to seek happiness in their own manner they do not even realize where the lack lies and besides these neurotics there are many more normal people and precisely people of the higher type who feel restricted and discontented for all these reduction to the sexual elements should be undertaken in order that they may be reinstated into the possession of their primitive self and thereby learn to know and value its relation to the entire personality in this way alone can certain requirements be fulfilled and others be repudiated as unfit because of their 
infantile character in this way the individual will come to realize that certain things are to be sacrificed although they are accomplished but in another sphere we imagine that we have long renounced sacrificed and cut off our incest wish and that nothing of it is left but it does not occur to us that this is not true but that we unconsciously commit incest in another territory in religious symbols for example we come across incest we consider the incestuous wish vanished and lost and then rediscover it in full force in religion this process or transformation has taken place unconsciously in secular development just as in part one it is shown that a similar unconscious transformation of the libido is an ethically worthless pose and with which i compared the christianity of early roman antiquity where evidently licentiousness and brutality were strongly resisted so here i must remark in regard to the sublimation of the incestuous libido that the belief in the religious symbol has ceased to be an ethical ideal but it is an unconscious transformation of the incest wish into symbolic acts and symbolic concepts which cheat men as it were so that heaven appears to them as a father and earth as a mother and the people upon it children and brothers and sisters thus man can remain a child for all time and satisfy his incest wish all unawares this state would doubtless be ideal if it were not infantile and therefore merely a one-sided wish which maintains a childish attitude the reverse is anxiety much is said of pious people who remain unshaken in their trust in god and wander unswervingly safe and blessed through the world i have never seen this chitter yet it is probably a wish figure the rule is great uncertainty among believers which they drown with fanatical cries among themselves or among others moreover they have religious doubts moral uncertainty doubts of their own personality feelings of guilt and deepest of all great fear of the opposite aspect of reality against which the most highly intelligent people struggle with all their force this other side is the devil the adversary or expressed in modern terms the corrective of reality of the infantile world picture which has been made acceptable through the predominating pleasure principle but the world is not a garden of god of the father but a place of terrors not only is heaven no father and earth no mother and the people not brothers nor sisters but they represent hostile destroying powers to which we are abandoned the more surely the more childishly and thoughtlessly we have entrusted ourselves to the so-called fatherly hand of god one should never forget the harsh speech of the first napoleon that the good god is always on the side of the heaviest artillery the religious myth meets us here as one of the greatest and most significant human institutions which despite misleading symbols nevertheless gives man assurance and strength so that he may not be overwhelmed by the monsters of the universe the symbol considered from the standpoint of actual truth is misleading indeed but it is psychologically true because it was and is the bridge to all the greatest achievements of humanity but this does not mean to say that this unconscious way of transformation of the incest wish into religious exercises is the only one or the only possible one there is also a conscious recognition and understanding with which we can take possession of this libido which is bound up in incest and transformed into religious exercises so that we no longer need the stage of religious symbolism for this end it is thinkable that instead of doing good to our fellow-men for the love of christ we do it from 
the knowledge that humanity even as ourselves could not exist if among the herd the one could not sacrifice himself for the other this would be the course of moral autonomy of perfect freedom when man could without compulsion wish that which he must do and this from knowledge without delusion through belief in the religious symbols it is a positive creed which keeps us infantile and therefore ethically inferior although of the greatest significance from the cultural point of view and of imperishable beauty from the aesthetic standpoint this delusion can no longer ethically suffice humanity striving after moral autonomy the infantile and moral danger lies in belief in the symbol because through that we guide the libido to an imaginary reality the simple negation of the symbol changes nothing for the entire mental disposition remains the same we merely remove the dangerous object but the object is not dangerous the danger is our own infantile mental state for love of which we have lost something very beautiful and ingenious through the simple abandonment of the religious symbol i think belief should be replaced by understanding then we would keep the beauty of the symbol but still remain free from the depressing results of submission to belief this would be the psychoanalytic cure for belief and disbelief the vision following upon that of the city is that of a strange fir tree with gnarled branches this vision does not seem extraordinary to us after all that we have learned of the tree of life and its associations with the city and the waters of life this especial tree seems simply to continue the category of the mother symbols the attribute strange probably signifies as in dreams a special emphasis that is a special underlying complex material unfortunately the author gives us no individual material for this as the tree already suggested in the symbolism of the city is particularly emphasized through the further development of miss miller's visions here i find it necessary to discuss at some length the history of the symbolism of the tree it is well known that trees have played a large part in the cult myth from the remotest times the typical myth tree is the tree of paradise or of life which we discover abundantly used in babylonian and also in jewish lore and in pre-christian times the pine tree of Addis, the tree or trees of mithra in germanic mythology yggdrasil and so on the hanging of the Addis image on the pine tree the hanging of marsyas which became a celebrated artistic motive the hanging of odin the germanic hanging sacrifices indeed the whole series of hanged gods teaches us that the hanging of christ on the cross is not a unique occurrence in religious mythology but belongs to the same circle of ideas as others in this world of imagery the cross of christ is the tree of life and equally the wood of death this contrast is not astounding just as the origin of man from trees was a legendary idea so there were also burial customs in which people were buried in hollow trees from that the german language retains even now the expression totenbaum tree of death for a coffin keeping in mind the fact that the tree is predominantly a mother symbol then the mystic significance of this manner of burial can be in no way incomprehensible to us the dead are delivered back to the mother for rebirth we encounter this symbol in the osiris myth handed down by plutarch which is in general typical in various aspects rhea is pregnant with osiris at the same time also with isis osiris and isis mate even in the mother's womb 
motive of the night journey on the sea with incest their son is aruerus later called horus it is said of isis that she was born in absolute humidity tetra parte on lera and ma pata veda thea in the fourth place isis was born in absolute humidity it is said of osiris that a certain pamiles in thebes heard a voice from the temple of zeus while drawing water which commanded him to proclaim that osiris was born thalas batha paeus eve paeens osiris the great beneficent king osiris in honour of this the pamilion were celebrated they were similar to the phalophorion pamilus is a phallic demon similar to the original dionysus the myth reduced reeds osiris and isis were generated by phallus from the water mother womb in the ordinary manner chronos had made rhea pregnant the relation was secret and rhea was his sister helios however observed it and cursed the relation osiris was killed in a crafty manner by the god of the underworld typhon who locked him in a chest he was thrown into the nile and so carried out to sea osiris however made it in the underworld with his second sister nephthys motive of the night journey to the sea with incest one sees here how the symbolism is developed in the mother womb before the outward existence osiris commits incest in death the second intrauterine existence osiris again commits incest both times with a sister who is simply substituted for the mother as a legal uncensured symbol since the marriage with a sister in early antiquity was not merely tolerated but was really commended zarathustra also recommended the marriage of kindred this form of myth would be impossible to-day because cohabitation with a sister being incestuous would be repressed the wicked typhon entices osiris craftily into a box or chest this distortion of the true state of affairs is transparent the original sin caused men to wish to go back into the mother again that is the incestuous desire for the mother condemned by law is the ruse supposedly invented by typhon the fact is the ruse is very significant man tries to sneak into rebirth through subterfuge in order to become a child again an early egyptian hymn even raises an accusation against the mother isis because she destroys the sun-god re by treachery it was interpreted as the ill-will of the mother towards her son that she banished and betrayed him the hymn describes how isis fashioned a snake put it in the path of re and how the snake wounded the sun-god with a poisonous bite from which wound he never recovered so that finally he had to retire on the back of the heavenly cow but this cow is the cow-headed goddess just as osiris is the bull apis the mother is accused as if she were the cause of man flying to the mother in order to be cured of the wound which she had herself inflicted this wound is the prohibition of incest man is thus cut off from the hopeful certainty of childhood and early youth from all the unconscious instinctive happenings which permit the child to live as an appendage of his parents unconscious of himself there must be contained in this many sensitive memories of the animal age where there was not any thou shalt and thou shalt not but all was just simple occurrence even yet a deep animosity seems to live in man because a brutal law has separated him from the instinctive yielding to his desires and from the great beauty of the harmony of the animal nature 
this separation manifested itself among other things in the incest prohibition and its correlates laws of marriage etc therefore pain and anger relate to the mother as if she were responsible for the domestication of the sons of men in order not to become conscious of his incest wish his backward harking to the animal nature the son throws all the burden of the guilt on the mother from which arises the idea of the terrible mother the mother becomes for him a spectre of anxiety a nightmare after the completed night journey to the sea the chest of osiris was cast ashore by byblos and lay in the branches of an erica which grew around the coffin and became a splendid tree the king of the land had the tree placed as a column under his roof during this period of osiris's absence the winter solstice the lament customary during thousands of years for the dead god and his return occurs and its epitheos is a feast of joy a passage from the mournful quest of isis is especially noteworthy she flutters like a swallow lamenting around the column which encloses the god sleeping in death this same motive returns in the kifhauser saga later on typhon dismembers the corpse and scatters the pieces we come upon the motive of dismemberment in countless sun myths namely the inversion of the idea of the composition of the child in the mother's womb in fact the mother isis collects the pieces of the body with the help of the jackal-headed anubis she finds the corpse with the help of dogs here the nocturnal devourers of bodies the dogs and jackals become the assistants of the composition of the reproduction the egyptian vulture owes its symbolic meaning as mother to this necrophagic habit in persian antiquity the corpses were thrown out for the dogs to devour just as to-day in the indian funeral pyres the removal of the carcasses is left to the vultures persia was familiar with the custom of leading a dog to the bed of one dying whereupon the latter had to present the dog with a morsel the custom on its surface evidently signifies that the morsel is to belong to the dog so that he will spare the body of the dead precisely as cerberus was soothed by the honey cakes which hercules gave to him in the journey to hell but when we bear in mind the jackal-headed anubis who rendered his good services in the gathering together of the dismembered osiris and the mother significance of the vulture then the question arises whether something deeper was not meant by this ceremony kreutzer has also concerned himself with this idea and has come to the conclusion that the astral form of the dog ceremony that is the appearance of sirius the dog star at the period of the sun's highest position is related to this in that the introduction of the dog has a compensatory significance death being thereby made reversedly equal to the sun's highest position this is quite in conformity with psychologic thought which results from the very general fact that death is interpreted as entrance into the mother's womb rebirth this interpretation would seem to be supported by the otherwise enigmatic function of the dog in the sacrificium mithriacum in the monuments a dog always leaps up upon the bull killed by mithra however this sacrifice is probably to be interpreted through the persian legend as well as through the monument as the moment of the highest fecundity the most beautiful expression of this is seen upon the magnificent mithra relief of hedernheim upon one side of a large stone slab formerly probably rotating is seen the stereotyped overthrowing and sacrifice of the bull but upon the other side stands soul with a bunch of grapes in his hand mithra with the cornucopia the dado fores with fruits corresponding to the legend that all fecundity proceeds from the dead bull of the world 
fruits from the horns wine from its blood grain from the tail cattle from its sperma leek from its snows and so on sylvanus stands above this scene with the animals of the forest arising from him the significance suspected by kreutzer might very easily belong to the dog in this connection let us now turn back to the myth of osiris in spite of the restoration of the corpse accomplished by isis the resuscitation succeeds only incompletely in so far as the phallus of osiris cannot again be produced because it was eaten by the fishes the power of life was wanting osiris as a phantom once more impregnated isis but the fruit is harpocrates who was feeble in tois lay fun yolos in the lower limbs that is corresponding to the significance of thayoff at the feet here as is plainly evident foot is used in the phallic meaning this incurability of the setting sun corresponds to the incurability of ray in the above-mentioned older egyptian sun hymn osiris although only a phantom now prepares the young son his son horus for a battle with typhon the evil spirit of darkness osiris and horus correspond to the father-son symbolism mentioned in the beginning which symbolic figure corresponding again to the above formulation is flanked by the well-formed and ugly figures of horus and harpocrates the latter appearing mostly as a cripple often represented distorted to a mere caricature he is confused in the tradition very much with horus with whom he also has the name in common hor pi crude as his real name reads is composed from crude child and hor from the adjective hri equals up on top and signifies the upcoming child as the rising sun and opposed to osiris who personifies the setting sun the sun of the west thus osiris and horpi crude or horus are one being both husband and son of the same mother hathor isis the kadam ra the sun god of lower egypt represented as a ram has at his side as the female divinity of the land hat mahit who wears the fish on her head she is the mother and wife of bai neb did ram local name of chenum ra in the hymn of hibis amon ra was invoked thy chum mom dwells in mendes united as the quadruple god thumuis he is the phallus the lord of the gods the bull of his mother rejoices in the cow ahet the mother and man fructifies through his semen in further inscriptions hot mahit was directly referred to as the mother of mendes mendes is the greek form of by nebdid ram she is also invoked as the good with the additional significance of ta nofert or young woman the cow as symbol of the mother is found in all possible forms and variations of hathor isis and also in the female nun parallel to this is the primitive goddess nit or neith the protoplasm which related to the hindu atman is equally of masculine and feminine nature none is therefore invoked as amon the original water which is in the beginning he is also designated as the father of fathers the mother of mothers to this corresponds the invocation to the female side of nun amon of nit or neith nit the ancient the mother of god the mistress of esne the father of fathers the mother of mothers who is the beetle and the vulture the being in its beginning nit the ancient the mother who bore the light god ra who bore first of all when there was nothing which brought forth the cow the ancient which bore the sun and then laid the germ of gods and men the word nun has the significance of young fresh new also the oncoming waters of the nile flood in a transferred sense nun was also used for the chaotic primitive waters in general for the primitive generating matter which was personified by the goddess nunet from her nut sprang the goddess of heaven who was represented with a starry body and also as the heavenly cow with a starry body when the sun god little by little retires on the back of the heavenly cow just as poor lazarus returns 
into abraham's bosom each has the same significance they return into the mother in order to rise as horus thus it can be said that in the morning the goddess is the mother at noon the sister-wife and in the evening again the mother who receives the dying in her lap reminding us of the pieta of michelangelo as shown by the illustration from diderot's iconographie chrétienne this thought has been transferred as a whole into christianity thus the fate of osiris is explained he passes into the mother's womb the chest the sea the tree the column of ashtarts he is dismembered reformed and reappears again in his son hor pi crude before entering upon the further mysteries which the beautiful myth reveals to us there is still much to be said about the symbol of the tree osiris lies in the branches of the tree surrounded by them as in the mother's womb the motive of embracing and entwining is often found in the sun myths meaning that it is the myth of rebirth a good example is the sleeping beauty also the legend of the girl who is enclosed between the bark and the trunk but who is freed by a youth with his horn the horn is of gold and silver which hints at the sunbeam in the phallic meaning compare the previous legend of the horn an exotic legend tells of the sun hero how he must be freed from the plant entwining around him a girl dreams of her lover who has fallen into the water she tries to save him but first has to pull seaweed and sea grass from the water then she catches him in an african myth the hero after his act must first be disentangled from the seaweed in the polynesian myth the hero's ship was encoiled by the tentacles of a gigantic polyp ray's ship is encoiled by a night serpent on its night journey on the sea in the poetic rendering of the history of buddha's birth by sir edwin arnold the light of asia page five the motive of an embrace is also found queen maya stood at noon her days fulfilled under a palso in the palace grounds a stately trunk straight as a temple shaft with crown of glossy leaves and fragrant blooms and knowing the time come for all things new the conscious tree bent down its boughs to make a bower about queen maya's majesty and earth put forth a thousand sudden flowers to spread a couch while ready for the bath the rock hard by gave out a limpid stream of crystal flow so brought she forth the child we come across a very similar motive in the cult legend of the samian hera yearly it was claimed that the image disappeared from the temple was fastened somewhere on the seashore on a trunk of a ligose tree and wound about with its branches there it was found and was treated with wedding cake this feast is undoubtedly a iapus phanus ritual marriage because in samos there was a legend that zeus had first had long continued secret love relation with hera in plataea and argos the marriage procession was represented with bridesmaids marriage feast and so on the festival took place in the wedding month Thialiatho, beginning of february but in plataea the image was previously carried into a lonely place in the wood approximately corresponding to the legend of plutarch that zeus had kidnapped hera and then had hidden her in a cave of cithaeron according to our deductions previously made we must conclude from this that there is still another train of thought namely the magic charm of rejuvenation which is condensed in the hieroscosmos the disappearance and hiding in the wood in the cave on the seashore entwined in a willow tree points to the death of the sun and rebirth the early springtime thealothea the time of marriage in february fits in with that very well in fact parsanius informs us that the argivan hera became a maiden again by a yearly bath in the spring of canathos the significance of the bath is emphasized by the information that in the platean cult of hera Talia, tritonian nymphs appeared as water carriers in a tale from the iliad where the conjugal couch of zeus upon mount ida is described it is said the son of saturn spake and took his wife into his arms 
while underneath the pear the sacred earth threw up her freshest herbs the dewy lotus and the crocus flower and thick and soft the highest scent all these upbore them from the ground upon this couch they lay while o'er them a bright golden cloud gathered and shed its drops of glistening dew so slumbered on the heights of gargoyles the all-father overcome by sleep and love and held his consort in his arms translated by w c bryant drexler recognizes in this description an unmistakable allusion to the garden of the gods on the extreme western shore of the ocean an idea which might have been taken from a pre-homeric hierogosmos hymn this western land is the land of the setting sun whither hercules gilgamesh etc hasten with the sun in order to find their immortality where the sun and the maternal sea unite in an eternally rejuvenating intercourse our supposition of a condensation of the hieroscamos with the myth of rebirth is probably confirmed by this pausanias mentions a related myth fragment where the statue of artemis orthia is also called lygodesma chained with willows because it was found in a willow tree this tale seems to be related to the general greek celebration of hierogosmos with the above-mentioned customs end of section eighteen section nineteen of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section nineteen chapter five part three the motive of the devouring which frobenius has shown to be a regular constituent of the sun myths is closely related to this also metaphorically the whale dragon mother's womb always devours the hero the devouring may also be partial instead of complete a six-year-old girl who goes to school unwillingly dreams that her leg is encircled by a large red worm she had a tender interest for this creature contrary to what might be expected an adult patient who cannot separate from an older friend on account of an extraordinarily strong mother transference dreams that she had to get across some deep water typical idea with this friend her friend fell in mother transference she tries to drag her out and almost succeeds but a large crab seizes on the dreamer by the foot and tries to pull her in etymology also confirms this conception there is an indo-germanic root velu vel with the meaning of encircling surrounding turning from this is derived sanskrit val velati equals to cover to surround to encircle to encoil symbol of the snake valley equals creeping plant uluta equals boa constrictor equals latin volutus lithuanian velu velti equals wilkeln to roll up church slavonian Bellina equals old high german wella equals wella wave or billow to the root velu also belongs the root uvo with the meaning cover corium womb the serpent on account of its casting its skin is an excellent symbol of rebirth sanskrit yulva yulba has the same meaning latin volva volvula volva to velu also belongs the root ulvora with the meaning of fruitful field covering or husk of plants sheath sanskrit urvara equals sown field zend urvara equals plant see the personification of the ploughed furrow the same root vel has also the meaning of wallen to undulate sanskrit yul muka equals conflagration phalea phala gothic vulan equals wallen to undulate old high german and middle high german walm equals heat 
glow it is typical that in the state of involution the hair of the sun hero always falls out from the heat further the root vel is found with the meaning to sound and to will to wish libido the motive of recoiling is mother symbolism this is verified by the fact that the trees for example bring forth again like the whale in the legend of jonah they do that very generally thus in the greek legend the melia verarapa melian virgins of the ash trees are the mothers of the race of men of the iron age in northern mythology asgar the ash tree is the primitive father his wife embla is the emsig the active one and not as was earlier believed the aspen asgar probably means in the first place the phallic spear of the ash tree compare the sabine custom of parting the bride's hair with the lance the bundahesh symbolizes the first people meshia and meshian as the tree rivas one part of which places a branch in a hole of the other part the material which according to the northern myth was animated by the god when he created men is designated as tree equals wood tree i recall also Eulen equals wood which in latin is called materia in the wood of the world ash yggdrasil a human pair hid themselves at the end of the world from whom sprang the race of the renewed world the noah motive is easily recognized in this conception the night journey on the sea at the same time in the symbol of yggdrasil a mother idea is again apparent at the moment of the destruction of the world the world ash becomes the guardian mother the tree of death and life one aprilion pregnant this function of rebirth of the world ash also helps to elucidate the representation met with in the egyptian book of the dead which is called the gate of knowledge of the soul of the east i am the pilot in the holy keel i am the steersman who allows no rest in the ship of ra i know that tree of emerald green from whose midst ra rises to the height of the clouds ship and tree of the dead death ship and death tree are here closely connected the conception is that ra born from the tree ascends osiris in the erica the representation of the sun god mithra is probably explained in the same way he is represented upon the hedernheim relief with half his body arising from the top of a tree in the same way numerous other monuments show mithra half embodied in the rock and illustrate a rock birth similar to men frequently there is a stream near the birthplace of mithra this conglomeration of symbols is also found in the birth of ascanes the first saxon king who grew from the hearts rocks which are in the midst of the wood near a fountain here we find all the mother symbols united earth wood water three forms of tangible matter we can wonder no longer that in the middle ages the tree was poetically addressed with the title of honour mistress likewise it is not astonishing that the christian legend transformed the tree of death the cross into the tree of life so that christ was often represented on a living and fruit-bearing tree this reversion of the cross symbol to the tree of life which even in babylon was an important and authentic religious symbol is also considered entirely probable by zirkler an authority on the history of the cross the pre-christian meaning of the symbol does not contradict this interpretation on the contrary its meaning is life the appearance of the cross in the sun worship here the cross with equal arms and the swastika cross as representative of the sun's rays as well as in the cult of the goddess of love isis with the crux and sada the rope the speculum veneris etc in no way contradicts the previous historical meaning 
the christian legend has made abundant use of this symbolism the student of medieval history is familiar with the representation of the cross growing above the grave of adam the legend was that adam was buried on golgotha seth had planted on his grave a branch of the paradise tree which became the cross and tree of death of christ we all know that through adam's guilt sin and death came into the world and christ through his death has redeemed us from the guilt to the question in what had adam's guilt consisted it is said that the unpardonable sin to be expiated by death was that he dared to pick a fruit from the paradise tree the results of this are described in an oriental legend one to whom it was permitted to cast one look into paradise after the fall saw the tree there and the four streams but the tree was withered and in its branches lay an infant the mother had become pregnant this remarkable legend corresponds to the talmudic tradition that adam before eve already possessed a demon wife by name lilith with whom he quarrelled for mastership but lilith raised herself into the air through the magic of the name of god and hid herself in the sea adam forced her back with the help of three angels lilith became a nightmare a lamia who threatened those with child and who kidnapped the newborn child the parallel myth is that of the lamias the spectres of the night who terrified the children the original legend is that lamia enticed zeus but the jealous hera however caused lamia to bring only dead children into the world since that time the raging lamia is the persecutor of children whom she destroys wherever she can this motive frequently recurs in fairy tales where the mother often appears directly as a murderess or as a devourer of men a german paradigm is the well-known tale of hansel and gretel lamia is actually a large voracious fish which establishes the connection with the whale dragon myth so beautifully worked out by frobenius in which the sea monster devours the sun hero for rebirth and where the hero must employ every stratagem to conquer the monster here again we meet with the idea of the terrible mother in the form of the voracious fish the mouth of death in frobenius there are numerous examples where the monster has devoured not only men but also animals plants an entire country all of which are redeemed by the hero to a glorious rebirth the lamias are typical nightmares the feminine nature of which is abundantly proven their universal peculiarity is that they ride upon their victims their counterparts are spectral horses which bear their riders along in a mad gallop one recognizes very easily in these symbolic forms the type of anxious dream which as rucklin shows has already become important for the interpretation of fairy tales through the investigation of leisner the typical writing takes on a special aspect through the results of the analytic investigation of infantile psychology the two contributions of freud and myself have emphasized on one side the anxiety significance of the horse on the other side the sexual meaning of the fantasy of writing when we take these experiences into consideration we need no longer be surprised that the maternal world ash yggdrasil is called in german the frightful horse karna geider says of nightmares in latin even to-day the country people drive off these nymphs mother goddesses myra by throwing a bone at the head of a horse upon the roof bones of this kind can often be seen throughout the land on the farmhouses of the country people by night however they are believed to ride at the time of the first sleep and they are believed to tire out their horses by long journeys the connection of nightmare and horse seems at first glance to be present also etymologically nightmare and mare the indo-germanic root for mara is mark mara is the horse english mare old high german mara male horse and meraha female horse old norse mare mara equals nightmare anglo-saxon mara mara the french cauchemar comes from calcare equals to tread to step a viterative meaning therefore to tread or press down it was also said of the cock who stepped upon the hen this movement is also typical for the nightmare 
therefore it is said of king van landi mara trod han the mara trod on him in sleep even to death a synonym for nightmare is the troll or treater treader this movement calcare is proven again by the experience of freud and myself with children where a special infantile sexual significance is attached to stepping or kicking the common aryan root mar means to die therefore mara the dead or death from this results mors poropos equals fate also parope as is well known the norns sitting under the world ash personify fate like clotho lachesis and atropos with the celts the conception of the fates probably passes into that of matris and matroni which had a divine significance among the germans a well-known passage in julius caesar de bello gallico one fifty informs us of this meaning of the mother in latin that these matrons should declare by lots whether it be to their advantage or not to engage in battle in slav mora means which pona mora equals demon nightmare mor or more swiss german means sow also as an insult the bohemian mur means nightmare and evening moth sphinx this strange connection is explained through analysis where it often occurs that animals with movable shells venus shell or wings are utilized for very transparent reasons as symbols of the female genitals the sphingina are the twilight moths they like the nightmare come in the darkness finally it is to be observed that the sacred olive tree of athens is called puopia that was derived from peropus hilarer hopetios wished to cut down the tree but killed himself with the axe in the attempt the sound resemblance of mar mare with mere equals c in latin mar equals c is remarkable although etymologically accidental might it refer back to the great primitive idea of the mother who in the first place meant to us our individual world and afterwards became the symbol of all worlds goethe said of the mothers they are encircled by images of all creatures the christians too could not refrain from reuniting their mother of god with water ave maria's stella is the beginning of a hymn to mary then again it is the horses of neptune which symbolize the waves of the sea it is probably of importance that the infantile word mama mother's breast is repeated in its initial sound in all possible languages and that the mothers of two religious heroes are called mary and maya that the mother is the horse of the child is to be seen most plainly in the primitive custom of carrying the child on the back or letting it ride on the hip odin hung on the world ash the mother his horse of terror the egyptian sun god sits on the back of his mother the heavenly cow we have already seen that according to egyptian conceptions isis the mother of god played an evil trick on the sun god with the poisonous snake also isis behaved treacherously toward her son horus in plutarch's tradition that is horus vanquished the evil typhon who murdered osiris treacherously terrible mother equals typhon isis however set him free again horus thereupon rebelled laid hands on his mother and tore the regal ornaments from her head whereupon hermes gave her a cow's head then horus conquered typhon a second time typhon in the greek legend is a monstrous dragon even without this confirmation it is evident that the battle of horus is the typical battle of the sun hero with the whale dragon of the latter we know that it is a symbol of the dreadful mother of the voracious jaws of death where men are dismembered and ground up whoever vanquishes this monster has gained a new or eternal youth for this purpose one must in spite of all dangers descend into the belly of the monster journey to hell and spend some time there imprisonment by night in the sea the battle with the night serpent signifies therefore the conquering of the mother who is suspected of an infamous crime that is the betrayal of the son a full confirmation of the connection comes to us through the fragment of the babylonian epic of the creation discovered by george smith mostly from the library of Asser 
banapal the period of the origin of the text was probably in the time of hammurabi two thousand b c we learn from this account of creation that the sun god ea the son of the depths of the waters and the god of wisdom had conquered apsu apsu is the creator of the great gods he existed in the beginning in a sort of trinity with tiamat the mother of gods and mumu his vizier ea conquered the father but tiamat plotted revenge she prepared herself for battle against the gods mother huber who created everything procured invincible weapons gave birth to giant snakes with pointed teeth relentless in every way filled their bellies with poison instead of blood furious gigantic lizards clothed them with horrors let them swell with the splendor of horror form them rearing whoever sees them shall die of terror their bodies shall rear without turning to escape she arrayed the lizards dragons and lahaman hurricanes mad dogs scorpion men mighty storms fishmen and rams with relentless weapons without fear of conflict powerful are tiamat's commands irresistible are they after tiamat had powerfully done her work she conceived evil against the gods her descendants in order to revenge apsu tiamat did evil when ea now heard this thing he became painfully anxious sorrowfully he sat himself he went to the father his creator ansar to relate to him all that tiamat plotted tiamat our mother has taken an aversion to us has prepared a riotous mob furiously raging the gods finally opposed marduk the god of spring the victorious sun against the fearful host of tiamat marduk prepared for battle of his chief weapon which he created it is said he created the evil wind imhala the south storm and the hurricane the fourth wind the seventh wind the whirlwind and the harmful wind then let he loose the winds which he had created the seven to cause confusion within tiamat they followed behind him then the lord took up the cyclone his great weapon for his chariot he mounted storm wind the incomparable the terrible one his chief weapon is the wind and a net with which he will entangle tiamat he approaches tiamat and challenges her to a combat then tiamat and marduk the wise one of the gods came together rising for the fight approaching to the battle then the lord spread out his net and caught her he let loose the imhala in his train at her face then tiamat now opened her mouth as wide as she could he let the imhala rush in so that her lips could not close with the raging winds he filled her womb her inward parts were seized and she opened wide her mouth he touched her with the spear dismembered her body he slashed her inward parts and cut out her heart subdued her and put an end to her life he threw down her body and stepped upon it after marduk slew the mother he devised the creation of the world there the lord rested contemplating her body then divided he the colossus planning wisely he cut it apart like a flat fish into two parts one half he took and with it he covered the heavens in this manner marduk created the universe from the mother it is clearly evident that the killing of the mother dragon here takes place under the idea of a wind fecundation with negative accompaniments the world is created from the mother that is to say from the libido taken away from the mother through sacrifice we shall have to consider this significant formula more closely in the last chapter the most interesting parallels to this primitive myth are to be found in the literature of the old testament as gunkel has brilliantly pointed out it is worth while to trace the psychology of these parallels isaiah fifty one nine awake awake put on strength o arm of the lord awake as in the ancient days in the generation of old art thou not it that hath cut rahab and wounded the dragon ten art thou not it which hath dried the sea the waters of the great deep that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransomed to pass over the name of rahab is frequently used for egypt in the old testament also dragon isaiah chapter thirty verse seven calls egypt the silent rahab and means 
therefore something evil and hostile rahab is the well-known whore of jericho who later as the wife of prince salma became the ancestress of christ here rahab appeared as the old dragon as tiamat against whose evil power marduk or jehovah marched forth the expression the ransomed refers to the jews freed from bondage but it is also mythological for the hero again frees those previously devoured by the whale frobenius psalm eighty nine ten thou hast broken rahab in pieces as one that is slain job twenty six twelve to thirteen he divideth the sea with his power and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud by his spirit he hath garnished the heavens his hand hath formed the crooked serpent gunkel places rahab as identical with chaos that is the same as tiamat gunkel translates the breaking to pieces as violation tiamat or rahab as the mother is also the whore gilgamesh treats ishtar in this way when he accuses her of whoredom this insult towards the mother is very familiar to us from dream analysis the dragon rahab appears also as leviathan the water monster maternal sea psalm seventy four thirteen through fifteen thirteen thou didst divide the sea by thy strength thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters fourteen thou breakest the heads of leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness fifteen thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood thou didst dry up mighty rivers while only the phallic meaning of the leviathan was emphasized in the first part of this work we now discover also the maternal meaning a further parallel is isaiah twenty seven one in that day the lord with his cruel and great and strong sword shall punish leviathan the piercing serpent even leviathan that crooked serpent and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea we come upon a special motive in job chapter forty one five one canst thou draw out leviathan with an hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down canst thou put an hook in his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn numerous parallels to this motive are to be found among exotic myths in frobenius where the maternal sea monster was also fished for the comparison of the mother libido with the elementary powers of the sea and the powerful monsters borne by the earth show how invincibly great is the power of that libido which we designate as maternal we have already seen that the incest prohibition prevents the son from reproducing himself through the mother but this must be done by the god as is shown with remarkable clearness and candour in the pious egyptian mythology which has preserved the most ancient and simple concepts thus chenum the moulder the potter the architect moulds his egg upon the potter's wheel for he is the immortal growth the reproduction of himself and his own rebirth the creator of the egg which emerged from the primitive waters in the book of the dead it says i am the sublime falcon the sun god which has come forth from his egg another passage in the book of the dead reads i am the creator of nun who has taken his place in the underworld my nest is not seen and my egg is not broken a further passage reads that great and noble god in his egg who is his own originator of that which has arisen from him therefore the god nagaga ur is also called the great cackler book of the dead i cackle like a goose and i whistle like a falcon the mother is reproached with the incest prohibition as an act of wilful maliciousness by which she excludes the son from immortality therefore god must at least rebel overpower and chastise the mother compare adam and lilith above the overpowering signifies incestuous rape herodotus has preserved for us a valuable fragment of this religious fantasy and how they celebrate their feast to isis in the city of busiris i have already previously remarked after the sacrifice all of them men and women full ten thousand people begin to beat each other but it would be sin for me to mention for whom they do beat each other but in pa primus they celebrated the sacrifice with holy actions as in the other places about the time when the sun sets some few priests 
are busy around the image most of them stand at the entrance with wooden clubs and others who would fulfil a vow more than a thousand men also stand in a group with wooden cudgels opposite them now on the eve of the festival they take the image out in a small and gilded temple into another sacred edifice then the few who remain with the image draw a four-wheeled chariot upon which the temple stands with the image which it encloses but the others who stand in the anterooms are not allowed to enter those under a vow who stand by the god beat them off now occurs a furious battle with clubs in which they bruise each other's bodies and as i believe many even die from their wounds notwithstanding this the egyptians consider that none die the natives claim that this festival gathering was introduced for the following reason in this sanctuary lived the mother of ares now ares was brought up abroad and when he became a man he came to have intercourse with his mother the servants of his mother who had seen him did not allow him to enter peacefully but prevented him at which he fetched people from another city who mistreated the servants and had entrance to his mother therefore they asserted that this slaughter was introduced at the feast for ares it is evident that the pious here fight their way to a share in the mystery of the raping of the mother this is the part which belongs to them while the heroic deed belongs to the god by ares is meant the egyptian typhon as we have good reasons to suppose thus typhon represents the evil longing for the mother with which other myth forms reproach the mother according to the well-known example the death of balder quite analogous to the death of osiris attack of cygnus of ray because of the wounding by the branch of the mistletoe seems to need a similar explanation it is recounted in the myth how all creatures were pledged not to hurt balder save only the mistletoe which was forgotten presumably because it was too young this killed balder mistletoe is a parasite the female piece of wood in the fire boring ritual was obtained from the wood of a parasitical or creeping plant the fire mother the mare rests upon marintac in which grim suspects the mistletoe the mistletoe was a remedy against barrenness in gaul the druid alone was allowed to climb the holy oak amid solemn ceremonies after the completed sacrifice in order to cut off the ritual mistletoe this act is a religiously limited and organized incest that which grows on the tree is the child which man might have by the mother then man himself would be in a renewed and rejuvenated form and precisely this is what man cannot have because the incest prohibition forbids it as the celtic custom shows the act is performed by the priest only with the observation of certain ceremonies the hero god and the redeemer of the world however do the unpermitted the superhuman thing and through it purchase immortality the dragon who must be overcome for this purpose means as much have been for some time clearly seen the resistance against the incest dragon and serpent especially with the characteristic accumulation of anxiety attributes are the symbolic representations of anxiety which correspond to the repressed incest wish it is therefore intelligible when we come across the tree with the snake again and again in paradise the snake even tempts to sin the snake or dragon possesses in particular the meaning of treasure guardian and defender the phallic as well as the feminine meaning of the dragon indicates that it is again a symbol of the sexual neutral or bisexual libido that is to say a symbol of the libido in opposition in this significance the black horse apa osha the demon of opposition appears in the old persian song tish traya where it obstructs the sources of the rain lake the white horse tish traya makes two futile attempts to vanquish apa osha at the third attempt with the help of aher a mazda he is successful whereupon the sluices of heaven open and a fruitful rain pours down upon the earth in this song one sees very beautifully in the choice of symbol how libido is opposed to libido will against will the discordance of primitive man with himself which he recognizes again in all the adversity and contrasts 
of external nature the symbol of the tree encoiled by the serpent may also be translated as the mother defended from incest by resistance this symbol is by no means rare upon mithraic monuments the rock encircled by a snake is to be comprehended similarly because mithra is one born from a rock the menace of the newborn by the snake mithra hercules is made clear through the legend of lilith and lamia python the dragon of leto and poini who devastates the land of crotopus are sent by the father of the newborn this idea indicates the localization well known in psychoanalysis of the incest anxiety in the father the father represents the active repulse of the incest wish of the son the crime unconsciously wished for by the son is imputed to the father under the guise of a pretended murderous purpose this being the cause of the mortal fear of the son for the father a frequent neurotic symptom in conformity with this idea the monster to be overcome by the young hero is frequently a giant the guardian of the treasure or the woman a striking example is the giant chumbaba in the gilgamesh epic who protected the garden of ishtar he is overcome by gilgamesh whereby ishtar is won thereupon she makes erotic advances towards gilgamesh this data should be sufficient to render intelligible the role of horus in plutarch especially the violent usage of isis through overpowering the mother the hero becomes equal to the son he reproduces himself he wins the strength of the invincible son the power of eternal rejuvenation we thus understand a series of representations from the mithraic myth on the hedernheim relief there we see first of all the birth of mithra from the top of the tree the next representation shows him carrying the conquered bull comparable to the monstrous bull overcome by gilgamesh this bull signifies the concentrated significance of the monster the father who is giant and dangerous animal embodies the incest prohibition and agrees with the individual libido of the son hero which he overcomes by self-sacrifice the third picture represents mithra when he grasps the head ornament of the son the nimbus this act recalls to us first of all the violence of horus towards isis secondly the christian basic thought that those who have overcome attain the crown of eternal life on the fourth picture soul kneels before mithra these last two representations show plainly that mithra has taken to himself the strength of the sun so that he becomes the lord of the sun as well he has conquered his animal nature the bull the animal knows no incest prohibition man is therefore man because he conquers the incest wish that is the animal nature thus mithra has sacrificed his animal nature the incest wish and with that has overcome the mother that is to say the terrible death-bringing mother a solution is already anticipated in the gilgamesh epic through the formal renunciation of the horrible ishtar by the hero the overcoming of the mother in the mithraic sacrifice which had almost an ascetic character took place no longer by the archaic overpowering but through the renunciation the sacrifice of the wish the primitive thought of incestuous reproduction through entrance into the mother's womb had already been displaced because man was so far advanced in domestication that he believed that the eternal life of the son is reached not through the perpetuation of incest but through the sacrifice of the incest wish this important change expressed in the mithraic mystery finds its full expression for the first time in the symbol of the crucified god a bleeding human sacrifice was hung on the tree of life for adam's sins the first-born sacrifices its life to the mother when he suffers hanging on the branch a disgraceful and painful death a mode of death which belongs to the most ignominious forms of execution which roman antiquity had reserved for only the lowest criminal thus the hero dies as if he had committed the most shameful crime he does this by returning into the birth-giving branch of the tree of life at the same time paying for his guilt with the pangs of death the animal nature is repressed most powerfully in this deed of the highest courage and the greatest renunciation therefore a greater salvation is to be expected for humanity because such a deed alone seems appropriate to expiate adam's guilt 
as has already been mentioned the hanging of the sacrifice on the tree is a generally widespread ritual custom germanic examples being especially abundant the ritual consists in the sacrifice being pierced by a spear thus it is said of odin etta have them all i know that i hung on the wind-swept tree nine nights through wounded by a spear dedicated to odin i myself to myself the hanging of the sacrifice to the cross also occurred in america prior to its discovery muller mentions the fedgervarian manuscript of mexican hieroglyphic codex at the conclusion of which there is a colossal cross in the middle of which there hangs a bleeding divinity equally interesting is the cross of palenque up above is a bird on either side two human figures who look at the cross and hold a child against it either for sacrifice or baptism the old mexicans are said to have invoked the favour of centiotles the daughter of heaven and the goddess of wheat every spring by nailing upon the cross a youth or a maiden and by shooting the sacrifice with arrows the name of the mexican cross signifies tree of our life or flesh an effigy from the island of Philae represents osiris in the form of a crucified god wept over by isis and nephthys the sister consort the meaning of the cross is certainly not limited to the tree of life as has already been shown just as the tree of life has also a phallic sub-meaning as libido symbol so there is a further significance to the cross than life or immortality muller uses it as a sign of rain and of fertility because it appears among the indians distinctly as a magic charm of fertility it goes without saying therefore that it plays a role in the sun cult it is also noteworthy that the sign of the cross is an important sign for the keeping away of all evil like the ancient gesture of anophica the phallic amulets also serve the same purpose zirkler appears to have overlooked the fact that the phallic crux and sata is the same cross which has flourished in countless examples in the soil of antiquity copies of this crux and sata are found in many places and almost every collection of antiquities possesses one or more specimens finally it must be mentioned that the form of the human body is imitated in the cross as of a man with arms outspread it is remarkable that in early christian representations christ is not nailed to the cross but stands before it with arms outstretched maurice gives a striking basis for this interpretation when he says it is a fact not less remarkable than well attested that the druids in their groves were accustomed to select the most stately and beautiful tree as an emblem of the deity they adored and cutting off the side branches they affixed two of the largest of them to the highest part of the trunk in such a manner that those branches extended on each side like the arms of a man and together with the body presented the appearance of a huge cross and in the bark in several places was also inscribed the letter t tau End of section 19section twenty of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty chapter five part four the tree of knowledge of the hindu dashaina sect assumes human form it was represented as a mighty thick trunk in the form of a human head from the top of which grew out two longer branches hanging down at the sides and one short vertical uprising branch crowned by a bud or blossom-like thickening robertson in his evangelical myths mentions that in the assyrian system there exists the representation of the divinity in the form of a cross in which the vertical beam corresponds to a human form and the horizontal beam to a pair of conventionalized wings old grecian idols such for example as were found in large numbers in aegina have a similar character an immoderately long head and arms slightly raised wing shaped and in front distinct breasts i must leave it an open question as to whether the symbol of the cross has any relation to the two pieces of wood in the religious fire production as is frequently claimed 
it does appear however as if the cross symbol actually still possessed the significance of union for this idea belongs to the fertility charm and especially to the thought of eternal rebirth which is most intimately bound up with the cross the thought of union expressed by the symbol of the cross is met with in timaeus of plato where the world soul is conceived as stretched out between heaven and earth in the form of an x chi hence in the form of a st andrew's cross when we now learn furthermore that the world soul contains in itself the world as a body then this picture inevitably reminds us of the mother dialogues of plato jowett volume two page five twenty eight and in the centre he put the soul which he diffused through the whole and also spread over all the body round about and he made one solitary and only heaven a circle moving in a circle having such excellence as to be able to hold converse with itself and needing no other friendship or acquaintance having these purposes in view he created the world to be a blessed god this highest degree of inactivity and freedom from desire symbolized by the being enclosed within itself signifies divine blessedness the only human prototype of this conception is the child in the mother's womb or rather more the adult man in the continuous embrace of the mother from whom he originates corresponding to this mythologic philosophic conception the enviable diogenes inhabited a tub thus giving mythologic expression to the blessedness and resemblance to the divine in his freedom from desire plato says as follows of the bond of the world soul to the world body now god did not make the soul after the body although we have spoken of them in this order for when he put them together he would never have allowed that the elder should serve the younger but this is what we say at random because we ourselves too are very largely affected by chance whereas he made the soul in origin and excellence prior to and older than the body to be the ruler and mistress of whom the body was to be the subject it seems conceivable from other indications that the conception of the soul in general is a derivative of the mother imago that is to say a symbolic designation for the amount of libido remaining in the mother imago compare the christian representation of the soul as the bride of christ the further development of the world soul in timaeus takes place in an obscure fashion in mystic numerals when the mixture was completed the following occurred this entire compound he divided lengthwise into two parts which he joined to one another at the centre like the figure of an x this passage approaches very closely the division and union of atman who after the division is compared to a man and a woman who hold each other in an embrace another passage is worth mentioning after the entire union of the soul had taken place according to the master's mind he formed all that is corporeal within this and joined it together so as to penetrate it throughout moreover i refer to my remarks about the maternal meaning of the world soul in plotinus in chapter two a similar detachment of the symbol of the cross from a concrete figure we find among the musk hogean indians who stretch above the surface of the water ponder stream two ropes crosswise and at the point of intersection throw into the water fruits oil and precious stones as a sacrifice here the divinity is evidently the water not the cross which designates the place of sacrifice only through the point of intersection the sacrifice at the place of union indicates why this symbol was a primitive charm of fertility why we meet it so frequently in the pre-christian era among the goddesses of love mother goddesses especially among the egyptians in isis and the sun-god 
we have already discussed the continuous union of these two divinities as the cross tau t crux ansata always recurs in the hand of tum the supreme god the hegemon of the aeneid it may not be superfluous to say something more of the destination of tum the tum of on heliopolis bears the name the father of his mother what that means needs no explanation jesus or nebit hotpet the goddess joined to him was called sometimes the mother sometimes the daughter sometimes the wife of the god the day of the beginning of autumn is designated in the heliopolitan inscriptions as the festival of the goddess jasasit as the arrival of the sister for the purpose of uniting with her father it is the day in which the goddess mehnit completes her work so that the god osiris may enter into the left eye by which the moon is meant the day is also called the filling up of the sacred eye with its needs the heavenly cow with the moon eye the cow-headed isis takes to herself in the autumn equinox the seed which procreates horus moon as keeper of the seed the eye evidently represents the genitals as in the myth of indra who had to bear spread over his whole body the likeness of yoni vulva on account of a bathsheba outrage but was so far pardoned by the gods that the disgraceful likeness of yoni was changed into eyes the pupil in the eye is a child the great god becomes a child again he enters the mother's womb in order to renew himself in a hymn it is said thy mother the heavens stretches forth her arms to thee in another place it is said thou shinest o father of the gods upon the back of thy mother daily thy mother takes thee in her arms when thou illuminatest the dwelling of night thou unitest with thy mother the heavens the tum of pitum heliopolis not only bears the crux on sada as a symbol but also has this sign as his most frequent surname that is ankh or anki which means life for the living he is chiefly honoured as the demon serpent agatho of whom it is said the holy demon serpent agatho goes forth from the city nezi the snake on account of casting its skin is the symbol of renewal as is the scarabaeus a symbol of the sun of whom it is said that he being of masculine sex only reproduces himself the name chanam another name for tum always meaning the sun god comes from the verb kanam which means to bind together to unite kanam appears chiefly as the potter the moulder of his egg the cross seems therefore to be an extraordinarily condensed symbol its supreme meaning is that of the tree of life and therefore is a symbol of the mother the symbolization in a human form is therefore intelligible the phallic forms of the crux ansata belong to the abstract meaning of life and fertility as well as to the meaning of union which we can now very properly interpret as cohabitation with the mother for the purpose of renewal it is therefore not only a very touching but also a very significant naive symbol when mary in an old english lament of the virgin accuses the cross of being a false tree which unjustly and without reason destroyed the pure fruit of her body her gentle birdling with a poisonous draught the draught of death which is destined only for the guilty descendants of the sinner adam her son was not a sharer in that guilt compare with this the cunning of isis with the fatal draught of love mary laments cross thou art the evil stepmother of my son so high hast thou hung him that i cannot even kiss his feet cross thou art my mortal enemy thou hast slain my little blue bird the holy cross answers woman i thank thee for my honour thy splendid fruit which now i bear shines as a red blossom 
not alone to save thee but to save the whole world this precious flower blooms in thee santa crux says of the relation to each other of the two mothers isis in the morning and isis in the evening thou hast been crowned as queen of heaven on account of the child which thou hast borne but i shall appear as the shining relic to the whole world at the day of judgment i shall then raise my lament for thy divine son innocently slain upon me thus the murderous mother of death unites with the mother of life in bringing forth a child in their lament for the dying god and as outward token of their union mary kisses the cross and is reconciled to it the naive egyptian antiquity has preserved for us the union of the contrasting tendencies in the mother idea of isis naturally this imago is merely a symbol of the libido of the son for the mother and describes the conflict between love and incest resistance the criminal incestuous purpose of the son appears projected as criminal cunning in the mother imago the separation of the son from the mother signifies the separation of man from the generic consciousness of animals from that infantile archaic thought characterized by the absence of individual consciousness it was only the power of the incest prohibition which created the self-conscious individual who formerly had been thoughtlessly one with the tribe and in this way alone did the idea of individual and final death become possible thus through the sin of adam death came into the world this as is evident is expressed figuratively that is in contrast form the mother's defence against the incest appears to the son as a malicious act which delivers him over to the fear of death this conflict faces us in the gilgamesh epic in its original freshness and passion where also the incest wish is projected on to the mother the neurotic who cannot leave the mother has good reasons the fear of death holds him there it seems as if no idea and no word were strong enough to express the meaning of this entire religions were constructed in order to give words to the immensity of this conflict this struggle for expression which continued down through the centuries certainly cannot have its source in the restricted realm of the vulgar conception of incest rather one must understand the law which is ultimately expressed as incest prohibition as coercion to domestication and consider the religious systems as institutions which first receive then organize and gradually sublimate the motor forces of the animal nature not immediately available for cultural purposes we will now return to the visions of miss miller those now following need no further detailed discussion the next vision is the image of a purple bay the symbolism of the sea connects smoothly with that which precedes one might think here in addition of the reminiscences of the bay of naples which we came across in part one in the sequence of the whole however we must not overlook the significance of the bay in french it is called un bailli which probably corresponds to a bay in the english text it might be worth while here to glance at the etymological side of this idea bay is generally used for something which is open just as the catalonian word badia by comes from badar to open in french baye means to have the mouth open to gape another word for the same is mirabusin bay or gulf latin sinus and a third word is golf golf which in french stands in closest relation to gouffre equals abyss golf is derived from thanatos which also means bosom and womb mother womb also vagina it can also mean a fold of a dress or pocket and may also mean a deep valley between high mountains 
these expressions clearly show what primitive ideas lie at their base they render intelligible goethe's choice of words at that place where faust wishes to follow the sun with winged desire in order in the everlasting day to drink its eternal light the mountain chain with all its gorges deep would then no more impede my godlike motion and now before mine eyes expands the ocean with all its bays in shining sleep faust's desire like that of every hero inclines toward the mysteries of rebirth of immortality therefore his course leads to the sea and down into the monstrous jaws of death the horror and narrowness of which at the same time signify the new day out on the open ocean speeds my dreaming the glassy flood before my feet is gleaming a new day beckons to a newer shore a fiery chariot borne on buoyant pinions sweeps near me now i soon shall ready be to pierce the ether's high unknown dominions to reach new spheres of pure activity this godlike rapture this supreme existence yes let me dare those gates to fling asunder which every man would fain go slinking by tis time through deeds this word of truth to thunder that with the height of god's man's dignity may vie nor from that gloomy gulf to shrink affrighted where fancy doth herself to self-born pangs compel to struggle toward that pass benighted around whose narrow mouth flame all the fires of hell to take this step with cheerful resolution though nothing that should be the certain swift conclusion it sounds like a confirmation when the succeeding vision of miss miller's is un felez a pic a steep precipitous cliff compare gouffre the entire series of individual visions is completed as the author observes by a confusion of sounds somewhat resembling wama wama this has a very primitive barbaric sound since we learn from the author nothing of the subjective roots of this sound nothing is left us but the suspicion that this sound might be considered taken in connection with the whole as a slight mutilation of the well-known call ma ma end of section twenty section twenty one of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty one chapter six part one the battle for deliverance from the mother there now comes a pause in the production of visions by miss miller then the activity of the unconscious is resumed very energetically a forest with trees and bushes appears after the discussions in the preceding chapter there is need only of a hint that the symbol of the forest coincides essentially with the meaning of the holy tree the holy tree is found generally in a sacred forest enclosure or in the garden of paradise the sacred grove often takes the place of the taboo tree and assumes all the attributes of the latter the erotic symbolism of the garden is generally known the forest like the tree has mythologically a maternal significance in the vision which now follows the forest furnishes the stage upon which the dramatic representation of the end of chewantable is played this act therefore takes place in or near the mother first i will give the beginning of the drama as it is in the original text up to the first attempt at sacrifice at the beginning of the next chapter the reader will find the continuation the monologue and the sacrificial scene the drama begins as follows the personage chewantopal came from the south on horseback around him a cloak of vivid colors red blue and white 
an indian in a costume of doe-skin covered with beads and ornamented with feathers advances squats down and prepares to let fly an arrow at juantapol the latter presents his breast in an attitude of defiance and the indian fascinated by that sight slinks away and disappears within the forest the hero juantapol appears on horseback this fact seems of importance because as the further course of the drama shows see chapter eight the horse plays no indifferent role but suffers the same death as the hero and is even called faithful brother by the latter these allusions point to a remarkable similarity between horse and rider there seems to exist an intimate connection between the two which guides them to the same destiny we already have seen that the symbolization of the libido in resistance through the terrible mother in some places runs parallel with the horse strictly speaking it would be incorrect to say that the horse is or means the mother the mother idea is a libido symbol and the horse is also a libido symbol and at some points the two symbols intersect in their significances the common feature of the two ideas lies in the libido especially in the libido repressed from incest the hero and the horse appear to us in this setting like an artistic formation of the idea of humanity with its repressed libido whereby the horse acquires the significance of the animal unconscious which appears domesticated and subjected to the will of man agni upon the ram wotan upon sleipnir aher mazda upon anglomania yahweh upon the monstrous seraph christ upon the ass dionysus upon the ass mithra upon the horse man upon the human-footed horse freer upon the golden bristle boar etc are parallel representations the chargers of mythology are always invested with great significance they very often appear anthropomorphized thus men's horse has human forelegs balaam's ass human speech the retreating bull upon whose back mithra springs in order to strike him down is according to a persian legend actually the god himself the mock crucifix of the palatine represents the crucified with an ass's head perhaps in reference to the ancient legend that in the temple of jerusalem the image of an ass was worshipped as drossel bart horse's mane wotan is half human half horse an old german riddle very prettily shows this unity between horse and horseman who are the two who travel two thing together they have three eyes ten feet and one tail and thus they travel over the land legends ascribe properties to the horse which psychologically belong to the unconscious of man horses are clairvoyant and clairaudient they show the way when the lost wanderer is helpless they have mantic powers in the iliad the horse prophesies evil they hear the words which the corpse speaks when it is taken to the grave words which men cannot hear caesar learned from his human-footed horse probably taken from the identification of caesar with the phrygian men that he was to conquer the world an ass prophesied to augustus the victory of actium the horse also sees phantoms all these things correspond to typical manifestations of the unconscious therefore it is perfectly intelligible that the horse as the image of the wicked animal component of man has manifold connections with the devil the devil has a horse's foot in certain circumstances a horse's form at crucial moments he suddenly shows a cloven foot proverbial in the same way as in the abduction of hadding sleipnir 
suddenly looked out from behind wotan's mantle just as the nightmare rides on the sleeper so does the devil and therefore it is said that those who have nightmares are ridden by the devil in persian lore the devil is the steed of god the devil like all evil things represents sexuality witches have intercourse with him in which case he appears in the form of a goat or horse the unmistakably phallic nature of the devil is communicated to the horse as well hence this symbol occurs in connections where this is the only meaning which would furnish an explanation it is to be mentioned that loki generates in the form of a horse just as does the devil when in horse's form as an old fire god thus the lightning was represented theoromorphically as a horse an uneducated hysteric told me that as a child she had suffered from extreme fear of thunder because every time the lightning flashed she saw immediately afterwards a huge black horse reaching upwards as far as the sky it is said in a legend that the devil as the divinity of lightning casts a horse's foot lightning upon the roofs in accordance with the primitive meaning of thunder as fertilizer of the earth the phallic meaning is given both to lightning and the horse's foot in mythology the horse's foot really has the phallic function as in this dream an uneducated patient who originally had been violently forced to coitus by her husband very often dreams after separation that a wild horse springs upon her and kicks her in the abdomen with his hind foot plutarch has given us the following words of a prayer from the dionysus orgies in greek come o dionysus in thy temple of ellis come with the graces into thy holy temple come in sacred frenzy with the bull's foot pegasus with his foot strikes out of the earth the spring hippocrene upon a corinthian statue of bellerophon which was also a fountain the water flowed out from the horse's hoof baldur's horse gave rise to a spring through his kick thus the horse's foot is the dispenser of fruitful moisture a legend of lower austria told by jans informs us that a gigantic man on a white horse is sometimes seen riding over the mountains this means a speedy rain in the german legend the goddess of birth frau halle appears on horseback pregnant women near confinement are prone to give oats to a white horse from their aprons and to pray him to give them a speedy delivery it was originally the custom for the horse to rub against the woman's genitals the horse like the ass had in general the significance of a priapic animal horses tracks are idols dispensing blessing and fertility horses tracks established a claim and were of significance in determining boundaries like the priaps of latin antiquity like the phallic dactyli a horse opened the mineral riches of the hart's mountains with his hoof the horseshoe an equivalent for horse's foot brings luck and as apotropaic meaning in the netherlands an entire horse's foot is hung up in the stable to ward against sorcery the analogous effect of the phallus is well known hence the phalli at the gates in particular the horse's leg turned lightning aside according to the principle similia similibus horses also symbolize the wind that is to say the tertium comparationis is again the libido symbol the german legend recognizes the wind as the wild huntsman in pursuit of the maiden stormy regions frequently derive their names from horses as the white horse mountain of the luneburger heath the centaurs are typical wind gods and have been represented as such by berkland's artistic intuition horses also signify fire and light the fiery horses of helios are an example the horses of hector are called xanthos yellow bright bordogos swift-footed lamp-posts shining and iphon burning 
a very pronounced fire symbolism was represented by the mystic quadriga mentioned by dio chrysostomus the supreme god always drives his chariot in a circle four horses are harnessed to the chariot the horse driven on the periphery moves very quickly he has a shining coat and bears upon it the signs of the planets and the zodiac this is a representation of the rotary fire of heaven the second horse moves more slowly and is illuminated only on one side the third moves still more slowly and the fourth rotates around himself but once the outer horse set the second horse on fire with his fiery breath and the third flooded the fourth with his streaming sweat then the horses dissolve and pass over into the substance of the strongest and most fiery which now becomes the charioteer the horses also represent the four elements the catastrophe signifies the conflagration of the world and the deluge whereupon the division of the god into many parts ceases and the divine unity is restored doubtless the quadriga may be understood astronomically as a symbol of time we already saw in the first part that the stoic representation of fate is a fire symbol it is therefore a logical continuation of the thought when time closely related to the conception of destiny exhibits this same libido symbolism brihadaranyaka upanishad one one says the morning glow verily is the head of the sacrificial horse the sun his eye the wind his breath the all-spreading fire his mouth the ear is the belly of the sacrificial horse the sky is his back the atmosphere the cavern of his body the earth the vault of his belly the poles are his sides in between the poles his ribs the seasons his limbs the months and fortnights his joints days and nights are his feet stars his bones clouds his flesh the food he digests is the deserts the rivers are his veins the mountains his liver and lungs the herbs and trees his hair the rising sun is his forepart the setting sun his afterpart the ocean is his kinsman the sea his cradle the horse undoubtedly here stands for a time symbol and also for the entire world we come across in the mithraic religion a strange god of time ion called chronos or deos leontocephalus because his stereotype representation is a lion-headed man who standing in a rigid attitude is encoiled by a snake whose head projects forward from behind over the lion's head the figure holds in each hand a key on the chest rests a thunderbolt upon his back are the four wings of the wind in addition to that the figure sometimes bears the zodiac on his body additional attributes are a cock and implements in the carolingian psalter of utrecht which is based upon ancient models the cyculum ion is represented as a naked man with a snake in his hand as is suggested by the name of the divinity he is a symbol of time most interestingly composed from libido symbols the lion the zodiac sign of the greatest summer heat is the symbol of the most mighty desire my soul roars with the voice of a hungry lion says mechthild of magdeburg in the mithra mystery the serpent is often antagonistic to the lion corresponding to that very universal myth of the battle of the sun with the dragon in the egyptian book of the dead tum is even designated as a he-cat because as such he fought the snake apophis the encoiling also means the engulfing the entering into the mother's womb thus time is defined by the rising and setting of the sun that is to say through the death and renewal of the libido the addition of the cock again suggests time and the addition of implements suggests the creation through time dure quatrice bergson oromazdes and araman were produced through zerwana karana the infinitely long duration time this empty and purely formal concept is expressed in the mysteries by transformations of the creative power the libido macrobius says in latin 
the present time is indicated by the head of the lion because his condition is strong and impetuous philo of alexandria has a better understanding in latin time is thought by the wickedest people to be a divinity who deprives willing people of the central being by good men it is considered to be the cause of the things of the world but to the wisest and best it does not seem time but god in ferducy time is often the symbol of fate the libido nature of which we have already learned to recognize the hindu text mentioned above includes still more its symbol of the horse contains the whole world his kinsman and his cradle is the sea the mother similar to the world soul the maternal significance of which we have seen above just as ion represents the libido in an embrace that is to say in the state of death and of rebirth so here the cradle of the horse is the sea that is the libido is in the mother dying and rising again like the symbol of the dying and resurrected christ who hangs like ripe fruit upon the tree of life we have already seen that the horse is connected through yggdrasil with the symbolism of the tree the horse is also a tree of death thus in the middle ages the funeral pyre was called st michael's horse and the neo persian word for coffin means wooden horse the horse has also the role of psychopompus he is the steed to conduct the souls to the other world horse women fetch the souls valkyries neo-greek songs represent charon on a horse these definitions obviously lead to the mother symbolism the trojan horse was the only means by which the city could be conquered because only he who has entered the mother and been reborn is an invincible hero the trojan horse is a magic charm like the nod fire which also serves to overcome necessity the formula evidently reads in order to overcome the difficulty thou must commit incest and once more be born from thy mother it appears that striking a nail into the sacred tree signifies something very similar the stock m eisen in vienna seems to have been such a palladium still another symbolic form is to be considered occasionally the devil rides upon a three-legged horse the goddess of death hell in time of pestilence also rides upon a three-legged horse the gigantic ass which is three-legged stands in the heavenly rain lake vurukasha his urine purifies the water of the lake and from his roar all useful animals become pregnant and all harmful animals miscarry the triad further points to the phallic significance the contrasting symbolism of hell is blended into one conception in the ass of Urukasha. the libido is fructifying as well as destroying these definitions as a whole plainly reveal the fundamental features the horse is a libido symbol partly of phallic partly of maternal significance like the tree it represents the libido in this application that is the libido repressed through the incest prohibition in the miller drama an indian approaches the hero ready to shoot an arrow at him chawantapal however with a proud gesture exposes his breast to the enemy this idea reminds the author of the scene between cassius and brutus in shakespeare's julius caesar a misunderstanding has arisen between the two friends when brutus reproaches cassius for withholding from him the money for the legions cassius irritable and angry breaks out into the complaint come antony and young octavius come revenge yourselves alone on cassius for cassius is a weary of the world hated by one he loves braved by his brother checked like a bondman all his faults observed set in a notebook learned and conned by rote to cast into my teeth oh i could weep my spirit from mine eyes there is my dagger and here my naked breast within a heart dearer than plutus mine richer than gold if that thou beest a roman take it forth 
i that denied thee gold will give my heart strike as thou didst at caesar for i know when thou didst hate him worst thou lovest him better than ever thou lovest cassius the material here would be incomplete without mentioning the fact that this speech of cassius shows many analogies to the agonized delirium of cyrano compare part one only cassius is far more theatrical and overdrawn something childish and hysterical is in his manner brutus does not think of killing him but administers a very chilling rebuke in the following dialogue brutus sheathe your dagger be angry when you will it shall have scope do what you will dishonour shall be humour o cassius you are yoked with a lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire who much in force shows a hasty spark and straight is cold again cassius half cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his brutus when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him brutus when i spoke that i was ill-tempered too cassius do you confess so much give me your hand brutus and my heart too cassius o oh, brutus brutus what's the matter cassius have not you love enough to bear with me when that rash humour which my mother gave me makes me forgetful brutus yes cassius and from thenceforth when you are over earnest with your brutus he'll think your mother chides and leave you so the analytic interpretation of cassius's irritability plainly reveals that at these moments he identifies himself with the mother and his conduct therefore is truly feminine as his speech demonstrates most excellently for his womanish love-seeking and desperate subjection under the proud masculine will of brutus calls forth the friendly remark of the latter that cassius is yoked with a lamb that is to say has something very weak in his character which is derived from the mother one recognizes in this without any difficulty the analytic hallmarks of an infantile disposition which as always is characterized by a prevalence of the parent imago here the mother imago an infantile individual is infantile because he has freed himself insufficiently or not at all from the childish environment that is from his adaptation to his parents therefore on one side he reacts falsely towards the world as a child towards his parents always demanding love and immediate reward for his feelings on the other side on account of the close connection to the parents he identifies himself with them the infantile individual behaves like the father and mother he is not in a condition to live for himself and to find the place to which he belongs therefore brutus very justly takes it for granted that the mother chides in cassius not he himself the psychologically valuable fact which we gather here is the information that cassius is infantile and identified with the mother the hysterical behaviour is due to the circumstance that cassius is still in part a lamb and an innocent and entirely harmless child he remains as far as his emotional life is concerned still far behind himself this we often see among people who as masters apparently govern life and fellow-creatures they have remained children in regard to the demands of their love nature the figures of the miller dramas being children of the creator's fantasy depict as is natural those traits of character which belong to the author the hero the wish figure is represented as most distinguished because the hero always combines in himself all wished-for ideals cyrano's attitude is certainly beautiful and impressive cassius's behaviour has a theatrical effect both heroes prepare to die effectively in which attempt cyrano succeeds this attitude betrays a wish for death in the unconscious of our author the meaning of which we have already discussed at length as the motive for her poem of the moth the wish of young girls to die is only an indirect expression which remains a pose even in case of real death for death itself can be a pose such an outcome merely adds beauty and value to the pose under certain conditions 
that the highest summit of life is expressed through the symbolism of death is a well-known fact for creation beyond oneself means personal death the coming generation is the end of the preceding one this symbolism is frequent in erotic speech the lascivious speech between lucius and the wanton servant maid in apuleius metamorphosis book two thirty two is one of the clearest examples in latin fight she said and fight bravely for i will not give away an inch nor turn my back face to face come on if you are a man strike home do your worst and die the battle this day is without quarter till weary in body and mind we lie powerless and gasping for breath in each other's arms this symbolism is extremely significant because it shows how easily a contrasting expression originates and how equally intelligible and characteristic such an expression is the proud gesture with which the hero offers himself to death may very easily be an indirect expression which challenges the pity or sympathy of the other and thus is doomed to the calm analytic reduction to which brutus proceeds the behaviour of chewantipal is also suspicious because the cassius scene which serves as its model betrays indiscreetly that the whole affair is merely infantile and one which owes its origin to an overactive mother imago when we compare this piece with the series of mother symbols brought to light in the previous chapter we must say that the cassius scene merely confirms once more what we have long supposed that is to say that the motor power of these symbolic visions arises from an infantile mother transference that is to say from an undetached bond to the mother in the drama of libido in contradistinction to the inactive nature of the previous symbols assumes a threatening activity a conflict becoming evident in which the one part threatens the other with murder the hero as the ideal image of the dreamer is inclined to die he does not fear death in accordance with the infantile character of this hero it would most surely be time for him to take his departure from the stage or in childish language to die death is to come to him in the form of an arrow wound considering the fact that heroes themselves are very often great archers or succumb to an arrow wound saint sebastian as an example it may not be superfluous to inquire into the meaning of death through an arrow we read in the biography of the stigmatized nun catherine emmerich the following description of the evidently neurotic sickness of her heart when only in her novitiate she received as a christmas present from the holy christ a very tormenting heart trouble for the whole period of her nun's life god showed her inwardly the purpose it was on account of the decline of the spirit of the order especially for the sins of her fellow sisters but what rendered this trouble most painful was the gift which she had possessed from youth namely to see before her eyes the inner nature of man as he really was she felt the heart trouble physically as if her heart was continually pierced by arrows these arrows and this represented the still worse mental suffering she recognized as the thoughts plots secret speeches misunderstandings scandal and uncharitableness in which her fellow-sisters wholly without reason and unscrupulously were engaged against her and her god-fearing way of life it is difficult to be a saint because even a patient and long-suffering nature will not readily bear such a violation and defends itself in its own way the companion of sanctity is temptation without which no true saint can live we know from analytic experience that these temptations can pass unconsciously so that only their equivalents would be produced in consciousness in the form of symptoms we know that it is proverbial that heart and smart hurts and schmerz rhyme 
it is a well-known fact that hysterics put a physical pain in place of a mental pain the biographer of emmerich has comprehended that very correctly only her interpretation of the pain is as usual projected it is always the others who secretly assert all sorts of evil things about her and this she pretended gave her the pains the case however bears a somewhat different aspect the very difficult renunciation of all life's joys this death before the bloom is generally painful and especially painful are the unfulfilled wishes and the attempts of the animal nature to break through the power of repression the gossip and jokes of the sisters very naturally centre around these most painful things so that it must appear to the saint as if her symptoms were caused by this naturally again she could not know that gossip tends to assume the role of the unconscious which like a clever adversary always aims at the actual gaps in our armour a passage from gautama buddha embodies this idea a wish earnestly desired produced by will and nourished when gradually it must be thwarted burrows like an arrow in the flesh the wounding and painful errors do not come from without through gossip which only attacks externally but they come from ambush from our own unconscious this rather than anything external creates the defenceless suffering it is our own repressed and unrecognized desires which fester like arrows in our flesh in another connection this was clear to the nun and that most literally it is a well-known fact and one which needs no further proof to those who understand that these mystic scenes of union with the saviour generally are intermingled with an enormous amount of sexual libido therefore it is not astonishing that the scene of the stigmata is nothing but an incubation through the saviour only slightly changed metaphorically as compared with the ancient conception of unio mystica as cohabitation with the god emmerich relates the following of her stigmatization i had a contemplation of the sufferings of christ and implored him to let me feel with him his sorrows and prayed five paternosters to the honour of the five sacred wounds lying on my bed with outstretched arms i entered into a great sweetness and into an endless thirst for the torments of jesus then i saw a light descending upon me it came obliquely from above it was a crucified body living and transparent with arms extended but without a cross the wounds shone brighter than the body they were five circles of glory coming forth from the whole glory i was enraptured and my heart was moved with great pain and yet with sweetness from longing to share in the torments of my saviour and my longings for the sorrows of the redeemer increased more and more on gazing on his wounds and passed from my breast through my hands sides and feet to his holy wounds then from the hands then from the sides then from the feet of the figure threefold shining red beams ending below in an arrow shot forth to my hands sides and feet the beams in accordance with the phallic fundamental thought are threefold terminating below in an arrow point like cupid the sun too has its quiver full of destroying or fertilizing arrows sun rays with possessed phallic meaning on this significance evidently rests the oriental custom of designating brave sons as arrows and javelins of the parents to make sharp arrows is an arabian expression for to generate brave sons the psalms declare one hundred and twenty seven four like as the arrows in the hands of the giant even so are the young children compare with this the remarks previously made about boys because of this significance of the arrow it is intelligible why the scythian king ariantes when he wished to prepare a census demanded an arrowhead from each man a similar meaning attaches equally to the lance men are descended from the lance because the ash is the mother of lances therefore the men of the iron age are derived from her the marriage custom to which ovid alludes comat virginius hostavicura comus fastorum book two five sixty has already been mentioned Caeneus 
issued a command that his lance be honoured pindar relates in the legend of this Caeneus, he descended into the depths splitting the earth with a straight foot he is said to have originally been a maiden named Caenus, who because of her complaisance was transformed into an invulnerable man by poseidon ovid pictures the battle of the epithi with the invulnerable Caeneus how at last they covered him completely with trees because they could not otherwise touch him ovid says at this place in latin the result is doubtful the body borne down by the weight of the forest is carried into empty tartarus ampicides denies this from out of the midst of the mass he sees a bird with tawny feathers issue into the liquid air Russia considers this bird to be the golden plover charogrius pluvialis which borrows its name from the fact that it lives in the zapathotha a crevice in the earth by his song he proclaims the approaching rain caeneus was changed into this bird end of section twenty one section twenty two of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty two chapter six part two we see again in this little myth the typical constituents of the libido myth original bisexuality immortality invulnerability through entrance into the mother splitting the mother with the foot and to become covered up and resurrection as a bird of the soul and a bringer of fertility ascending sun when this type of hero causes his lance to be worshipped it probably means that his lance is a valid and equivalent expression of himself from our present standpoint we understand in a new sense that passage in job which i mentioned in chapter four of the first part of this book he has sent me up for his mark his archers compass me round about he cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare he poureth out my gall upon the ground he breaketh me with breach upon breach he runneth upon me like a giant job sixteen twelve thirteen fourteen now we understand this symbolism as an expression for the soul torment caused by the onslaught of the unconscious desires the libido festers in his flesh a cruel god has taken possession of him and pierced him with his painful libidian projectiles with thoughts which overwhelmingly pass through him as a dementia precox patient once said to me during his recovery to-day a thought suddenly thrusts itself through me this same idea is found again in nietzsche in zarathustra the magician stretched out shivering like one half dead whose feet are warmed shaken alas by unknown fevers trembling from the icy pointed arrows of frost hunted by the o thought unutterable veiled horrible one thou huntsman behind the clouds struck to the ground by thee thou mocking eye that gazeth at me from the dark thus do i lie bending writhing tortured with all eternal tortures smitten by thee cruelest huntsman thou unfamiliar god smite deeper smite once more pierce through and rend my heart what meaneth this torturing with blunt-toothed arrows why gazeth thou again never weary of human pain with malicious god-lightning eyes thou wilt not kill but torture torture no long drawn-out explanation is necessary to enable us to recognize in this comparison the old universal idea of the martyred sacrifice of god which we have met previously in the mexican sacrifice of the cross and in the sacrifice of odin this same conception faces us in the oft-repeated martyrdom of saint sebastian where in the delicate glowing flesh of the young god all the pain of renunciation which has been felt by the artist has been portrayed an artist always embodies in his artistic work a portion of the mysteries of his time in a heightened degree the same is true of the principal christian symbol the crucified one pierced by the lance the conception of the man of the christian era 
tormented by his wishes crucified and dying in christ this is not torment which comes from without which befalls mankind but that he himself is the hunter murderer sacrificer and sacrificial knife is shown us in another of nietzsche's poems wherein the apparent dualism is transformed into the soul conflict through the use of the same symbolism o zarathustra most cruel nimrod whilom hunter of god the snare of all virtue and arrow of evil now hunted by thyself thine own prey pierced through thyself now alone with thee twofold in thine own knowledge mid a hundred mirrors false to thyself mid a hundred memories uncertain ailing with each wound shivering with each frost caught in thine own snares self-knower self-hangman why didst thou strangle thyself with the noose of thy wisdom why hast thou enticed thyself into the paradise of the old serpent why hast thou crept into thyself thyself the deadly arrows do not strike the hero from without but it is he himself who in disharmony with himself hunts fights and tortures himself within himself will has turned against will libido against libido therefore the poet says pierced through thyself that is to say wounded by his own arrow because we have discerned that the arrow is a libido symbol the idea of penetrating or piercing through consequently becomes clear to us it is a phallic act of union with one's self a sort of self-fertilization introversion also a self-violation a self-murder therefore zarathustra may call himself his own hangman like odin who sacrifices himself to odin the wounding by one's own arrow means first of all the state of introversion what this signifies we already know the libido sinks into its own depths a well-known comparison of nietzsche's and finds there below in the shadows of the unconscious the substitute for the upper world which it has abandoned the world of memories mid a hundred memories the strongest and most influential of which are the early infantile memory pictures it is the world of the child this paradise-like state of earliest childhood from which we are separated by a hard law in this subterranean kingdom slumber sweet feelings of home and the endless hopes of all that is to be as Heinrich in the sunken bell by gerhard hauptmann says in speaking of his miraculous work there is a song lost and forgotten a song of home a love song of childhood brought up from the depths of the fairy well known to all but yet unheard however as mephistopheles says the danger is great these depths are enticing they are the mother and death when the libido leaves the bright upper world whether from the decision of the individual or from decreasing life force then it sinks back into its own depths into the source from which it has gushed forth and turns back to that point of cleavage the umbilicus through which it once entered into this body this point of cleavage is called the mother because from her comes the source of the libido therefore when some great work is to be accomplished before which weak man recoils doubtful of his strength his libido returns to that source and this is the dangerous moment in which the decision takes place between annihilation and new life if the libido remains arrested in the wonder kingdom of the inner world then the man has become for the world above a phantom then he is practically dead or desperately ill but if the libido succeed in tearing itself loose and pushing up into the world above then a miracle appears this journey to the underworld has been a fountain of youth and new fertility springs from his apparent death this train of thought is very beautifully gathered into a hindu myth 
once upon a time vishnu sank into an ecstasy introversion and during this state of sleep bore brahma who enthroned upon the lotus flower arose from the navel of vishnu bringing with him the vedas which he diligently read birth of creative thought from introversion but through vishnu's ecstasy a devouring flood came upon the world devouring through introversion symbolizing the danger of entering into the mother of death a demon taking advantage of the danger stole the vedas from brahma and hid them in the depths devouring of the libido brahma roused vishnu and the latter transforming himself into a fish plunged into the flood fought with the demon battled with the dragon conquered him and recaptured the vedas treasure obtained with difficulty self-concentration and the strength derived therefrom correspond to this primitive train of thought it also explains numerous sacrificial and magic rites which we have already fully discussed thus the impregnable troy falls because the besiegers creep into the belly of a wooden horse for he alone is a hero who is reborn from the mother like the son but the danger of this venture is shown by the history of philoctetes who was the only one in the trojan expedition who knew the hidden sanctuary of chrysi where the argonauts had sacrificed already and where the greeks planned to sacrifice in order to assure a safe ending to their undertaking chrysi was a nymph upon the island of chrysi according to the account of the scolius in sophocles philoctetes this nymph loved philoctetes and cursed him because he spurned her love this characteristic projection which is also met with in the gilgamesh epic should be referred back as suggested to the repressed incest wish of the son who is represented through the projection as if the mother had the evil wish for the refusal of which the son was given over to death in reality however the son becomes mortal by separating himself from the mother his fear of death therefore corresponds to the repressed wish to turn back to the mother and causes him to believe that the mother threatens or pursues him the teleological significance of this fear of persecution is evident it is to keep son and mother apart the curse of christ is realized in so far the philoctetes according to one version when approaching his altar injured himself in his foot with one of his own deadly poisonous arrows or according to another version this is better and far more abundantly proven was bitten in his foot by a poisonous serpent from then on he is ailing this very typical wound which also destroyed ra is described in the following manner in an egyptian hymn the ancient of the gods moved his mouth he cast his saliva upon the earth and what he spat fell upon the ground with her hands isis kneaded that and the soil which was about it together from that she created a venerable worm and made him like a spear she did not twist him living around her face but threw him coiled upon the path upon which the great god wandered at ease through all his lands the venerable god stepped forth radiantly the gods who served pharaoh accompanied him and he proceeded as every day then the venerable worm stung him the divine god opened his mouth and the voice of his majesty echoed even to the sky and the gods exclaimed behold thereupon he could not answer his jaws chattered all his limbs trembled and the poison gripped his flesh as the nile seizes upon the land in this hymn egypt has again preserved for us a primitive conception of the serpent's sting the aging of the autumn sun as an image of human senility is symbolically traced back to the mother through the poisoning by the serpent the mother is reproached because her malice causes the death of the sun god the serpent the primitive symbol of fear illustrates the repressed tendency to turn back to the mother because the only possibility of security from death is possessed by the mother as the source of life accordingly only the mother can cure him sick unto death and therefore 
the hymn goes on to depict how the gods were assembled to take counsel and isis came with her wisdom her mouth is full of the breath of life her words banish sorrow and her speech animates those who no longer breathe she said what is that what is that divine father behold a worm has brought you sorrow tell me thy name divine father because the man remains alive who is called by his name whereupon ra replied i am he who created heaven and earth and piled up the hills and created all beings thereon i am he who made the water and caused the great flood who produced the bull of his mother who is the procreator etc the poison did not depart it went further the great god was not cured then said isis to ra thine is not the name thou hast told me tell me true that the poison may leave thee for he whose name is spoken will live finally ra decides to speak his true name he is approximately healed imperfect composition of osiris but he has lost his power and finally he retreats to the heavenly cow the poisonous worm is if one may speak in this way a negative phallus a deadly not an animating form of libido therefore a wish for death instead of a wish for life the true name is soul and magic power hence a symbol of libido what isis demands is the retransference of the libido to the mother goddess this request is fulfilled literally for the aged god turns back to the divine cow the symbol of the mother this symbolism is clear from our previous explanations the onward urging living libido which rules the consciousness of the son demands separation from the mother the longing of the child for the mother is a hindrance on the path to this taking the form of a psychologic resistance which is expressed empirically in the neurosis by all manners of fears that is to say the fear of life the more a person withdraws from adaptation to reality and falls into slothful inactivity the greater becomes his anxiety cum grano salus which everywhere besets him at each point as a hindrance upon his path the fear springs from the mother that is to say from the longing to go back to the mother which is opposed to the adaptation to reality this is the way in which the mother has become apparently the malicious pursuer naturally it is not the actual mother although the actual mother with the abnormal tenderness with which she sometimes pursues her child even into adult years may gravely injure it through a wilful prolonging of the infantile state in the child it is rather the mother imago which becomes the lamia the mother imago however possesses its power solely and exclusively from the son's tendency not only to look and to work forwards but also to glance backwards to the pampering sweetness of childhood to that glorious state of irresponsibility and security with which the protecting mother care once surrounded him the retrospective longing acts like a paralyzing poison upon the energy and enterprise so that it may well be compared to a poisonous serpent which lies across our path apparently it is a hostile demon which robs us of energy but in reality it is the individual unconscious the retrogressive tendency of which begins to overcome the conscious forward striving the cause of this can be for example the natural aging which weakens the energy or may be great external difficulties which cause man to break down and become a child again or it may be and this is probably the most frequent cause the woman who enslaves the man so that he can no longer free himself and becomes a child again it may be of significance also that isis as sister wife of the sun god creates the poisonous animal from the spittle of the god which is perhaps a substitute for sperma and therefore is a symbol of libido she creates the animal from the libido of the god that means she receives his power making him weak and dependent so that by this means she assumes the dominating role of the mother mother transference to the wife this part is preserved in the legend of samson in the role of delilah who cut off samson's hair the sun's rays thus robbing him 
of his strength any weakening of the adult man strengthens the wishes of the unconscious therefore the decrease of strength appears directly as the backward striving towards the mother there is still to be considered one more source of the reanimation of the mother imago we have already met it in the discussion of the mother scene in faust that is to say the willed introversion of a creative mind which retreating before its own problem and inwardly collecting its forces dips at least for a moment into the source of life in order there to wrest a little more strength from the mother for the completion of its work it is a mother-child play with one's self in which lies much weak self-admiration and self-adulation among a hundred mirrors nietzsche a narcissus state a strange spectacle perhaps for profane eyes the separation from the mother imago the birth out of one's self reconciles all conflicts through the sufferings this is probably meant by nietzsche's verse why hast thou enticed thyself into the paradise of the old serpent why hast thou crept into thyself thyself a sick man now sick of a serpent's poison a captive now whom the hardest destiny befell in thine own pit bowed down as thou workest encaved within thyself burring into thyself helpless stiff a corpse overwhelmed with a hundred burdens overburdened by thyself a wise man a self-knower the wise zarathustra thou suftest the heaviest burden and foundest thou thyself the symbolism of this speech is of the greatest richness he is buried in the depths of self as if in the earth really a dead man who has turned back to mother earth a Kyrenius, piled with a hundred burdens and pressed down to death the one who groaning bears the heavy burden of his own libido of that libido which draws him back to the mother who does not think of the tarophoria of mithra who took his bull according to the egyptian hymn the bull of his mother that is his love for his mother the heaviest burden upon his back and with that entered upon the painful course of the so-called transitus this path of passion led to the cave in which the bull was sacrificed christ too had to bear the cross the symbol of his love for the mother and he carried it to the place of sacrifice where the lamb was slain in the form of the god the infantile man a self-executioner and then to burial in the subterranean sepulchre that which in nietzsche appears as a poetical figure of speech is really a primitive myth it is as if the poet still possessed a dim idea or capacity to feel and reactivate those imperishable phantoms of long past worlds of thought in the words of our present-day speech and in the images which crowd themselves into his fantasy hauptmann also says poetic rendering is that which allows the echo of the primitive word to resound through the form the sacrifice with its mysterious and manifold meaning which is rather hinted at than expressed passes unrecognized in the unconscious of our author the arrow is not shot the hero chepoatapol is not yet fatally poisoned and ready for death through self-sacrifice we can now say according to the preceding material this sacrifice means renouncing the mother that is to say renunciation of all bonds and limitations which the soul has taken with it from the period of childhood into the adult life from various hints of miss miller's it appears that at the time of these fantasies she was still living in the circle of the family evidently at an age which was in urgent need of independence that is to say man does not live very long in the infantile environment or in the bosom of his family without real danger to his mental health life calls him forth to independence and he who gives no heed to this hard call because of childish indolence and fear is threatened by a neurosis and once the neurosis has broken out it becomes more and more a valid reason to escape the battle with life and to remain for all time in the morally poisoned infantile atmosphere the fantasy of the arrow wound belongs in this struggle for personal independence the thought of this resolution has not yet penetrated 
the dreamer on the contrary she rather repudiates it after all the preceding it is evident that the symbolism of the arrow wound through direct translation must be taken as a coitus symbol the okida moraturis attains by this means the sexual significance belonging to it chawantapal naturally represents the dreamer but nothing is attained and nothing is understood through one's reduction to the coarse sexual because it is a commonplace that the unconscious shelters coitus wishes the discovery of which signifies nothing further the coitus wish under this aspect is really a symbol for the individual demonstration of the libido separated from the parents of the conquest of an independent life this step towards a new life means at the same time the death of the past life therefore chawantapal is the infantile hero the son the child the lamb the fish who is still enchained by the fetters of childhood and who has to die as a symbol of the incestuous libido and with that sever the retrogressive bond for the entire libido is demanded for the battle of life and there could be no remaining behind the dreamer cannot yet come to this decision which will tear aside all the sentimental connections with father and mother and yet it must be made in order to follow the call of the individual destiny End of section twenty two section twenty three of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty three chapter seven part one the dual mother role after the disappearance of the assailant chawantapal begins the following monologue from the extreme ends of these continents from the farthest lowlands after having forsaken the palace of my father i have been wandering aimlessly during a hundred moons always pursued by my mad desire to find her who will understand with jewels i have tempted many fair ones with kisses i have tried to snatch the secret of their hearts with acts of bravery i have conquered their admiration he reviews the women he has known chita the princess of my race she is a little fool vain as a peacock having naught in her head but jewels and perfume tanan the young peasant ba a mere sow no more than a breast and a stomach caring only for pleasure and then ki ma the priestess a true parrot repeating hollow phrases learnt from the priests all for show without real education or sincerity suspicious poseur and hypocrite alas not one who understands me not one who resembles me not one who has a soul sister to mine there is not one among them all who has known my soul not one who could read my thought far from it not one capable of seeking with me the luminous summits or of spelling with me the superhuman word love here chawantapal himself says that his journeying and wandering is a quest for that other and for the meaning of life which lies in union with her in the first part of this work we merely hinted gently at this possibility the fact that the seeker is masculine and the sought for of feminine sex is not so astonishing because the chief object of the unconscious transference is the mother as has probably been seen from that which we have already learned the daughter takes a male attitude towards the mother the genesis of this adjustment can only be suspected in our case because objective proof is lacking therefore let us rather be satisfied with inferences she who will understand means the mother 
in the infantile language at the same time it also means the life companion as is well known the sex contrast concerns the libido but little the sex of the object plays a surprisingly slight role in the estimation of the unconscious the object itself taken as an objective reality is but of slight significance but it is of greatest importance whether the libido is transferred or introverted the original concrete meaning of erfassen to seize begreifen to touch etc allows us to recognize clearly the underside of the wish to find a congenial person but the upper intellectual half is also contained in it and is to be taken into account at the same time one might be inclined to assume this tendency if it were not that our culture abused the same for the misunderstood woman has become almost proverbial which can only be the result of a wholly distorted valuation on the one side our culture undervalues most extraordinarily the importance of sexuality on the other side sexuality breaks out as a direct result of the repression burdening it at every place where it does not belong and makes use of such an indirect manner of expression that one may expect to meet it suddenly almost anywhere thus the idea of the intimate comprehension of a human soul which is in reality something very beautiful and pure is soiled and disagreeably distorted through the entrance of the indirect sexual meaning the secondary meaning or better expressed the misuse which repressed and denied sexuality forces upon the highest soul functions makes it possible for example for certain of our opponents to scent in psychoanalysis purient erotic confessionals these are subjective wish fulfillment deliria which need no contra arguments this misuse makes the wish to be understood highly suspicious if the natural demands of life have not been fulfilled nature has first claim on man only long afterwards does the luxury of intellect come the mediaeval ideal of life for the sake of death needs gradually to be replaced by a natural conception of life in which the normal demands of men are thoroughly kept in mind so that the desires of the animal sphere may no longer be compelled to drag down into their service the high gifts of the intellectual sphere in order to find an outlet we are inclined therefore to consider the dreamer's wish for understanding first of all as a repressed striving towards the natural destiny this meaning coincides absolutely with psychoanalytic experience that there are countless neurotic people who apparently are prevented from experiencing life because they have an unconscious and often also a conscious repugnance to the sexual fate under which they imagine all kinds of ugly things there is only too great an inclination to yield to this pressure of the unconscious sexuality and to experience the dreaded unconsciously hoped for disagreeable sexual experience so as to acquire by that means a legitimately founded horror which retains them more surely in the infantile situation this is the reason why so many people fall into that very state towards which they have the greatest abhorrence that we were correct in our assumption that in miss miller it is a question of the battle for independence is shown by her statement that the hero's departure from his father's house reminds her of the fate of the young buddha who likewise renounced all luxury to which he was born 
in order to go out into the world to live out his destiny to its completion buddha gave the same heroic example as did christ who separated from his mother and even spoke bitter words matthew chapter ten five thirty four think not that i am come to send peace on earth i came not to send peace but a sword thirty five for i am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law thirty six and a man's foes shall be they of his own household thirty seven he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me or luke chapter twelve five fifty one suppose ye that i am come to give peace on earth i tell you nay but rather division fifty two for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided three against two and two against three fifty three the father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law horace snatched from his mother her head adornment the power just as adam struggled with lilith so he struggles for power nietzsche inhuman all too human expressed the same in very beautiful words one may suppose that a mind in which the type of free mind is to ripen and sweeten at maturity has had its decisive crisis in a great detachment so that before this time it was just so much the more a fettered spirit and appeared chained for ever to its corner and its pillar what binds it most firmly what cords are almost unterrible among human beings of a high and exquisite type it would be duties that reverence which is suitable for youth that modesty and tenderness for all the old honoured and valued things that thankfulness for the earth from which they grew or the hand which guided them for the shrine where they learnt to pray their loftiest moments themselves come to bind them the firmest to obligate them the most permanently the great detachment comes suddenly for people so bound better to die than to live here thus rings the imperative voice of seduction and this here this at home is all that it the soul has loved until now a sudden terror and suspicion against that which it has loved a lightning flash of scorn towards that which is called duty a rebellious arbitrary volcanic impelling desire for travelling for strange countries estrangements coolness frigidity disillusionments a hatred of love perhaps a sacrilegious touch and glance backwards there where just now it adored and loved perhaps a blush of shame over what it has just done and at the same time an exultation over having done it an intoxicating internal joyous thrill in which a victory reveals itself a victory over what over whom an enigmatic doubtful questioning victory but the first triumph of such woe and pain is formed the history of the great detachment it is like a disease which can destroy men this first eruption of strength and will towards self-assertion the danger lies as is brilliantly expressed by nietzsche in isolation in one's self solitude surrounds and embraces him ever more threatening ever more constricting ever more heart strangling the terrible goddess and mater saiwa cupidinum the libido taken away from the mother who is abandoned only reluctantly becomes threatening as a serpent the symbol of death for the relation to the mother must cease must die which itself almost causes man's death in mater saiwa cupidinum the idea attains rare almost conscious perfection i do not presume to try to paint in better words than has nietzsche 
the psychology of the wrench from childhood miss miller furnishes us with a further reference to a material which has influenced her creation in a more general manner this is the great indian epic of longfellow the song of hiawatha if my readers have had patience to read thus far and to reflect upon what they have read they frequently must have wondered at the number of times i introduce for comparison such apparently foreign material and how often i have widened the base upon which miss miller's creations rest doubts must often have arisen whether it is justifiable to enter into important discussions concerning the psychologic foundations of myths religions and culture in general on the basis of such scanty suggestions it might be said that behind the miller fantasies such a thing is scarcely to be found i need hardly emphasize the fact that i too have sometimes been in doubt i had never read hiawatha until in the course of my work i came to this part hiawatha a poetical compilation of indian myths gives me however a justification for all preceding reflections because this epic contains an unusual number of mythologic problems this fact is probably of great importance for the wealth of suggestions in the miller fantasies we are therefore compelled to obtain an insight into this epic nawadaha sings the songs of the epic of the hero hiawatha the friend of man there he sang of hiawatha sang the songs of hiawatha sang his wondrous birth and being how he prayed and how he fasted how he lived and toiled and suffered that the tribes of men might prosper that he might advance his people the teleological meaning of the hero as that symbolic figure which unites in itself libido in the form of admiration and adoration in order to lead to higher sublimations by way of the symbolic bridges of the myths is anticipated here thus we become quickly acquainted with hiawatha as a saviour and are prepared to hear all that which must be said of a saviour of his marvellous birth of his early great deeds and his sacrifice for his fellow-men the first song begins with a fragment of evangelism kitcha manita the master of life tired of the quarrels of his human children calls his people together and makes known to them the joyous message i will send a prophet to you a deliverer of the nations who shall guide you and shall teach you who shall toil and suffer with you if you listen to his counsels you will multiply and prosper if his warnings pass unheeded you will fade away and perish Gitcha manito the mighty the creator of the nations is represented as he stood erect on the great red pipestone quarry from his footprints flowed a river leaped into the light of morning or the precipice plunging downward gleamed like ishkuda the comet the water flowing from his footsteps sufficiently proves the phallic nature of this creator i refer to the earlier utterances concerning the phallic and fertilizing nature of the horse's foot and the horse's steps and especially do i recall hippocrene and the foot of pegasus we meet with the same idea in psalm sixty five twenty nine to eleven thou visitest the earth and waterest it thou makest it very plenteous the river of god is full of water thou preparest their corn for so thou providest for the earth thou waterest her furrows thou sendest rain into the little valleys thereof thou makest it soft with the drops of rain and blessest the increase of it thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness wherever the fertilizing god steps there is fruitfulness we already have spoken of the symbolic meaning of treading in discussing the nightmares 
aeneas passes into the depths splitting the earth with a foot outstretched amphiaraus another chthonic hero sinks into the earth which zeus has opened for him by a stroke of lightning compare with that the above-mentioned vision of a hysterical patient who saw a black horse after a flash of lightning identity of horse's footstep and flash of lightning by means of a flash of lightning heroes were made immortal faust attained the mothers when he stamped his foot stamp and descend stamping thou'lt rise again the heroes in the sun-devouring myths often stamp at or struggle in the jaws of the monster thus tor stamped through the ship's bottom in battle with the monster and went as far as the bottom of the sea Caeneus, concerning kicking as an infantile fantasy see above the regression of the libido to the pre-sexual stage makes this preparatory action of treading either a substitution for the coitus fantasy or for the fantasy of re-entrance into the mother's womb the comparison of water flowing from the footsteps with a comet is a light symbolism for the fructifying moisture sperma according to an observation by humboldt cosmos certain south american indian tribes call the meteors urine of the stars mention is also made of how gitche manito makes fire he blows upon a forest so that the trees rubbing upon each other burst into flame this demon is therefore an excellent libido symbol he also produced fire after this prologue in the second song the hero's previous history is related the great warrior mud jerkiwis hiawatha's father has cunningly overcome the great bear the terror of the nations and stolen from him the magic belt of wampum a girdle of shells here we meet the motive of the treasure attained with difficulty which the hero rescues from the monster who the bear is is shown by the poet's comparisons mudjukiwas strikes the bear on his head after he has robbed him of the treasure with the heavy blow bewildered rose the great bear of the mountains but his knees beneath him trembled and he whimpered like a woman mudji kiwis said derisively to him else you would not cry and whimper like a miserable woman but you bear sit here and whimper and disgrace your tribe by crying like a wretched shogadaya like a cowardly old woman these three comparisons with a woman are to be found near each other on the same page mudjikiwis has like a true hero once more torn life from the jaws of death from the all-devouring terrible mother this deed which as we have seen is also represented as a journey to hell night journey through the sea the conquering of the monster from within signifies at the same time entrance into the mother's womb a rebirth the results of which are perceptible also for mudjikiwis as in the zosimos vision here too the entering one becomes the breath of the wind or spirit mudjikiwis becomes the west wind the fertilizing breath the father of winds his sons become the other winds an intermezzo tells of them and of their love stories of which i will mention only the courtship of wabins the east wind because here the erotic wooing of the wind is pictured in an especially beautiful manner every morning he sees a beautiful girl in a meadow whom he eagerly courts every morning gazing earthward still the first thing he beheld there was her blue eyes looking at him two blue lakes among the rushes the comparison with water is not a matter of secondary importance because from wind and water shall man be born anew and he wooed her with caresses wooed her with his smile of sunshine with his flattering words he wooed her with his sighing and his singing 
gentlest whispers in the branches softest music sweetest odors etc in these onomatopoetic verses the wind's caressing courtship is excellently expressed the third song presents the previous history of hiawatha's mother his grandmother when a maiden lived in the moon there she once swung upon a liana but a jealous lover cut off the liana and nokomis hiawatha's grandmother fell to earth the people who saw her fall downwards thought that she was a shooting star this marvellous descent of nokomis is more plainly illustrated by a later passage of this same song there little hiawatha asks the grandmother what is the moon nokomis teaches him about it as follows the moon is the body of a grandmother whom a warlike grandson has cast up there in wrath hence the moon is the grandmother in ancient beliefs the moon is also the gathering place of departed souls the guardian of seeds therefore once more a place of the origin of life of predominantly feminine significance the remarkable thing is that nokomis falling upon the earth gave birth to a daughter winona subsequently the mother of hiawatha the throwing upwards of the mother and her following down and bringing forth seems to contain something typical in itself thus a story of the seventeenth century relates that a mad bull threw a pregnant woman as high as a house and tore open her womb and the child fell without harm upon the earth on account of his wonderful birth this child was considered a hero or doer of miracles but he died at an early age the belief is widespread among lower savages that the sun is feminine and the moon masculine among the namaqua a hottentot tribe the opinion is prevalent that the sun consists of transparent bacon the people who journey on boats draw it down by magic every evening cut off a suitable piece and then give it a kick so that it flies up again into the sky Vites anthropology two three forty two the infantile nourishment comes from the mother in the gnostic fantasies we come across a legend of the origin of man which possibly belongs here the female archons bound to the vault of heaven are unable on account of its quick rotation to keep their young within them but let them fall upon the earth from which men arise possibly there is here a connection with barbaric midwifery the letting fall of the parturion the assault upon the mother is already introduced with the adventure of Majikewis, and is continued in the violent handling of the grandmother nokomis who as a result of the cutting of the liana and the fall downwards seems in some way to have become pregnant the cutting of the branch the plucking we have already recognized as mother incest see above that well-known verse saxon land where beautiful maidens grow upon trees and phrases like picking cherries in a neighbor's garden allude to a similar idea the fall downwards of nokomis deserves to be compared to a poetical figure in heine a star a star is falling out of the glittering sky the star of love i watch it sink in the depths and die the leaves and buds are falling from many an apple tree i watch the mirthful breezes embrace them wantonly winona later was courted by the caressing west wind and becomes pregnant winona as a young moon goddess has the beauty of the moonlight nokomis warns her of the dangerous courtship of Majikewis, the west wind but winona allows herself to become infatuated and conceives from the breath of the wind from the Vena you are a son our hero and the west wind came at evening found the beautiful winona lying there amid the lilies wooed her with his words of sweetness wooed her with his soft caresses till she bore a son in sorrow bore a son of love and sorrow fertilization through the breath of the spirit is already a well-known 
precedent for us the star or comet plainly belongs to the birth scene as a libido symbol nokomis too comes to earth as a shooting star Murica's sweet poetic fantasy has devised a similar divine origin and she who bore me in her womb and gave me food and clothing she was a maid a wild brown maid who looked on men with loathing she fleered at them and laughed out loud and bade no suitor tarry i'd rather be the wind's own bride than have a man and marry then came the wind and held her fast his captive love enchanted and lo by him a merry child within her womb was planted buddha's marvellous birth story retold by sir edwin arnold also shows traces of this maya the queen dreamed a strange dream dreamed that a star from heaven splendid six rayed in colour rosy pearl whereof the token was an elephant six tusked and white as milk of kamadhuk shot through the void and shining into her entered her womb upon the right during maya's conception a wind blows over the land a wind blew with unknown freshness over lands and seas after the birth the four genii of the east west south and north come to render service as bearers of the palanquin the coming of the wise men at christ's birth we also find here a distinct reference to the four winds for the completion of the symbolism there is to be found in the buddha myth as well as in the birth legend of christ besides the impregnation by star and wind also the fertilization by an animal here an elephant which with its phallic trunk fulfilled in maya the christian method of fructification through the ear or the head it is well known that in addition to the dove the unicorn is also a procreative symbol of the logos here arises the question why the birth of a hero always had to take place under such strange symbolic circumstances it might also be imagined that a hero arose from ordinary surroundings and gradually grew out of his inferior environment perhaps with a thousand troubles and dangers and indeed this motive is by no means strange in the hero myth it might be said that superstition demands strange conditions of birth and generation but why does it demand them the answer to this question is that the birth of the hero as a rule is not that of an ordinary mortal but is a rebirth from the mother spouse hence it occurs under mysterious ceremonies therefore in the very beginning lies the motive of the two mothers of the hero as ronk has shown us through many examples the hero is often obliged to experience exposure and upbringing by foster parents and in this manner he acquires the two mothers a striking example is the relation of hercules to hera in the hiawatha epic winona dies after the birth and nokomis takes her place maya dies after the birth and buddha is given a stepmother the stepmother is sometimes an animal the she-wolf of romulus and remus etc the twofold mother may be replaced by the motive of twofold birth which has attained a lofty significance in the christian mythology namely through baptism which as we have seen represents rebirth thus man is born not merely in a commonplace manner but also born again in a mysterious manner by means of which he becomes a participator of the kingdom of god of immortality any one may become a hero in this way who is generated anew through his own mother because only through her does he share in immortality therefore it happened that the death of christ on the cross which creates universal salvation was understood as baptism that is to say as rebirth through the second mother the mysterious tree of death christ says but i have a baptism to be baptized with and how am i straitened till it be accomplished luke twelve fifty he interprets his death agony symbolically as birth agony the motive of the two mothers 
suggests the thought of self-rejuvenation and evidently expresses the fulfilment of the wish that it might be possible for the mother to bear me again at the same time applied to the heroes it means one is a hero who is born again by her who has previously been his mother that is to say a hero is he who may again produce himself through his mother the countless suggestions in the history of the procreation of the heroes indicate the latter formulations hiawatha's father first overpowered the mother under the symbol of the bear then himself becoming a god he procreates the hero what hiawatha has to do as hero nokomis hinted to him in the legend of the origin of the moon he is forcibly to throw his mother upwards or throw downwards then she would become pregnant by this act of violence and could bring forth a daughter this rejuvenated mother would be allotted according to the egyptian rite as a daughter wife to the sun god the father of his mother for self reproduction what action hiawatha takes in this regard we shall see presently we have already studied the behaviour of the pre-asiatic gods related to christ concerning the pre-existence of christ the gospel of st john is full of this thought thus the speech of john the baptist this is he of whom i said after me cometh a man which is preferred before me for he was before me john one thirty also the beginning of the gospel is full of deep mythologic significance in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god three all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made four in him was life and the life was the light of men five and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not six there was a man sent from god whose name was john seven the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light eight he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light nine that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world this is the proclamation of the reappearing light the reborn son which formerly was and which will be again in the baptistry at pisa christ is represented bringing the tree of life to man his head is surrounded by a sun halo over this relief stand the words in troitus solus because the one born was his own procreator the history of the, his procreation is strangely concealed under symbolic events which are meant to conceal and deny it hence the extraordinary assertion of the virgin conception this is meant to hide the incestuous impregnation but do not let us forget that this naive assertion plays an unusually important part in the ingenious symbolic bridge which is to guide the libido out from the incestuous bond to higher and more useful applications which indicate a new kind of immortality that is to say immortal work the environment of hiawatha's youth is of importance by the shores of gitchigumi by the shining big sea water stood the wigwam of nokomis daughter of the moon nokomis dark behind it rose the forest rose the black and gloomy pine trees rose the firs with cones upon them bright before it beat the water beat the clear and sunny water beat the shining big sea water in this environment nokomis brought him up here she taught him the first words and told him the first fairy tales and the sounds of the water and the wood were intermingled so that the child learned not only to understand man's speech but also that of nature at the door on summer evenings sat the little hiawatha heard the whispering of the pine trees heard the lapping of the water sounds of music words of wonder mini wawa said the pine trees mudwe aushka said the water hiawatha hears human speech in the sounds of nature thus he understands nature's speech the wind says wawa the cry of the wild goose is wawa wa wa tesi means the small glow-worm which enchants him thus the poet paints most beautifully the gradual gathering 
of external nature into the compass of the subjective and the intimate connection of the primary object to which the first lisping words were applied and from which the first sounds were derived with the secondary object the wider nature which usurps imperceptibly the mother's place and takes possession of those sounds heard first from the mother and also of those feelings which we all discover later in ourselves in all the warm love of mother nature the later blending whether pantheistic philosophic or aesthetic of the sentimental cultured man with nature is looked at retrospectively a reblending with the mother who was our primary object and with whom we truly were once wholly one therefore it is not astonishing when we again see emerging in the poetical speech of a modern philosopher carl joel the old pictures which symbolize the unity with the mother illustrated by the confluence of subject and object in his recent book seal und welt nineteen twelve joel writes as follows in the chapter called primal experience i lay on the seashore the shining waters glittering in my dreamy eyes at a great distance fluttered the soft breeze throbbing shimmering stirring lulling to sleep comes the wave beat to the shore or to the ear i know not distance and nearness become blurred into one without and within glide into each other nearer and nearer dearer and more homelike sounds the beating of the waves now like a thundering pulse in my head it strikes and now it beats over my soul devours it embraces it while it itself at the same time floats out like the blue waste of waters yes without and within are one glistening and foaming flowing and fanning and roaring the entire symphony of the stimuli experience sounds in one tone all thought becomes one thought which becomes one with feeling the world exhales in the soul and the soul dissolves in the world our small life is encircled by a great sleep the sleep of our cradle the sleep of our grave the sleep of our home from which we go forth in the morning to which we again return in the evening our life but the short journey the interval between the emergence from the original oneness and the sinking back into it blue shimmers the infinite sea wherein dreams the jellyfish of the primitive life toward which without ceasing our thoughts hark back dimly through eons of existence for every happening entails a change and a guarantee of the unity of life at that moment when they are no longer blended together in that instant man lifts his head blind and dripping from the depths of the stream of experience from the oneness with the experience at that moment of parting when the unity of life in startled surprise detaches the change and holds it away from itself as something alien at this moment of alienation the aspects of the experience have been substantialized into subject and object and in that moment consciousness is born joel paints here in unmistakable symbolism the confluence of subject and object as the reunion of mother and child the symbols agree with those of mythology even in their details the encircling and devouring motive is distinctly suggested the sea devouring the sun and giving birth to it anew is already an old acquaintance the moment of the rise of consciousness the separation of subject and object is a birth truly philosophical thought hangs with lame wings upon the few great primitive pictures of human speech above the simple all-surpassing greatness of which no thought can rise the idea of the jellyfish is not accidental once when i was explaining to a patient the maternal significance of water at this contact with the mother complex she experienced a very unpleasant feeling it makes me squirm she said as if i touched a jellyfish here too the same idea the blessed state of sleep before birth and after death is as joel observed something like old shadowy memories of that unsuspecting thoughtless state of early childhood where as yet no opposition disturbed the peaceful flow of dawning life to which the inner longing always draws us back again and again and from which the active life must free itself anew with struggle and death so that it may not be doomed to destruction 
long before joel an indian chieftain had said the same thing in similar words to one of the restless wise men ah my brother you will never learn to know the happiness of thinking nothing and doing nothing this is next to sleep this is the most delightful thing there is thus we were before birth thus we shall be after death we shall see in hiawatha's later fate how important his early impressions are in his choice of a wife hiawatha's first deed was to kill a roebuck with his arrow dead he lay there in the forest by the ford across the river this is typical of hiawatha's deeds whatever he kills for the most part lies next to or in the water sometimes half in the water and half on the land it seems that this must well be so the later adventures will teach us why this must be so the buck was no ordinary animal but a magic one that is to say one with an additional unconscious significance hiawatha made for himself gloves and moccasins from its hide the gloves imparted such strength to his arms that he could crumble rocks to dust and the moccasins had the virtue of the seven league boots by enwrapping himself in the buck's skin he really became a giant this motive together with the death of the animal at the fort in the water reveals the fact that the parents are concerned whose gigantic proportions as compared with the child are of great significance in the unconscious the toys of giants is a wish inversion of the infantile fantasy the dream of an eleven-year-old girl expresses it i am as high as a church steeple then a policeman comes i tell him if you say anything i will cut off your head the policeman as the analysis brought out referred to the father whose gigantic size was overcompensated by the church steeple in mexican human sacrifices the gods were represented by criminals who were slaughtered and flayed and the corybantes then clothed themselves in the bloody skins in order to illustrate the resurrection of the gods the snake's casting of his skin as a symbol of rejuvenation hiawatha has therefore conquered his parents primarily the mother although in the form of a male animal compared the bear of mudchikewis and from that comes his giant strength he has taken on the parent's skin and now has himself become a great man now he started forth to his first great battle to fight with the father mudjikewis in order to avenge his dead mother winona naturally under this figure of speech hides the thought that he slays the father in order to take possession of the mother compare the battle of gilgamesh with the giant chumbaba and the ensuing conquest of ishtar the father in the psychologic sense merely represents the personification of the incest prohibition that is to say resistance which defends the mother instead of the father it may be a fearful animal the great bear the snake the dragon etc which must be fought and overcome the hero is a hero because he sees in every difficulty of life resistance to the forbidden treasure and fights that resistance with the complete yearning which strives towards the treasure attainable with difficulty or unattainable the yearning which paralyzes and kills the ordinary man hiawatha's father is mudjikewis the west wind the battle therefore takes place in the west thence came life impregnation of winona thence also came death death of winona hiawatha therefore fights the typical battle of the hero for rebirth in the western sea the battle with the devouring terrible mother this time in the form of the father mudjikewis who himself had acquired a divine nature through his conquest of the bear now is overpowered by his son back retreated mudjikewis rushing westward o'er the mountains stumbling westward down the mountains three whole days retreated fighting still pursued by hiawatha to the doorways of the west wind to the portals of the sunset to the earth's remotest border where into the empty spaces sinks the sun as, as a flamingo drops into her nest at nightfall the three days are a stereotyped form representing the stay in the sea prison of night twenty first until twenty fourth of december christ too remained three days in the underworld the treasure difficult to attain is captured by the hero during this struggle in the west in this case the father must make a great concession to the son he gives him divine nature that very win nature the immortality of which alone protected mudjikewis from death he says to his son i will share my kingdom with you ruler shall you be henceforward of the northwest wind 
ki waden of the home wind the ki waden that hiawatha now becomes the ruler of the home wind has its close parallel in the gilgamesh epic where gilgamesh finally receives the magic herb from the wise old utnapishtim who dwells in the west which brings him safe once more over the sea to his home but this when he is home again is retaken from him by a serpent when one has slain the father one can obtain possession of his wife and when one has conquered the mother one can free oneself end of section twenty three section twenty four of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty four chapter seven part two on the return journey hiawatha stops at the clever arrow makers who possesses a lovely daughter and he named her from the river from the waterfall he named her many ha ha laughing water when hiawatha in his earliest childhood dreaming felt the sounds of water and wind press upon his ears he recognized in these sounds of nature the speech of his mother the murmuring pine trees on the shore of the great sea said many wawa and above the murmuring of the winds and the splashing of the water he found his earliest childhood dreams once again in a woman minnehaha the laughing water and the hero before all others finds in woman the mother in order to become a child again and finally to solve the riddle of immortality the fact that minnehaha's father is a skilful arrow-maker betrays him as the father of the hero and the woman he had with him as the mother the father of the hero is very often a skilful carpenter or other artisan according to an arabian legend tara abraham's father was a skilful master workman who could carve arrows from any wood that is to say in the arabian form of speech he was a procreator of splendid sons moreover he was a maker of images of gods tabashtar agni's father is the maker of the world a smith and carpenter the discoverer of fire boring joseph the father of jesus was also a carpenter likewise kinyaris adonis's father who is said to have invented the hammer the lever roofing and mining hephaestus the father of hermes is an artistic master workman and sculptor in fairy tales the father of the hero is very modestly the traditional wood cutter these conceptions were also alive in the cult of osiris there the divine image was carved out of a tree trunk and then placed within the hollow of the tree fraser golden bough part four in rigveda the world was also hewn out of a tree by the world sculptor the idea that the hero is his own procreator leads to the fact that he is invested with paternal attributes and reversedly the heroic attributes are given to the father in mani there exists a beautiful union of the motives he accomplishes his great labors as a religious founder hides himself for years in a cave he dies is skinned stuffed and hung up hero besides he is an artist and has a crippled foot a similar union of motives is found in veland the smith hiawatha kept silent about what he saw at the old arrow makers on his return to nokomis and he did nothing further to win minnehaha 
but now something happened which if it were not in an indian epic would rather be sought in the history of a neurosis hiawatha introverted his libido that is to say he fell into an extreme resistance against the real sexual demand freud he built a hut for himself in the wood in order to fast there and to experience dreams and visions for the first three days he wandered as once in his earliest youth through a forest and looked at all the animals and plants master of life he cried desponding must our lives depend on these things the question whether our lives must depend upon these things is very strange it sounds as if life were derived from these things that is to say from nature in general nature seems suddenly to have assumed a very strange significance this phenomenon can be explained only through the fact that a great amount of libido was stored up and now is given to nature as is well known men of even dull and prosy minds in the springtime of love suddenly become aware of nature and even make poems about it but we know that libido prevented from an actual way of transference always reverts to an earlier way of transference minnehaha the laughing water is so clearly an allusion to the mother that the secret yearning of the hero for the mother is powerfully touched therefore without having undertaken anything he goes home to nokomis but there again he is driven away because minnehaha already stands in his path he turns therefore even further away into that early youthful period the tones of which recall minnehaha most forcibly to his thoughts where he learnt to hear the mother sounds in the sounds of nature in this very strange revival of the impressions of nature we recognize a regression to those earliest and strongest nature impressions which stand next to the subsequently extinguished even stronger impressions which the child received from the mother the glamour of this feeling for her is transferred to other objects of the childish environment father's house playthings etc from which later those magic blissful feelings proceed which seem to be peculiar to the earliest childish memories when therefore hiawatha hides himself in the lap of nature it is really the mother's womb and it is to be expected that he will emerge again new-born in some form before turning to this new creation arising from introversion there is still a further significance of the preceding question to be considered whether life is dependent upon these things life may depend upon these things in the degree that they serve for nourishment we must infer in this case that suddenly the question of nutrition came very near the hero's heart this possibility will be thoroughly proven in what follows the question of nutrition indeed enters seriously into consideration first because regression to the mother necessarily revives that special path of transference namely that of nutrition through the mother as soon as the libido regresses to the pre-sexual stage there we may expect to see the function of nutrition and its symbols put in place of the sexual function thence is derived an essential root of the displacement from below upwards freud because in the pre-sexual stage the principal value belongs not to the genitals but to the mouth secondly because the hero fasted his hunger becomes predominant fasting as is well known is employed to silence sexuality also it expresses symbolically the resistance against sexuality 
translated into the language of the pre-sexual stage on the fourth day of his fast the hero ceased to address himself to nature he lay exhausted with half-closed eyes upon his couch sunk deep in dreams and the picture of extreme introversion we have already seen that in such circumstances an infantile internal equivalent for reality appears in the place of external life and reality this is also the case with hiawatha and he saw a youth approaching dressed in garments green and yellow coming through the purple twilight through the splendour of the sunset plumes of green bent o'er his forehead and his hair was soft and golden this remarkable apparition reveals himself in the following manner to hiawatha from the master of life descending i the friend of man mondamon come to warn you and instruct you how by struggle and by labour you shall gain what you have prayed for rise up from your bed of branches rise o youth and wrestle with me mondamon is the maize a god who is eaten arising from hiawatha's introversion his hunger taken in a double sense his longing for the nourishing mother gives birth from his soul to another hero the edible maize the son of the earth mother therefore he again arises at sunset symbolizing the entrance into the mother and in the western sunset glow he begins again the mystic struggle with the self-created god the god who has originated entirely from the longing for the nourishing mother the struggle is again the struggle for liberation from this destructive and yet productive longing mondamon is therefore equivalent to the mother and the struggle with him means the overpowering and impregnation of the mother this interpretation is entirely proven by a myth of the cherokees who invoke it the maize under the name of the old woman in allusion to a myth that it sprang from the blood of an old woman killed by her disobedient sons faint with famine hiawatha started from his bed of branches from the twilight of his wigwam forth into the flush of sunset came and wrestled with mondamon at his touch he felt new courage throbbing in his brain and bosom felt new life and hope and vigour run through every nerve and fibre the battle at sunset with the god of the maize gives hiawatha new strength and thus it must be because the fight for the individual depths against the paralyzing longing for the mother gives creative strength to men here indeed is the source of all creation but it demands heroic courage to fight against these forces and to wrest from them the treasure difficult to attain he who succeeds in this has in truth attained the best hiawatha wrestles with himself for his creation the struggle lasts again the charmed three days the fourth day just as mondamon prophesied hiawatha conquers him and mondamon sinks to the ground in death as mondamon previously desired hiawatha digs his grave in mother earth and soon afterwards from this grave the young and fresh maize grows for the nourishment of mankind concerning the thought of this fragment we have therein a beautiful parallel to the mystery of mithra where first the battle of the hero with his bull occurs afterwards mithra carries in transitus the bull into the cave where he kills him from this death all fertility grows all that is edible the cave corresponds to the grave the same idea is represented in the christian mysteries although generally in more beautiful human forms the soul struggle of christ in gethsemane where he struggles with himself in order to complete his work then the transitus the carrying of the cross where he takes upon himself the symbol of the destructive mother and therewith takes himself to the sacrificial grave from which after three days he triumphantly arises all these ideas express the same fundamental thoughts also 
the symbol of eating is not lacking in the christian mystery christ is a god who is eaten in the lord's supper his death transforms him into bread and wine which we partake of in grateful memory of his great deed the relation of agni to the soma drink and that of dionysus to wine must not be omitted here as evident parallel is samson's rending of the lion and the subsequent inhabitation of the dead lion by honey-bees which gives rise to the well-known german riddle in german food went from the glutton and sweet from the strong in the eleusinian mysteries these thoughts seem to have played a role besides demeter and persephone iacchus is chief god of the eleusinian cult he was the pure eternus the eternal boy of whom ovid says the following in latin thou boy eternal thou most beautiful one seen in the heavens without horns standing with thy virgin head etc in the great eleusinian festival procession the image of iacos was carried it is not easy to say which god is iacos possibly a boy or a new-born son similar to the etrurian tagus who bears the surname the freshly ploughed boy because according to the myth he arose from the furrow of the field behind the peasant who was ploughing this idea shows unmistakably the mondamin motive the plough is of well-known phallic meaning the furrow of the field is personified by the hindus as woman the psychology of this idea is that of a coitus referred back to the pre-sexual stage stage of nutrition the sun is the edible fruit of the field iacos passes in part as son of demeter or of persephone also appropriately as consort of demeter hero as procreator of himself he is also called in greek equals libido also mother libido he was identified with dionysus especially with the thracian dionysus agrius of whom a typical fate of rebirth was related hera had goaded the titans against Ligrius, who assuming many forms sought to escape them until they finally took him when he had taken on the form of a bull in this form he was killed mithra sacrificed and dismembered and the pieces were thrown into a cauldron but zeus killed the titans by lightning and swallowed the still throbbing heart of zagreus through this act he gave him existence once more and zagreus as iacos again came forth iacos carries the torch the phallic symbol of procreation as plato testifies in the festival procession the sheaf of corn the cradle of iacos was carried in latin mystica juanus iaci the orphic legend relates that iacos was brought up by persephone when after three years slumber in the in greek a winnowing fan used as cradle he awoke this statement distinctly suggests the madaman motive the twentieth of boedromion the month boedromion lasts from about the fifth of september to the fifth of october he is called iacos in honour of the hero on the evening of this day the great torchlight procession took place on the seashore in which the quest and lament of demeter was represented the role of demeter who seeking her daughter wanders over the whole earth without food or drink has been taken over by hiawatha in the indian epic he turns to all created things without obtaining an answer as demeter first learns of her daughter from the subterranean hecate so does hiawatha first find the one sought for mondamin in the deepest introversion descent to the mother hiawatha produces from himself mondamin as a mother produces the son the longing for the mother also includes the producing mother first devouring then birth-giving concerning the real contents of the mysteries we learn through the testimony of bishop asterius about three ninety a d the following 
is not there in e lucis the gloomiest descent and the most solemn communion of the hierophant and the priestess between him and her alone are the torches not extinguished and does not the vast multitude regard as their salvation that which takes place between the two in the darkness that points undoubtedly to a ritual marriage which was celebrated subterraneously in mother earth the priestess of demeter seems to be the representative of the earth goddess perhaps the furrow of the field the descent into the earth is also the symbol of the mother's womb and was a widespread conception under the form of cave worship plutarch relates of the magi that they sacrificed to ahriman in greek in a sunless place lucian lets the magician mithrobarzanes in greek descent into a sunless desert place descend into the bowels of the earth according to the testimony of moses of the koran the sister fire and the brother spring were worshipped in armenia in a cave julian gave an account from the Addis legend of a in greek descent into a cave from whence cybele brings up her son lover that is to say gives birth to him the cave of christ's birth in bethlehem house of bread is said to have been an adas spilium a further eleusinian symbolism is found in the festival of hierogamos in the form of the mystic chests which according to the testimony of clemens of alexandria may have contained pastry salt and fruits the synthema confession of the mystic transmitted by clemens is suggestive in still other directions i have fasted i have drunk of the barley drink i have taken from the chest and after i have laboured i have placed it back in the basket and from the basket into the chest the question as to what lay in the chest is explained in detail by dietrich the labour he considers a phallic activity which the mystic has to perform in fact representations of the mystic basket are given wherein lies a phallus surrounded by fruits upon the so-called lavatelli tomb vase the sculptures of which are understood to be eleusinian ceremonies it is shown how a mystic caressed the serpent entwining demeter the caressing of the fear animal indicates a religious conquering of incest according to the testimony of clements of alexandria a serpent was in the chest the serpent in this connection is naturally of phallic nature the phallus which is forbidden in relation to the mother rhoda mentions that in the arhatophores pastry in the form of phalli and serpents were thrown into the cave near the thesmophorium this custom was a petition for the bestowal of children and harvest the snake also plays a large part in initiations under the remarkable title in greek he who achieved divinity through the womb clemens observes that the symbol of the sabazios mysteries is in greek he who achieved divinity through the womb he is a serpent and he was drawn through the womb of those who were being initiated through arnobius we learn in latin the golden serpent is crowded into the breast of the initiates and is then drawn out through the lowest parts in the orphic hymn fifty two bacchus is invoked by o fetus he who is in the vagina or womb which indicates that the god enters into man as if through the female genitals according to the testimony of hippolytus the hierophant in the mystery exclaimed the revered one has brought forth a holy boy brimos from brimo this christmas gospel unto us a son is born is illustrated especially through the tradition that the athenians secretly show to the partakers in the epoptia the great and wonderful and most perfect epoptic mystery a mown stalk of wheat the parallel for the motive of death and resurrection is the motive of losing and finding the motive appears in religious rites in exactly the same connection namely in spring festivities 
similar to the hieroscamos where the image of the god was hidden and found again it is an uncanonical tradition that moses left his father's house when twelve years old to teach mankind in a similar manner christ is lost by his parents and they find him again as a teacher of wisdom just as in the mohammedan legend moses and joshua lose the fish and in his place chidher the teacher of wisdom appears like the boy jesus in the temple so does the corn god lost and believed to be dead suddenly arise again from his mother into renewed youth that christ was laid in the manger is suggestive of fodder robertson therefore places the manger as parallel to the lycnon we understand from these accounts why the eleusinian mysteries were for the mystics so rich in comfort for the hope of a better world a beautiful eleusinian epitaph shows this truly a beautiful secret is proclaimed by the blessed gods mortality is not a curse but death a blessing the hymn to demeter in the mysteries also says the same blessed is he the earth-born man who hath seen this who hath not shared in these divine ceremonies he hath an unequal fate in the obscure darkness of death immortality is inherent in the eleusinian symbol in a church song of the nineteenth century by samuel price work we discover it again the world is yours lord jesus the world on which we stand because it is thy world it cannot perish only the wheat before it comes up to the light in its fertility must die in the bosom of the earth first freed from its own nature thou goest o lord our chief to heaven through thy sorrows and guide him who believes in thee on the same path then take us all equally to share in thy sorrows and kingdoms guide us through thy gate of death bring thy world into the light firmicus relates concerning the Addis mysteries in latin on a certain night an image is placed lying down in a litter there is weeping and lamentations among the people with beatings of bodies and tears after a time when they have become exhausted from the lamentations a light appears then the priest anoints the throats of all those who were weeping and softly whispers take courage o initiates of the redeemed divinity you shall achieve salvation through your grief such parallels show how little human personality and how much divine that is to say universally human is found in the christ mystery no man is or indeed ever was a hero for the hero is a god and therefore impersonal and generally applicable to all christ is a spirit as is shown in the very early christian interpretation in different places of the earth and in the most varied forms and in the colouring of various periods the saviour hero appears as a fruit of the entrance of the libido into the personal maternal depths the bacchian consecrations represented upon the farnese relief contain a scene where a mystic wrapped in a mantle drawn over his head was led to silent who holds the tylenon chalice covered with the cloth the covering of the head signifies death the mystic dies figuratively like the seed corn grows again and comes to the corn harvest proclus relates that the mystics were buried up to their necks the christian church is a place of religious ceremony is really nothing but the grave of a hero catacombs the believer descends into the grave in order to rise from the dead with the hero that the meaning underlying the church is that of the mother's womb can scarcely be doubted the symbols of mass are so distinct that the mythology of the sacred act peeps out everywhere it is the magic charm of rebirth the veneration of the holy sepulchre is most plain in this respect a striking example is the holy sepulchre of st stefano in bologna the church itself a very old polygonal building consists of the remains of a temple to isis the interior contains an artificial spell lyrum a so-called holy sepulchre into which one creeps through a very little door after a long sojourn the believer reappears reborn from this mother's womb an etruscan osuarium in the archaeological museum in florence is at the same time a statue of matuta the goddess of death the clay figure of the goddess is hollowed within as a receptacle for the ashes 
the representation indicate that matuta is the mother her chair is adorned with sphinxes as a fitting symbol for the mother of death only a few of the further deeds of hiawatha can interest us here among these is the battle with mishnama the fish king in the eighth song this deserves to be mentioned as a typical battle of the sun hero mishnama is a fish monster who dwells at the bottom of the waters challenged by hiawatha to battle he devours the hero together with his boat in his wrath he darted upward flashing leaped into the sunshine opened his great jaws and swallowed both canoe and hiawatha down into that darksome cavern plunged the headlong hiawatha as a log on some black river shoots and plunges down the rapids found himself in utter darkness groped about in helpless wonder till he felt a great heart beating throbbing in that utter darkness and he smote it in his anger with his fist the heart of nama felt a mighty king of fishes shudder through each nerve and fibre crosswise then did hiawatha drag his birth canoe for safety lest from out the jaws of nama in the turmoil and confusion forth he might be hurled and perish it is the typical myth of the work of the hero distributed over the entire world he takes to a boat fights with the sea monsters devoured he defends himself against being bitten or crushed resistance or stamping motive having arrived in the interior of the whale dragon he seeks the vital organ cuts off or in some way destroys often the death of the monster occurs as a result of a fire which the hero secretly makes within him he mysteriously creates in the womb of death life the rising sun thus dies the fish which drifts ashore where with the assistance of birds the hero again attains the light of day the bird in this sense probably means the reascent of the sun the longing of the libido the rebirth of the phoenix the longing is very frequently represented by the symbol of hovering the sun symbol of the bird rising from the water is etymologically contained in the singing swan swan is derived from the root sven like sun and tone see the preceding this act signifies rebirth and the bringing forth of life from the mother and by this means the ultimate destruction of death which according to a negro myth has come into the world through the mistake of an old woman who at the time of the general casting of skins for men renewed their youth through casting their skin like snakes drew on through absent-mindedness her old skin instead of a new one and as a result died but the effect of such an act could not be of any duration again and again troubles of the hero are renewed always under the symbol of deliverance from the mother just as hera as the pursuing mother is the real source of the great deeds of hercules so does nokomis allow hiawatha no rest and raises up new difficulties in his path in form of desperate adventures in which the hero may perhaps conquer but also perhaps may perish the libido of mankind is always in advance of his consciousness unless his libido calls him forth to new dangers he sinks into slothful inactivity or on the other hand childish longing for the mother overcomes him at the summit of his existence and he allows himself to become pitifully weak instead of striving with desperate courage towards the highest the mother becomes the demon who summons the hero to adventure and who also places in his path the poisonous serpent which will strike him thus nokomis in the ninth song calls hiawatha points with her hand to the west where the sun sets in purple splendor and says to him yonder dwells the great pearl feather megasoguan the magician manito of wealth and wampum guarded by his fiery serpents guarded by the black pitch water you can see his fiery serpents the kenabik the great serpents coiling playing in the water this danger lurking in the west is known to mean death which no one even the mightiest escapes this magician as we learn also killed the father of nokomis now she sends her son forth to avenge the father horus through the symbols attributed to the magician it may easily be recognized what he symbolizes snake and water belong to the mother the snake as a symbol of the repressed longing for the mother or in other words as a symbol of resistance encircles protectingly and defensively the maternal rock inhabits the cave winds itself upwards around the mother tree and guards 
the precious hoard the mysterious treasure the black stygian water is like the black muddy spring of dal car nine the place where the sun dies and enters into rebirth the maternal sea of death and night on his journey thither hiawatha takes with him the magic oil of misha nama which helps his boat through the waters of death also a sort of charm for immortality like the dragon's blood for siegfried etc first hiawatha slays the great serpent of the night journey in the sea over the stygian waters it is written all night long he sailed upon it sailed upon that sluggish water covered with its mould of ages black with rotting water rushes rank with flags and leaves of lilies stagnant lifeless dreary dismal lighted by the shimmering moonlight and by will of the wisp illumined fires by ghosts of dead men kindled in their weary night encampments the description plainly shows the character of a water of death the contents of the water point to an already mentioned motive that of encoiling and devouring it is said in the key to dreams of yagadeva whoever in dreams surrounds his body with baste creepers or ropes with snake skins threads or tissues dies i refer to the preceding arguments in regard to this having come into the west land the hero challenges the magician to battle a terrible struggle begins hiawatha is powerless because megasagwan is invulnerable at evening hiawatha retires wounded despairing for a while in order to rest pause to rest beneath the pine tree from whose branches trailed the mosses and whose trunk was coated over with the dead man's moccasin leather with the fungus white and yellow this protecting tree is described as coated over with the moccasin leather of the dead the fungus this investing of the tree with anthropomorphic attributes is also an important rite wherever tree worship prevails as for example in india where each village has its sacred tree which is clothed and in general treated as a human being the trees are anointed with fragrant water sprinkled with powder adorned with garlands and draperies just as among men the piercing of the ears was performed as an apotrophic charm against death so does it occur with the holy tree of all the trees of india there is none more sacred to the hindus than the aswatha ficus religiosa it is known to them as variska raja king of trees brahma vishnu and mahasvar live in it and the worship of it is the worship of the triad almost every indian village has an aswatha etc this village linden tree well known to us is here clearly characterized as the mother symbol it contains the three gods hence when hiawatha retires to rest under the pine tree it is a dangerous step because he resigns himself to the mother whose garment is the garment of death the devouring mother as in the whale dragon the hero also in this situation needs a helpful bird that is to say the helpful animals which represent the benevolent parents suddenly from the boughs above him sang the mama the woodpecker aim your arrows hiawatha at the head of megasugwan strike the tuft of hair upon it at their roots the long black tresses there alone can he be wounded now amusing to relate mama hurried to his help it is a peculiar fact that the woodpecker was also the mama of romulus and remus who put nourishment into the mouths of the twins with his beak compare with that the role of the vulture in leonardo's dream the vulture is sacred to mars like the woodpecker with the maternal significance of the woodpecker the ancient italian folk superstition agrees that from the tree upon which this bird nested any nail which has been driven in will soon drop out again the woodpecker owes its special significance to the circumstance that he hammers holes into trees to drive nails in as above it is therefore understandable that he was made much of in the roman legend as an old king of the country a possessor or ruler of the holy tree the primitive image of the pater familius an old fable relates how circe the spouse of king picus transformed him into the picus martius the woodpecker the sorceress is the new creating mother who has magic influence upon the son husband she kills him transforms him into the soul bird the unfulfilled wish picus was also understood as the wood demon and incubus as well as the soothsayer all of which fully indicate the mother libido picus was often placed on a par with pecumnus by the ancients pecumnus is the inseparable companion 
of pi lemnus and both are actually called infantium dei the gods of little children especially it was said of pilumnus that he defended newborn children against the destroying attacks of the wood demon salvanus good and bad mother the motive of the two mothers the benevolent bird a wish thought of deliverance which arises from introversion advises the hero to shoot the magician under the hair which is the only vulnerable spot this spot is the phallic point if one may venture to say so it is at the top of the head at the place where the mystic birth from the head takes place which even to-day appears in children's sexual theories into that hiawatha shoots one may say very naturally three arrows the well-known phallic symbol and thus kills nagasakwan thereupon he steals the magic wampum armor which renders him invulnerable means of immortality he significantly leaves the dead lying in the water because the magician is the fearful mother on the shore he left the body half on land and half in water in the sand his feet were buried and his face was in the water thus the situation is the same as with the fish king because the monster is the personification of the water of death which in its turn represents the devouring mother this great deed of hiawatha's where he has vanquished the mother as the death-bringing demon is followed by his marriage with minnehaha a little fable which the poet has inserted in the later song is noteworthy an old man is transformed into a youth by crawling through a hollow oak tree in the fourteenth song is a description of how hiawatha discovers writing i limit myself to the description of two hieroglyphic tokens gitchi manito the mighty he the master of life was painted as an egg with points projecting to the four winds of the heavens everywhere is the great spirit was the meaning of this symbol the world lies in the egg which encompasses it at every point it is the cosmic woman with child the symbol of which plato as well as the vedas has made use of this mother is like the air which is everywhere but air is spirit the mother of the world is a spirit michi manito the mighty he the dreadful spirit of evil as a serpent was depicted as canabi the great serpent but the spirit of evil is fear is the forbidden desire the adversary who opposes not only each individual heroic deed but life in its struggle for eternal duration as well and who introduces into our body the poison of weakness and age through the treacherous bite of the serpent it is all that is retrogressive and as the model of our first world is our mother all retrogressive tendencies are towards the mother and therefore are disguised under the incest image in both these ideas the poet has represented in mythologic symbols the libido arising from the mother and the libido striving backward towards the mother there is a description in the fifteenth song how chibiabos hiawatha's best friend the amiable player and singer the embodiment of the joy of life was enticed by the evil spirits into ambush fell through the ice and was drowned hiawatha mourns for him so long that he succeeds with the aid of the magician in calling him back again but the revivified friend is only a spirit and he becomes master of the land of spirits osiris lord of the underworld the two dios fury battles again follow and then comes the loss of a second friend kawa sin the embodiment of physical strength in the twentieth song occur famine and the death of minnehaha foretold by two taciturn guests from the land of death and in the twenty-second song hiawatha prepares for a final journey to the west land i am going o nokomis on a long and distant journey to the portals of the sunset to the regions of the home wind of the northwest wind ki waden one long track and trail of splendor down whose stream as down a river westward westward hiawatha sailed into the fiery sunset sailed into the purple vapors sailed into the dusk of evening thus departed hiawatha hiawatha the beloved in the glory of the sunset in the purple mist of evening to the regions of the home wind of the northwest wind ki waden to the islands of the blessed to the kingdom of ponema to the land of the hereafter the sun victoriously arising tears itself away from the embrace and clasp from the enveloping womb of the sea and sinks again into the maternal sea into night the all-enveloping and the all-reproducing leaving behind in the heights of midday 
and all its glorious works this image was the first and was profoundly entitled to become the symbolic carrier of human destiny in the morning of life man painfully tears himself loose from the mother from the domestic hearth to rise through battle to his heights not seeing his worst enemy in front of him but bearing him within himself as a deadly longing for the depths within for drowning in his own source for becoming absorbed into the mother his life is a constant struggle with death a violent and transitory delivery from the always lurking night this death is no external enemy but a deep personal longing for quiet and for the profound peace of non-existence for a dreamless sleep in the ebb and flow of the sea of life even in his highest endeavour for harmony and equilibrium for philosophic depths and artistic enthusiasm he seeks death immobility satiety and rest if like pyrotheus he tarries too long in this place of rest and peace he is overcome by torpidity and the poison of the serpent paralyzes him for all time if he is to live he must fight and sacrifice his longing for the past in order to rise to his own heights and having reached the noonday heights he must also sacrifice the love for his own achievements for he may not loiter the sun also sacrifices its greatest strength in order to hasten onwards to the fruits of autumn which are the seeds of immortality fulfilled in children in works in posthumous fame in a new order of things all of which in their turn begin and complete the sun's course over again the song of hiawatha contains as these extracts show a material which is very well adapted to bring into play the abundance of ancient symbolic possibilities latent in the human mind and to stimulate it to the creation of mythologic figures but the products always contain the same old problems of humanity which rise again and again in new symbolic disguise from the shadowy world of the unconscious thus miss miller is reminded through the longing of chewantable of another mythic cycle which appeared in the form of wagner's siegfried especially is this shown in the passage in chewantable's monologue where he exclaims there is not one who understands me not one who resembles me not one who has a soul sister to mine miss miller observes that the sentiment of this passage has the greatest analogy with the feelings which siegfried experienced for brunhilde this analogy causes us to cast a glance at the song of siegfried especially at the relation of siegfried and brunhilde End of section twenty four section twenty five of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty five chapter seven part three this analogy causes us to cast a glance at the song of siegfried especially at the relation of siegfried and brunhilde it is a well-recognized fact that brunhilde the valkyrie gives protection to the birth incestuous of siegfried but while sieglinde is the human mother brunhilde has the role of spiritual mother mother imago however unlike hera towards hercules she is not a pursuer but benevolent this sin in which she is an accomplice by means of the help she renders is the reason for her banishment by wotan the strange birth of siegfried from the sister wife distinguishes him as horus as the reborn son a reincarnation of the retreating osiris wotan the birth of the young son of the hero results indeed from mankind who however are merely the human bearers of the cosmic symbolism thus the birth is protected by the spirit mother hera lilith she sends sieglinde with the child in her womb mary's flight on the night journey on the sea to the east onward hasten turn to the east o woman thou cherishest the sublimest hero of the world in thy sheltering womb the motive of dismemberment is found again in the broken sword of siegmund which was kept for siegfried 
from the dismemberment life is pieced together again the medea wonder just as a smith forges the pieces together so is the dismembered dead again put together this comparison is also found in Tomius of plato the parts of the world joined together with pegs in the rig veda ten seventy two the creator of the world brahmanaspati is a smith brahmanaspati as a blacksmith welded the world together the sword has the significance of the phallic sun power therefore a sword proceeds from the mouth of the apocalyptic christ that is to say the procreative fire the word or the procreative logos in rig veda brahmanaspati is also a prayer word which possessed an ancient creative significance and this prayer of the singers expanding from itself became a cow which was already there before the world dwelling together in the womb of this god foster children of the same keeper are the gods rig veda ten thirty one the logos became a cow that is to say the mother who is pregnant with the gods in christian uncanonical fantasies where the holy ghost has feminine significance we have the well-known motive of the two mothers the earthly mother mary and the spiritual mother the holy ghost the transformation of the logos into the mother is not remarkable in itself because the origin of the phenomenon fire speech seems to be the mother libido according to the discussion in the earlier chapter the spiritual is the mother libido the significance of the sword in the sanskrit conception tejas is probably partly determined by its sharpness as is shown above in its connection with the libido conception the motive of pursuit the pursuing sieglinde analogous to leto is not here bound up with the spiritual mother but with wotan therefore corresponding to the linos legend where the father of the wife is also the pursuer wotan is also the father of brunhilde brunhilde stands in a peculiar relation to wotan brunhilde says to wotan thou speakest to the will of wotan by telling me what thou wishest who am i were i not thy will wotan i take counsel only with myself when i speak with thee brunhilde is also somewhat the angel of the face that creative will or word emanating from god also the logos which became the child-bearing woman god created the world through his word that is to say his mother the woman who is to bring him forth again he lays his own egg this peculiar conception it seems to me can be explained by assuming that the libido overflowing into speech thought has preserved its sexual character to an extraordinary degree as a result of the inherent inertia in this way the word had to execute and fulfil all that was denied to the sexual wish namely the return into the mother in order to attain eternal duration the word fulfils this wish by itself becoming the daughter the wife the mother of the god who brings him forth anew wagner has this idea vaguely in his mind in wotan's lament over brunhilde none as she knew my inmost thought none knew the source of my will as she she herself was the creating womb of my wish and so now she has broken the blessed union brunhilde's sin is the favouring of siegmund but behind this lies incest this is projected into the brother-sister relation of siegmund and sieglinde in reality and archaically expressed wotan the father has entered into his self-created daughter 
in order to rejuvenate himself but this fact must of course be veiled wotan is rightly indignant with brunhilde for she has taken the isis roll and through the birth of the son has deprived the old man of his power the first attack of the death serpent in the form of the son siegmund wotan has repelled he has broken siegmund's sword but siegmund rises again in a grandson this inevitable fate is always helped by the woman hence the wrath of wotan at siegfried's birth sieglinda dies as is proper the foster mother is apparently not a woman but a chthonic god a crippled dwarf who belongs to that tribe which renounces love the egyptian god of the underworld the crippled shadow of osiris who celebrated a melancholy resurrection in the sexless semi-ape harpocrates is the tutor of horus who has to avenge the death of his father meanwhile brunhilde sleeps the enchanted sleep like a hieroscamos upon a mountain where wotan has put her to sleep with the magic thorn etta surrounded by the flames of wotan's fire equal to libido which wards off every one but mime becomes siegfried's enemy and wills his death through fafner here mime's dynamic nature is revealed he is a masculine representation of the terrible mother also a foster mother of demoniac nature who places the poisonous worm typhon in her son's horus's path siegfried's longing for the mother drives him away from mime and his travels begin with the mother of death and lead through vanquishing the terrible mother to the woman siegfried off with the imp i ne'er would see him more might i but know what my mother was like that will my thought never tell me her eyes tender light surely did shine like the soft eyes of the doe siegfried decides to separate from the demon which was the mother in the past and he gropes forward with the longing directed towards the mother nature acquires a hidden maternal significance for him doe in the tones of nature he discovers a suggestion of the maternal voice and the maternal language siegfried thou gracious birdling strange art thou to me dost thou in the wood here dwell ah would that i could take thy meaning thy song something would say perchance of my loving mother this psychology we have already encountered in hiawatha by means of his dialogue with the bird bird like wind and arrow represents the wish the winged longing siegfried entices fafner from the cave his desires turn back to the mother and the chthonic demon the cave-dwelling terror of the woods appears fafner is the protector of the treasure in his cave lies the hoard the source of life and power the mother possesses the libido of the son and jealously does she guard it translated into psychological language this means the positive transference succeeds only through the release of the libido from the mother imago the incestuous object in general only in this manner is it possible to gain one's libido the incomparable treasure and this requires a mighty struggle the whole battle of adaptation the siegfried legend has abundantly described the outcome of this battle with fafner according to the edda siegfried eats fafner's heart the seed of life he wins the magic cap through whose power all beric had changed himself into a serpent this refers to the motive of casting the skin rejuvenation by means of the magic cap one can vanish and assume different shapes the vanishing probably refers to dying and to the invisible presence that is existence in the mother's womb a luck bringing cap amniotic covering the new-born child occasionally wears over his head the call moreover siegfried drinks the dragon's blood 
which makes it possible for him to understand the language of birds and consequently he enters into a peculiar relation with nature a dominating position the result of his knowledge and finally wins the treasure hort is a mediaeval and old high german word with the meaning of collected and guarded treasure gothic husd old scandinavian hod germanic hasda from pre-germanic husd ho for cud fo the concealed klug as to this the greek nepho and nepho equals to hide to conceal also hut hut to guard english hide germanic root hud from indo-germanic kuth questionable to greek netho and nathos cavity feminine genitals prelwitz too traces gothic hudsd anglo-saxon hide english hide and hoard to greek netho whitley stokes traces english hide anglo-saxon hyden new high german hutta latin kudo equals helmet sanskrit kuhara cave to primitive celtic kudo equals concealment latin occultatio the assumption of klug is also supported in other directions namely from the point of view of the primitive idea there exists in athens a sacred place a Taminos of g with a surname olympia here the ground is torn open for about a yard in width and they say after the flood at the time of deucalion that the water receded here and every year they throw into the fissure wheat meal kneaded with honey we have observed previously that among the arataphorian pastry in the form of snakes and phalli was thrown into a crevice in the earth this was mentioned in connection with the ceremonies of fertilizing the earth we have touched slightly already upon the sacrifice in the earth crevice among the vatschandis the flood of death has passed characteristically into the crevice of the earth that is back into the mother again because from the mother the universal great death has come in the first place the flood is simply the counterpart of the vivifying and all-producing water in greek ocean who arose to be the producer of all one sacrifices the honey cake to the mother so that she may spare one from death thus every year in rome a gold sacrifice was thrown into the lacus courteous into the former fissure in the earth which could only be closed through the sacrificial death of courteous he was the typical hero who has journeyed into the underworld in order to conquer the danger threatening the roman state from the opening of the abyss Caneus, amphiaros in the amphiarion of oropos those healed through the temple incubation threw their gifts of gold into the sacred well of which pausanias says if any one is healed of a sickness through a saying of the oracle then it is customary to throw a silver or gold coin into the well because here amphiaros has ascended as a god it is probable that this oropic well is also the place of his katabasis descent into the lower world there were many entrances into hades in antiquity thus near eleusis there was an abyss through which idoneus passed up and down when he kidnapped cora dragon and maiden the libido overcome by resistance life replaced by death there were crevices in the rocks through which souls could ascend to the upper world behind the temple of chthonia in hermione lay a sacred district of pluto with a ravine through which hercules had brought up cerberus in addition there was an acherusian lake this ravine was therefore the entrance to the place where death was conquered the lake also belongs here as a further mother symbol for symbols appear massed together as they are surrogates and therefore do not afford the same satisfaction of desire as accorded by reality so that the unsatisfied 
remnant of the libido must seek still further symbolic outlets the ravine in the areopagus in athens was considered the seat of inhabitants of the lower world an old grecian custom suggests a similar idea girls were sent into a cavern where a poisonous snake dwelt as a test of virginity if they were bitten by the snake it was a token that they were no longer chaste we find this same motive again in the roman legend of st sylvester at the end of the fifth century in latin there was a huge dragon on mount tarpeus where the capitolium stands once a month with sacrilegious maidens the priest descended three hundred and sixty-five steps into the hell of this dragon carrying the expiatory offerings of food for the dragon then the dragon suddenly and unexpectedly arose and though he did not come out he poisoned the air with his breath thence came the mortality of man and the deeper sorrow for the death of the children when for the defence of truth st sylvester had had a conflict with a heathen it came to this that the heathen said sylvester go down to the dragon and in the name of thy god make him desist from the killing of mankind st peter appeared to sylvester in a dream and advised him to close his door to the underworld with chains according to the model in revelation chapter twenty one and i saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand two and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years three and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him the anonymous author of a writing de promissionibus of the beginning of the fifth century mentions a very similar legend in latin near the city of rome there was a certain cavern in which appeared a dragon of remarkable size mechanically produced brandishing a sword in his mouth his eyes glittering like gems fearful and terrible hither came virgins every year devoted to this service adorned with flowers who were given to him in sacrifice bringing these gifts they unknowingly descended the steps to a point where with diabolical cunning the dragon was suspended striking those who came a blow with the sword so that the innocent blood was shed now there was a certain monk who on account of his good deeds was well known to stilicho the patrician he killed this dragon as follows he examined each separate step carefully both with a rod and his own hand until discovering the false step he exposed the diabolical fraud then jumping over this step he went down and killed the dragon cutting him to pieces demonstrating that one who could be destroyed by human hand could not be a divinity the hero battling with the dragon has much in common with the dragon and also he takes over his qualities for example invulnerability as the footnotes show the similarity is carried still further sparkling eyes sword in his mouth translated psychologically the dragon is merely the son's repressed longing striving towards the mother therefore the son is the dragon as even christ is identified with the serpent which once upon a time similia similibus had controlled the snake plague in the wilderness john three fourteen as a serpent he is to be crucified that is to say as one striving backwards towards the mother he must die hanging or suspended on the mother tree christ and the dragon of the antichrist are in the closest contact in the history of their appearance and their cosmic meaning compare bouasse the antichrist the legend of the dragon concealed in the antichrist myth belongs to the life of the hero and therefore is immortal in none of the newer forms of myth are the pairs of opposites so perceptibly near as in that of christ and antichrist i refer to the remarkable psychologic description of this problem in marischkowski's romance leonardo da vinci that the dragon is only an artifice is a useful and delightfully rationalistic conceit which is most significant for that period in this way the dismal gods were effectually vulgarized 
the schizophrenic insane readily make use of this mechanism in order to depreciate efficient personalities one often hears the stereotyped lament it is all a play artificial made up etc a dream of a schizophrenic is most significant he is sitting in a dark room which has only a single small window through which he can see the sky the sun and moon appear but they are only made artificially from oil paper denial of the deleterious incest influence the descent of the three hundred and sixty-five steps refers to the sun's course to the cavern of death and rebirth that this cavern actually stands in a relation to the subterranean mother of death can be shown by a note in malalas the historian of antioch who relates that diocletian consecrated there a crypt to hecate to which one descends by three hundred and sixty-five steps cave mysteries seem to have been celebrated for hecate in samothrace as well the serpent also played a great part as a regular symbolic attribute in the service of hecate the mysteries of hecate flourished in rome towards the end of the fourth century so that the two foregoing legends might indeed relate to her cult hecate is a real spectral goddess of night and phantoms amar she is represented as riding and in hesiod occurs as the patron of writers she sends the horrible nocturnal fear phantom the impusa of whom aristophanes says that she appears enclosed in a bladder swollen with blood according to libanius the mother of ankynes is also called impusa for the reason that out of dark places she rushes on children and women impusa like hecate has peculiar feet one foot is made of brass the other of ass dung hecate has snake-like feet which as in the triple form ascribed to hecate points to her phallic libido nature in trals hecate appears next to priapus there is also a hecate aphrodisius her symbols are the key the whip the snake the dagger and the torch as mother of death dogs accompany her the significance of which we have previously discussed at length as guardian of the door of hades and as goddess of dogs she is a threefold form and really identified with cerberus thus hercules in bringing up cerberus brings the conquered mother of death into the upper world as spirit mother moon she sends madness lunacy this mythical observation states that the mother sends madness by far the majority of the cases of insanity consist in fact in the domination of the individual by the material of the incest fantasy in the mysteries of cerberus a rod called in greek white-leaved was broken off this rod protected the purity of virgins and caused any one who touched the plant to become insane we recognize in this the motive of the sacred tree which as mother must not be touched an act which only an insane person would commit hecate as nightmare appears in the form of impusa in a vampire role or as lamia as devourer of men perhaps also in that more beautiful guise the bride of corinth she is the mother of all charms and witches the patron of medea because the power of the terrible mother is magical and irresistible working upward from the unconscious in greek syncretism she plays a very significant role she is confused with artemis who also has the surname in greek far shooting hecate the one striking at a distance or striking according to her will in which we recognize again her superior power artemis is the huntress with hounds and so hecate through confusion with her becomes in greek the wild nocturnal huntress god as huntsman see above she has her name in common with apollo in greek far shooting the far darting from the standpoint of the libido theory this connection is easily understandable because apollo merely symbolizes the more positive side of the same amount of libido the confusion of hecate with brimo as subterranean mother 
is understandable also with persephone and rhea the primitive all-mother intelligible through the maternal significance is the confusion with elithia the midwife hecate is also the direct goddess of births in greek goddess of birth the multiplier of cattle and goddess of marriage hecate orphically occupies the centre of the world as aphrodite and gaia even as the world soul in general on a carved gem she is represented carrying the cross on her head the beam on which the criminal was scourged is called in greek hecate to her as to the roman trivia the triple roads or shied veg forked road or crossways were dedicated and where roads branch off or unite sacrifices of dogs were brought her there the bodies of the executed were thrown the sacrifice occurs at the point of crossing etymologically shida sheath for example sword sheath sheath for watershed and sheath for vagina is identical with shiden to split or to separate the meaning of a sacrifice at this place would therefore be as follows to offer something to the mother at the place of junction or at the fissure compare the sacrifice to the chthonic gods in the abyss the taminos of gay the abyss and the well are easily understood as the gates of life and death past which every one gladly creeps faust and sacrifices there his obolus or his in greek sacrificial cakes offered to the gods instead of his body just as hercules soothed cerberus with the honey cakes compare with this the mythical significance of the dog thus the crevice at delphi with the spring castalia was the seat of the chthonic dragon python who was conquered by the sun hero apollo python incited by hera pursued leta pregnant with apollo but she on the floating island of delos nocturnal journey on the sea gave birth to her child who later slew the python that is to say conquered in it the spirit mother in hierapolis edessa the temple was erected above the crevice through which the flood had poured out and in jerusalem the foundation stone of the temple covered the great abyss just as christian churches are frequently built over caves grottoes wells etc in the mithra grotto and all the other sacred caves up to the christian catacombs which owe their significance not to the legendary persecutions but to the worship of the dead we come across the same fundamental motive the burial of the dead in the holy place in the garden of the dead in cloisters crypts etc is restitution to the mother with a certain hope of resurrection by which such burial is rightfully rewarded the animal of death which dwells in the cave had to be soothed in early times through human sacrifices later with natural gifts therefore the attic custom gives to the dead the offering to pacify the dog of hell the three-headed monster at the gate of the underworld a more recent elaboration of the natural gifts seems to be the obolus for charon who is therefore designated by rhoda as the second cerberus corresponding to the egyptian dog-faced god anubis dog and serpent of the underworld dragon are likewise identical in the tragedies the erinyes are serpents as well as dogs the serpents tycon and echidna are parents of the serpents hydra the dragon of the hesperides and gorgo and of the dog cerberus orthrus scylla serpents and dogs are also protectors of the treasure the chthonic god was probably always a serpent dwelling in a cave and was fed with in greek ritual sacrificial food offered to the gods in the asclepiadian of the later period the sacred serpents were scarcely visible meaning that they probably existed only figuratively nothing was left but the hole in which the snake was said to dwell there the in greek ritual sacrificial food offered to the gods were placed 
later the obelisk was thrown in the sacred cavern in the temple of kos consisted of a rectangular pit upon which was laid a stone lid with a square hole this arrangement serves the purpose of a treasure house the snake hole had become a slit for money a sacrificial box and the cave had become a treasure that this development which herzog traces agrees excellently with the actual condition is shown by a discovery in the temple of Aesculapius and hygeia in ptolemaeus an encoiled granite snake with arched neck was found in the middle of the coil is seen a narrow slit polished by usage just large enough to allow a coin of four centimetres diameter at most to fall through at the side are holes for handles to lift the heavy pieces the under half of which is used as a cover herzog ibid page two twelve the serpent as protector of the hoard now lies on the treasure house the fear of the maternal womb of death has become the guardian of the treasure of life that the snake in this connection is really a symbol of death that is to say of the dead libido results from the fact that the souls of the dead like the chthonic gods appear as serpents as dwellers in the kingdom of the mother of death this development of symbol allows us to recognize easily the transitions of the originally very primitive significance of the crevice in the earth as mother to the meaning of treasure house and can therefore support the etymology of hort hoard treasure as suggested by kluge in greek means the innermost womb of the earth hades or as klug adds is of similar meaning cavity or womb prowitz does not mention this connection fick however compares new high german hort gothic husd to armenian kust abdomen church slavonian sista vedic kostha abdomen from the indo-germanic root kaustho equals viscera lower abdomen room storeroom prowitz compares certain greek words equal to urinary bladder bag purse sanskrit kusthras equal cavity of the loins then other greek terms for cavity or vault little chest uh, and then i am pregnant here from other greek words cave hole cup depression under the eye swelling wave billow power force lord old iranian cower cur equal hero sanskrit cura hyphen s equal strong hero the fundamental indo-germanic roots are kivod equal to swell to be strong from that the above-mentioned greek words and latin words interpreted as hollow vaulted cavity hole cavity enclosure cage scene and assembly cavity opening enclosure stall swell participle swelling pregnant pregnant sanskrit swelling strong powerful hero the treasure which the hero fetches from the dark cavern is swelling life it is himself the hero newborn from the anxiety of pregnancy and the birth throes thus the hindu firebringer is called mata rikvan meaning the one swelling in the mother the hero striving towards the mother is the dragon and when he separates from the mother he becomes the conqueror of the dragon this train of thought which we have already hinted at previously in christ and antichrist may be traced even into the details of christian fantasy there is a series of mediaeval pictures in which the communion cup contains a dragon a snake of, or some sort of small animal the cup is the receptacle the maternal womb of the god resurrected in the wine the cup is the cavern where the serpent dwells the god who sheds his skin in the state of metamorphosis for christ is also the serpent these symbolisms are used in an obscure connection in first corinthians verse ten paul writes of the jews who were all baptized into moses in the cloud and in the sea also reborn and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was christ they drank from the mother the generative rock 
birth from the rock the milk of rejuvenation the meat of immortality and this rock was christ here identified with the mother because he is the symbolic representative of the mother libido when we drink from the cup then we drink from the mother's breast immortality and everlasting salvation paul wrote of the jews that they ate and then rose up to dance and to indulge in fornication and then twenty-three thousand of them were swept off by the plague of serpents the remedy for the survivors however was the sight of a serpent hanging on a pole from it was derived the cure the cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of christ for we being many are one bread and one body for we are all partakers of one bread first corinthians ten sixteen seventeen bread and wine are the body and the blood of christ the food of the immortals who are brothers with christ and greek word for those who come from the same womb we who are reborn again from the mother are all heroes together with christ and enjoy immortal food as with the jews so too with the christians there is imminent danger of unworthy partaking for this mystery which is very closely related psychologically with the subterranean hieroscamos of eleusis involves a mysterious union of man in a spiritual sense which was constantly misunderstood by the profane and was retranslated into his language where mystery is equivalent to orgy and secrecy to vice a very interesting blasphemer and sectarian of the beginning of the nineteenth century named unternacherer has made the following comment on the last supper the communion of the devil is in this brothel all they sacrifice here they sacrifice to the devil and not to god there they have the devil's cup and the devil's dish there they have sucked the head of the snake there they have fed upon the iniquitous bread and drunken the wine of wickedness unter nahar is an adherent or a forerunner of the theory of living one's own nature he dreams of himself as a sort of priapic divinity he says of himself black-haired very charming and handsome in countenance and every one enjoys listening to thee on account of the amiable speeches which come from my mouth therefore the maids love thee he preaches the cult of nakedness ye fools and blind men behold god has created man in his image as male and female and has blessed them instead be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and make it subject to thee therefore he has given the greatest honour to these poor members and has placed them naked in the garden etc now are the fig leaves and the covering removed because thou hast turned to the lord for the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there the clearness of the lord is mirrored with uncovered countenance this is precious before god and this is the glory of the lord and the adornment of our god when you stand in the image and honour of your god as god created you naked and not ashamed who can ever praise sufficiently in the sons and daughters of the living god those parts of the body which are destined to procreate in the lap of the daughters of jerusalem is the gate of the lord and the just will go into the temple there to the altar and in the lap of the sons of the living god is the water pipe of the upper part which is a tube like a rod to measure the temple and altar and under the water tube the sacred stones are placed as a sign and testimony of the lord who has taken to himself the seed of abraham out of the seeds in the chamber of the mother god creates a man with his hands as an image of himself then the mother house and the mother chamber is opened in the daughters of the living god and god himself brings forth a child through them thus god creates children from the stones for the seed comes from the stones End of section 25section twenty six of psychology of the unconscious by carl jung this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty six chapter seven part four history teaches in manifold examples how the religious mysteries are liable to change suddenly into sexual orgies because they have originated from an overvaluation of the orgy 
it is characteristic that this priapic divinity returns again to the old symbol of the snake which in the mystery enters into the faithful fertilizing and spiritualizing them although it originally possessed a phallic significance in the mysteries of the ophites the festival was really celebrated with serpents in which the animals were even kissed compare the caressing of the snake of demeter in the eleusinian mysteries in the sexual orgies of the modern christian sects the phallic kiss plays a very important role unter nachrer was an uncultivated crazy peasant and it is unlikely that the orphitic religious ceremonies were known to him the phallic significance is expressed negatively or mysteriously through the serpent which always points to a secret related thought this related thought connects with the mother thus in a dream a patient found the following imagery a serpent shot out from a moist cave and bit the dreamer in the region of the genitals this dream took place at the instant when the patient was convinced of the truth of the analysis and began to free himself from the bond of his mother complex the meaning is i am convinced that i am inspired and poisoned by the mother the contrary manner of expression is characteristic of the dream at the moment when he felt the impulse to go forwards he perceived the attachment to the mother another patient had the following dream during a relapse in which the libido was again wholly introverted for a time she was entirely filled within by a great snake only one end of the tail peeped out from her arm she wanted to seize it but it escaped her a patient with a very strong introversion catatonic state complained to me that a snake was stuck in her throat this symbolism is also used by nietzsche in the vision of the shepherd and the snake and verily what i saw was like nothing i ever saw before i saw a young shepherd writhing choking twitching with a convulsed face from whose mouth hung a black heavy serpent did i ever see so much disgust and pallid fear upon a countenance might he have been sleeping and the snake crept into his mouth there it bit him fast my hand tore at the serpent and tore in vain i failed to tear the serpent out of his mouth then there cried out of me bite bite its head off bite i exclaimed all my horror my hate my disgust my compassion all the good and bad cried out from me in one voice ye intrepid ones around me solve for me the riddle which i saw make clear to me the vision of the lonesomest one for it was a vision and a prophecy what did then i behold in parable and who is it who is still to come who is the shepherd into whose mouth crept the snake who is the man into whose throat all the heaviness and the blackest would creep but the shepherd bit as my cry had told him he bit with a huge bite far away did he spit the head of the serpent and sprang up no longer shepherd no longer man a transfigured being an illuminated being who laughed never yet on earth did a man laugh as he laughed oh my brethren i heard a laugh which was no human laughter and now a thirst consumeth me a longing that is never allayed my longing for this laugh eats into me oh how can i suffer still to live and how now can i bear to die the snake represents the introverting libido through introversion one is fertilized inspired regenerated and reborn from the god in hindu philosophy this idea of creative intellectual activity has even cosmogenic significance the unknown original creator of all things is according to rigveda ten one twenty one prajapati the lord of creation in the various brahmas 
his cosmogenic activity was depicted in the following manner prajapati desired i will procreate myself i will be manifold he performed tapas after he had performed tapas he created these worlds the strange conception of tapas is to be translated according to dusen as he heated himself with his own heat with the sense of he brooded he hatched here the hatcher and the hatched are not two but one and the same identical being as hiranyagava prajapati is the egg produced from himself the world egg from which he hatches himself he creeps into himself he becomes his own uterus becomes pregnant with himself in order to give birth to the world of multiplicity thus prajapati through the way of introversion changed into something new the multiplicity of the world it is of especial interest to note how the most remote things come into contact dusen observes in the degree that the conception of tapas heat becomes in hot india the symbol of exertion and distress the tapo atabayata began to assume the meaning of self-castigation and became related to the idea that creation is an act of self-renunciation on the part of the creator self-incubation and self-castigation and introversion are very closely connected ideas the zosimos vision mentioned above betrays the same train of thought where it is said of the place of transformation that it is in greek the place of discipline we have already observed that the place of transformation is really the uterus absorption in one's self introversion is an entrance into one's own uterus and also at the same time asceticism in the philosophy of the brahmans the world arose from this activity among the post-christian gnostics it produced the revival and spiritual rebirth of the individual who was born into a new spiritual world the hindu philosophy is considerably more daring and logical and assumes that creation results from introversion in general as in the wonderful hymn of rigveda ten twenty nine it is said what was hidden in the shell was born through the power of fiery torments from this first arose love as the germ of knowledge the wise found the roots of existence in non-existence by investigating the heart's impulses this philosophical view interprets the world as an emanation of the libido and this must be widely accepted from the theoretic as well as the psychologic standpoint for the function of reality is an instinctive function having the character of biological adaptation when the insane schreber brought about the end of the world through his libido introversion he expressed an entirely rational psychologic view just as schopenhauer wished to abolish through negation holiness asceticism the error of the primal will through which the world was created does not goethe say you follow a false trail do not think that we are not serious is not the kernel of nature in the hearts of men the hero who is to accomplish the rejuvenation of the world and the conquest of death is the libido which brooding upon itself in introversion coiling as a snake around its own egg apparently threatens life with a poisonous bite in order to lead it to death and from that darkness conquering itself gives birth to itself again nietzsche knows this conception how long have you sat already upon your misfortune give heed lest you hatch an egg a basculus egg of your long travail the hero is himself a serpent himself a sacrificer and a sacrificed the hero himself is of serpent nature thereof christ compares himself with the serpent therefore the redeeming principle of the world of that gnostic sect which styled itself the ophite was the serpent the serpent is the agatho and cacko demon it is indeed intelligible when in the germanic saga they say that the heroes had serpents eyes i recall the parallel previously drawn between the eyes of the son of man and those of the tarpeian dragon 
in the already mentioned mediaeval pictures the dragon instead of the lord appeared in the cup the dragon who with changeful serpent glances guarded the divine mystery of renewed rebirth in the maternal womb in nietzsche the old apparently long extinct idea is again revived ailing with tenderness just as the thawing wind zarathustra sits waiting waiting on his hill sweetened and cooked in his own juice beneath his summits beneath his ice he sits weary and happy a creator on his seventh day silence it is my truth from hesitating eyes from velvety shadows her glance meets mine lovely mischievous the glance of a girl she divines the reason of my happiness she divines me ha what is she plotting a purple dragon lurks in the abyss of her maiden glance woe to thee zarathustra thou seemest like some one who has swallowed gold thy belly will be slit open in this poem nearly all the symbolism is collected which we have elaborated previously from other connections distinct traces of the primitive identity of serpent and hero are still extant in the myth of cecrops cecrops is himself half snake half man originally he probably was the athenian snake of the citadel itself as a buried god he is like erechtheus a chthonic snake god above his subterranean dwelling rises the parthenon the temple of the virgin goddess compare the analogous idea of the christian church the casting of the skin of the god which we have already mentioned in passing stands in the closest relation to the nature of the hero we have spoken already of the mexican god who casts his skin it is also told of mani the founder of the manichaean sect that he was killed skinned stuffed and hung up that is the death of christ merely in another mythological form marsyas who seems to be a substitute for attis the sun-lover of cybele was also skinned whenever a scythian king died slaves and horses were slaughtered skinned and stuffed and then set up again in phrygia the representatives of the father god were killed and skinned the same was done in athens with an ox who was skinned and stuffed and again hitched to the plough in this manner the revival of the fertility of the earth was celebrated this readily explains the fragment from the sabazios mysteries transmitted to us by firmicus in greek the bull father of the serpent and the serpent father of the bull the active fructifying upward striving form of the libido is changed into the negative force striving downwards towards death the hero as zodian of spring ram bull conquers the depths of winter and beyond the summer solstice is attacked by the unconscious longing for death and is bitten by the snake however he himself is the snake but he is at war with himself and therefore the descent and the end appear to him as the malicious inventions of the mother of death who in this way wishes to draw him to herself the mysteries however consolingly promise that there is no contradiction or disharmony when life is changed into death nietzsche too gives expression to this mystery here do i sit now that is i am swallowed down by this the smallest oasis it opened up just yawning its loveliest maw agape hail hail to that whale-fish when he for his guests welfare provided thus hail to his belly if he had also such a lovely oasis belly the desert grows woe to him who hides the desert stone grinds on stone the desert gulps and strangles the monstrous death gazes glowing brown and chews his life is his chewing forget not o man burnt out by lust thou art the stone the desert thou art death the serpent symbolism of the last supper is explained by the identification of the hero with the serpent the god is buried in the mother as fruit of the field as food coming from the mother and at the same time as drink of immortality he is received by the mystic or as a serpent he unites with the mystic all these symbols 
represent the liberation of the libido from the incestuous fixation through which new life is attained the liberation is accomplished under symbols which represent the activity of the incest wish it might be justifiable at this place to cast a glance upon psychoanalysis as a method of treatment in practical analysis it is important first of all to discover the libido lost from the control of consciousness it often happens to the libido as with the fish of moses in the mohammedan legend it sometimes takes its course in a marvellous manner into the sea freud says in his important article zur dynamik der Übertragung, the libido has retreated into regression and again revives the infantile images this means mythologically that the sun is devoured by the serpent of the night the treasure is concealed and guarded by the dragon substitution of a present mode of adaptation by an infantile mode which is represented by the corresponding neurotic symptoms freud continues thither the analytic treatment follows it and endeavours to seek out the libido again to render it accessible to consciousness and finally to make it serviceable to reality whenever the analytic investigation touches upon the libido withdrawn into its hiding-place a struggle must break out all the forces which have caused the regression of the libido will rise up as resistance against the work in order to preserve this new condition mythologically this means the hero seeks the lost sun the fire the virgin sacrifice or the treasure and fights the typical fight with the dragon with the libido in resistance as these parallels show psychoanalysis mobiles a part of the life processes the fundamental importance of which properly illustrates the significance of this process after siegfried had slain the dragon he meets the father wotan plagued by gloomy cares for the primitive mother erda has placed in his path the snake in order to enfeeble his son he says to erda wanderer all wise one cares piercing sting by thee was planted in wotan's dauntless heart with fear of shameful ruin and downfall filled was his spirit by tidings thou didst foretell art thou the world's wisest of women tell to me now how a god may conquer his care erda thou art not what thou hast said it is the same primitive motive which we meet in wagner the mother has robbed her son the sun-god of the joy of life through a poisonous thorn and deprives him of his power which is connected with the name isis demands the name of the god erda says thou art not what thou hast said but the wanderer has found the way to conquer the fatal charm of the mother the fear of death the eternal's downfall no more dismays me since their doom i willed i leave to thee loveliest volsung gladly my heritage now to the ever young in gladness yieldeth the god these wise words contain in fact the saving thought it is not the mother who has placed the poisonous worm in our path but our libido itself wills to complete the course of the sun to mount from morn to noon and passing beyond noon to hasten towards evening not at war with itself but willing the descent and the end nietzsche zarathustra teaches i praise thee my death the free death which comes to me because i want it and when shall i want it he who has a goal and an heir wants death at the proper time for his goal and his heir and this is the great noonday when man in the middle of his course stands between man and superman and celebrates his path towards evening as his highest hope because it is the path to a new morning he who is setting will bless his own going down because it is a transition and the sun of his knowledge will be at high noon siegfried conquers the father wotan and takes possession of brunhilde the first object that he sees is her horse then he believes that he beholds a mail-clad man he cuts to pieces the protecting coat of mail of the sleeper overpowering when he sees it is a woman terror seizes him 
my heart doth falter and faint on whom shall i call that he may help me mother mother remember me can this be fearing o mother mother thy dauntless child a woman lieth asleep and she now has taught him to fear awaken awaken holiest maid then life from the sweetness of lips will i win me e'en though i die in a kiss in the duet which follows the mother is invoked o mother hail who gave thee thy birth the confession of brunhilde is especially characteristic o oh, knewest thou joy of the world how i have ever loved thee thou wert my gladness my care wert thou thy life i sheltered or ere it was thine or ere thou wert born my shield was thy guard the pre-existence of the hero and the pre-existence of brunhilde as his wife mother are clearly indicated from this passage siegfried says in confirmation then death took not my mother bound in sleep did she lie the mother imago which is the symbol of the dying and resurrected libido is explained by brunhilde to the hero as his own will thyself am i if blessed i be in thy love the great mystery of the logos entering into the mother for rebirth is proclaimed with the following words by brunhilde o siegfried siegfried conquering light i loved thee ever for i divined the thought that wotan had hidden the thought that i dared not to whisper that all unclearly glowed in my bosom suffered and strove for which i flouted him who conceived it for which in penance prisoned i lay while thinking it not and feeling only for in my thought oh should you guess it was only my love for thee the erotic similes which now follow distinctly reveal the motive of rebirth siegfried a glorious flood before me rolls with all my senses i only see its buoyant gladdening billows though in the deep i find not my face burning i long for the water's balm and now as i am spring in the stream o oh, might its billows engulf me in bliss the motive of plunging into the maternal water of rebirth baptism is here fully developed an allusion to the terrible mother imago the mother of heroes who teaches them fear is to be found in brunhilde's words the horsewoman who guides the dead to the other side fearest thou siegfried fearest thou not the wild furious woman the orgiastic ochide moraturis resounds in brunhilde's words laughing let us be lost laughing go down to death and in the words light giving love laughing death is to be found the same significant contrast the further destinies of siegfried are those of the invictus the spear of the gloomy one-eyed hagen strikes siegfried's vulnerable spot the old son who has become the god of death the one-eyed wotan smites his offspring and once again ascends in eternal rejuvenation the course of the invincible sun has supplied the mystery of human life with beautiful and imperishable symbols it became a comforting fulfilment of all the yearning for immortality of all desire of mortals for eternal life man leaves the mother the source of libido and is driven by the eternal thirst to find her again and to drink renewal from her thus he completes his cycle and returns again into the mother's womb every obstacle which obstructs his life's path and threatens his ascent wears the shadowy features of the terrible mother who paralyzes his energy with the consuming poison of the stealthy retrospective longing in each conquest he wins again the smiling love and life-giving mother images which belong to the intuitive depths of human feeling the features of which have become mutilated and irrecognizable through the progressive development of the surface of the human mind the stern necessity of adaptation works ceaselessly to obliterate the last traces of these primitive landmarks of the period of the origin of the human mind and to replace them along lines which are to denote more and more clearly the nature of real objects 
End of section twenty six. Section twenty seven of Psychology of the Unconscious by Carl Jung. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section twenty seven, Chapter eight, Part one the sacrifice after this long digression let us return to miss miller's vision we can now answer the question as to the significance of siegfried's longing for brunhilde it is the striving of the libido away from the mother towards the mother this paradoxical sentence may be translated as follows as long as the libido is satisfied merely with fantasies it moves in itself in its own depths in the mother when the longing of our author rises in order to escape the magic circle of the incestuous and therefore pernicious object and it does not succeed in finding reality then the object is and remains irrevocably the mother only the overcoming of the obstacles of reality brings the deliverance from the mother who is the continuous and inexhaustible source of life for the creator but death for the cowardly timid and sluggish whoever is acquainted with psychoanalysis knows how often neurotics cry out against their parents to be sure such complaints and reproaches are often justified on account of the common human imperfections but still more often they are reproaches which should really be directed towards themselves reproach and hatred are always futile attempts to free oneself apparently from the parents but in reality from one's own hindering longing for the parents our author proclaims through the mouth of her infantile hero chawantapal a series of insults against her own family we can assume that she must renounce all these tendencies because they contain an unrecognized wish this hero of many words who performs few deeds and indulges in futile yearnings is the libido which has not fulfilled its destiny but which turns round and round in the kingdom of the mother and in spite of all its longings accomplishes nothing only he can break this magic circle who possesses the courage of the will to live and the heroism to carry it through could this yearning hero youth chawantapal but put an end to his existence he would probably rise again in the form of a brave man seeking real life this necessity imposes itself upon the dreamer as a wise counsel and hint of the unconscious in the following monologue of chawantapal he cries sadly in all the world there is not a single one i have sought among a hundred tribes i have watched a hundred moons since i began can it be that there is not a solitary being who will ever know my soul yes by the sovereign god yes but ten thousand moons will wax and wane before that pure soul is born and it is from another world that her parents will come to this one she will have pale skin and pale locks she will know sorrow before her mother bears her suffering will accompany her she will seek also and she will find no one who understands her temptation will often assail her soul but she will not yield in her dreams i will come to her and she will understand i have kept my body inviolate i have come ten thousand moons before her epoch and she will come ten thousand moons too late but she will understand there is only once in all the ten thousand moons that a soul like hers is born thereupon a green serpent darts from the bushes glides towards him and stings him on the arm 
then attacks the horse which succumbs first then chuantipul says to his horse adieu faithful brother enter into rest i have loved you and you have served me well adieu soon i will rejoin you then to the snake thanks little sister you have put an end to my wanderings then he cried with grief and spoke his prayer sovereign god take me soon i have tried to know thee and to keep thy law o do not suffer my body to fall into corruption and decay and to furnish the vultures with food a smoking crater is perceived at a distance the rumbling of an earthquake is heard followed by a trembling of the ground chuantipul cries in the delirium of suffering while the earth covers his body i have kept my body inviolate ah she understands yani wama yani wama thou who comprehendeth me chuantipul's prophecy is a repetition of longfellow's hiawatha where the poet could not escape sentimentality and at the close of the career of the hero hiawatha he brings in the saviour of the white people in the guise of the arriving illustrious representatives of the christian religion and morals one thinks of the work of redemption of the spaniards in mexico and peru with this prophecy of chuantipul the personality of the author is again placed in the closest relation to the hero and indeed as the real object of chuantipul's longing most certainly the hero would have married her had she lived at his time but unfortunately she comes too late the connection proves our previous assertion that the libido moves round in a circle the author loves herself that is to say she as the hero is sought by one who comes too late this motive of coming too late is characteristic of the infantile love the father and the mother cannot be overtaken the separation of the two personalities by ten thousand moons is a wish fulfilment with that the incest relation is annulled in an effectual manner this white heroine will seek without being understood she is not understood because she cannot understand herself rightly and she will not find but in dreams at least they will find each other and she will understand the next sentence of the text reads i have kept my body inviolate this proud sentence which naturally only a woman can express because man is not accustomed to boast in that direction again confirms the fact that all enterprises have remained but dreams that the body has remained inviolate when the hero visits the heroine in a dream it is clear what is meant this assertion of the hero's that he has remained inviolate refers back to the unsuccessful attempt upon his life in the previous chapter huntsman with the arrow and clearly explains to us what was really meant by this assault that is to say the refusal of the coitus fantasy here the wish of the unconscious obtrudes itself again after the hero had repressed it the first time and thereupon he painfully and hysterically utters his monologue temptation will often assail her soul but it will not yield this very bold assertion reduces noblesse oblige the unconscious to an enormous infantile megalomania which is always the case when the libido is compelled through similar circumstances to regressions only once in all the ten thousand moons is a soul born like mine here the unconscious ego expands to an enormous degree evidently in order to cover with its boastfulness a large part of the neglected duty of life but punishment follows at its heels whoever prides himself too much on having sustained no wound in the battle of life lays himself open 
to the suspicion that in his fighting has been with words only whilst actually he has remained far away from the firing line this spirit is just the reverse of the pride of those savage women who point with satisfaction to the countless scars which were given them by their men in the sexual fight for supremacy in accordance with this and in logical continuation of the same all that follows is expressed in figurative speech the orgiastic okide moriturus in its admixture with the reckless laughter of the dionysian frenzy confronts us here in sorry disguise with a sentimental stage trickery worthy of our posthumous edition of christian morals in place of the positive phallus the negative appears and leads the hero's horse his libido animalis not to satisfaction but into eternal peace also the fate of the hero this end means that the mother represented as the jaws of death devours the libido of the daughter therefore instead of life and procreative growth only fantastic self-oblivion results this weak and inglorious end has no elevating or illuminating meaning so long as we consider it merely as the solution of an individual erotic conflict the fact that the symbols under which the solution takes place have actually a significant aspect reveals to us that behind the individual mask behind the veil of individuation a primitive idea stands the severe and serious features of which take from us the courage to consider the sexual meaning of the miller symbolism as all-sufficient it is not to be forgotten that the sexual fantasies of the neurotic and the exquisite sexual language of dreams are regressive phenomena the sexuality of the unconscious is not what it seems to be it is merely a symbol it is a thought bright as day clear as sunlight a decision a step forward to every goal of life but expressed in the unreal sexual language of the unconscious and in the thought form of an earlier stage a resurrection so to speak of earlier modes of adaptation when therefore the unconscious pushes into the foreground the coitus wish negatively expressed it means somewhat as follows under similar circumstances primitive man acted in such and such a manner the mode of adaptation which to-day is unconscious for us is carried on by the savage negro of the present day whose undertakings beyond those of nutrition appertain to sexuality characterized by violence and cruelty therefore in view of the archaic mode of expression of the miller fantasy we are justified in assuming the correctness of our interpretation for the lowest and nearest plane only a deeper stratum of meaning underlies the earlier assertion that the figure of jawantipal has the character of cassius who has a lamb as a companion therefore jawantipal is the portion of the dreamer's libido bound up with the mother and therefore masculine hence he is her infantile personality the childishness of character which as yet is unable to understand that one must leave father and mother when the time has come in order to serve the destiny of the entire personality this is outlined in nietzsche's words free dost thou call thyself thy dominant thought would i hear and not that thou hast thrown off a yoke art thou one who had the right to throw off a yoke there are many who throw away their last value when they throw away their servitude therefore when chuantipal dies it means that herein is a fulfilment of a wish that this infantile hero who cannot leave the mother's care may die and if with that 
the bond between mother and daughter is severed a great step forward is gained both for inner and outer freedom but man wishes to remain a child too long he would fain stop the turning of the wheel which rolling bears along with it the years man wishes to keep his childhood and eternal youth rather than to die and suffer corruption in the grave oh do not suffer my body to fall into decay and corruption nothing brings the relentless flight of time and the cruel perishability of all blossoms more painfully to our consciousness than an inactive and empty life idle dreaming is the mother of the fear of death the sentimental deploring of what has been and the vain turning back of the clock although man can forget in the long perhaps too long guarded feelings of youth in the dreamy state of stubbornly held remembrances that the wheel rolls onward nevertheless mercilessly does the grey hair the relaxation of the skin and the wrinkles in the face tell us that whether or not we expose the body to the destroying powers of the whole struggle of life the poison of the stealthy creeping serpent of time consumes our bodies which alas we so dearly love nor does it help if we cry out with the melancholy hero chewantipal i have kept my body inviolate flight from life does not free us from the law of age and death the neurotic who seeks to get rid of the necessities of life wins nothing and lays upon himself the frightful burden of a premature age and death which must appear especially cruel on account of the total emptiness and meaninglessness of his life if the libido is not permitted to follow the progressive life which is willing to accept all dangers and all losses then it follows the other road sinking into its own depths working down into the old foreboding regarding the immortality of all life to the longing for rebirth hurlderlin exemplifies this path in his poetry and his life i leave the poet to speak in his song to the rose in the mother womb eternal sweetest queen of every leaf still the living and supernal nature carries thee and me little rose the storm's fierce power strips our leaves and alters us yet the deathless germ will tower to new blooms miraculous the following comments may be made upon the parable of this poem the rose is the symbol of the beloved woman hyden Ruslan, heather rose of gerda the rose blooms in the rose garden of the maiden therefore it is also a direct symbol of the libido when the poet dreams that he is with the rose in the mother womb of nature then psychologically the fact is that his libido is with the mother here is an eternal germination and renewal we have come across this motive already in the hieros gamos hymn iliad fourteen the nuptials in the blessed west that is to say the union in and with the mother plutarch shows us this motive in naive form in his tradition of the osiris myth osiris and isis copulating in the mother's womb this is also perceived by herderlin as the enviable prerogative of the gods to enjoy everlasting infancy thus in hyperion he says fateless like the sleeping nursling breathe the heavenly ones chastely guarded in modest buds their spirits blossom eternally and their quiet eyes gaze out in placid eternal serenity this quotation shows the meaning of heavenly bliss Herlderlin never was able to forget this first and greatest happiness the dreamy picture of which estranged him from real life moreover in this poem the ancient 
motive of the twins in the mother's womb is intimated isis and osiris in the mother's womb the motive is archaic there is a legend in frobenius of how the great serpent appearing from the little serpent in the hollow tree through the so-called stretching out of the serpent has finally devoured all men devouring mother death and only a pregnant woman remains alive she digs a ditch covers it with a stone grave mother's womb and living there she gives birth to twins the subsequent dragon killers the hero in double form man and thallus man and woman man with his libido the dying and rising sun this existence together in the mother is to be found also very beautifully expressed in an african myth frobenius in the beginning abbatala the heaven and adudua the earth his wife lay pressed firmly together in a calabaz the guarding in a modest bud is an idea which has appeared already in plutarch where it is said that the sun was born in the morning from a flower bud brahma too comes from the bud which also gave birth in assam to the first human pair humanity an unfinished poem scarcely sprouted from the waters o earth are thy old mountain tops and diffuse odours while the first green islands full of young woods breathe delight through the may air over the ocean and joyfully the eye of the sun-god looked down upon the firstlings of the trees and flowers laughing children of his youth born from thee went on the fairest of the islands once lay thy most beautiful child under the grapes lay after a mild night in the dawn in the daybreak a child born to thee o earth and the boy looks up familiarly to his father helios and tasting the sweet grapes he picked the sacred vine for his nurse and soon he is grown the beasts fear him for he is different from them this man he is not like thee the father for the lofty soul of the father is in him boldly united with thy pleasures and thy sadness o earth he may resemble the eternal nature the mother of gods the terrible mother ah therefore o earth his presumption drives him away from thy breast and thy gifts are vain the tender ones ever and ever too high does the proud heart beat out from the sweet meadow of his shores man must go into the flowerless waters and though his groves shine with golden fruit like the starry night yet he digs he digs caves in the mountains and seeks in the mines far from the sacred rays of his father faithless also to the sun-god who does not love weaklings and mocks at cares ah freer do the birds of the wood breathe although the breast of man heaves wilder and more proudly his pride becomes fear and the tender flowers of his peace do not bloom for long this poem betrays to us the beginning of the discord between the poet and nature he begins to be estranged from reality the natural actual existence it is a remarkable idea how the little child chooses the vine for his nurse this dionysian allusion is very old in the significant blessing of jacob it is said of judah genesis chapter forty nine verse eleven binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine a gnostic gem has been preserved upon which there is a representation of an ass suckling her foal above which is the symbol of cancer and the circumscription d n i h y x p s dominus noster jesu christus with the supplement dei filius as justinus 
martyr indignantly observes the connection of the christian legend with that of dionysus are unmistakable compare for example the miracle of the wine in the last-named legend the ass plays an important role generally speaking the ass has an entirely different meaning in the mediterranean countries than with us an economic one therefore it is a benediction when jacob says genesis chapter forty nine verse fourteen ishakar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens the above-mentioned thought is altogether oriental just as in egypt the new-born son is a bull-calf in the rest of the orient it can easily be an ass's foal to whom the vine is the nurse hence the picture in the blessing of jacob where it is said of judah his eyes are ruddy with wine and his teeth white with milk the mock crucifix of the palatine with an ass's head evidently alludes to a very significant background to nature while about thy veil i lingered playing and like any bud upon thee hung still i felt thy heart in every strain sound about my heart that shook and clung while i groped with faith and painful yearning to your picture glowing and unfurled still i found a place for all my burning tears and for my love i found a world to the sun my heart before all others turned and felt its potent magicry and it called the stars its little brothers and it called the spring god's melody and each breeze in groves or woodlands fruity held thy spirit and that same sweet joy moved the wellsprings of my heart with beauty those were golden days without alloy where the spring is cool in every valley and the youngest bush and twig is green and about the rocks the grasses rally and the branches show the sky between there i lay imbibing every flower in a rapt intoxicated glee and surrounded by a golden shower from their heights the clouds sank down to me often as a weary wandering river longs to join the ocean's placid mirth i have wept and lost myself for ever in the fullness of thy love o earth then with all the ardour of my being forth i rushed from time's slow apathy like a pilgrim home from travel fleeing to the arms of rapt eternity blessed be childhood's golden dreams their power hid from me life's dismal poverty all the heart's rich germs ye brought to flower things i could not reach ye gave to me in the beauty and thy light o nature free from care and from compulsion free fruitful love attained a kingly stature rich as harvests reaped in arcady that which brought me up is dead and riven dead the youthful world which was my shield and this breast which used to harbour heaven dead and dry as any stubble field still my spring-like sorrows sing and cover with their friendly comfort every smart but the morning of my life is over and the spring is faded from my heart shadows are the things that once we cherished love itself must fade and cannot bide since the golden dreams of youth have perished even friendly nature's self has died heart poor heart those days could never show it how far off thy home and where it lies now alas thou never more wilt know it if a dream of it does not suffice palinodia what gathers about me earth in your dusky friendly green what are you blowing towards me winds what do you bring again there is a rustling in all the tree-tops why do you wake my soul why do ye stir in me the past ye kind ones o oh, spare me and let them rest o oh, do not mock those ashes of my joy o oh, change your changeless gods and grow in your youth over the old ones and if you would be akin to the mortals the young girls will blossom for you and the young heroes will shine and sweeter than ever morning will play upon the cheeks of the happy ones 
and ravishing sweet you will hear the songs of those who are without care ah once the living waves of song surged out of every bush to me and still the heavenly ones glanced down upon me their eyes shining with joy the separation from the blessedness of childhood from youth even has taken the golden glamour from nature and the future's hopeless emptiness but what robs nature of its glamour and life of its joy is the poison of the retrospective longing which harks back in order to sink into its own depths empedocles thou seekest life and a godly fire springs to thee gushing and gleaming from the deeps of the earth and with shuddering longing throws thee down into the flames of etna so through a queen's wanton whim pearls are dissolved in wine restrain her not didst thou not throw thy riches poet into the bright and bubbling cup still thou art holy to me as the power of earth which took thee away lovely assassin and i would have followed the hero to the depths had love not held me this poem betrays the secret longing for the maternal depths he would like to be sacrificed in the chalice dissolved in wine like pearls the crater of rebirth yet love holds him within the light of day the libido still has an object for the sake of which life is worth living but were this object abandoned then the libido would sink into the realm of the subterranean the mother who brings forth again obituary unfinished poem daily i go a different path sometimes into the green wood sometimes to the bath in the spring or to the rocks where the roses bloom from the top of the hill i look over the land yet nowhere thou lovely one nowhere in the light do i find thee and in the breezes my words die away the sacred words which once we had i thou art far away o holy countenance and the melody of thy life is kept from me no longer overheard and ah where are thy magic songs which once soothed my heart with the peace of heaven how long it is how long the youth is aged the very earth itself which once smiled on me has grown different oh farewell the soul of every day departs and departing turns to thee and over thee there weeps the eye that becoming brighter looks down there where thou tarriest this distinctly suggests a renunciation an envy of one's own youth that time of freedom which one would like to retain through a deep-rooted dislike to all duty and endeavour which is denied an immediate pleasure reward painstaking work for a long time and for a remote object is not in the nature of child or primitive man it is difficult to say if this can really be called laziness but it seems to have not a little in common with it in so far as the psychic life on a primitive stage be it of an infantile or archaic type possesses an extreme inertia and irresponsibility in production and non-production the last stanza portends evil a gazing towards the other land the distant coast of sunrise or sunset love no longer holds the poet the bonds with the world are torn and he calls loudly for assistance to the mother achilles lordly son of the gods because you lost your loved one you went to the rocky coast and cried aloud to the flood till the depths of the holy abyss heard and echoed your grief from the far reaches of your heart down deep down far from the clamour of ships deep under the waves in a peaceful cave dwelt the beautiful thetis she who protected you the goddess of the sea mother of the youth was she the powerful goddess she who once had lovingly nursed him on the rocky shore of his island she who had made him a hero with the might of her strengthening bath and the powerful song of the waves 
and the mother mourning hearkened to the cry of her child and rose like a cloud from the bed of the sea soothing with tender embraces the pains of her darling and he listened while she caressing promised to soften his grief son of the gods oh were i like you then could i confidently call on the heavenly ones to hearken to my secret grief but never shall i see this i shall bear the disgrace as if i never belonged to her even though she thinks of me with tears beneficent ones and yet ye hear the lightest prayers of men ah how rapt and fervently i have worshipped you holy light since i have lived the earth and its fountains and woodlands father ether and my heart has felt you about me so ardent and pure o oh, soften my sorrows ye kind ones that my soul may not be silenced may not be struck dumb too early that i may live and thank ye o oh, heavenly powers with joyful songs through all the hurrying days thank ye for gifts of the past for the joys of vanished youth and then pray take me the lonely one graciously unto yourselves these poems describe more plainly than could be depicted with meagre words the persistent arrest and the constantly growing estrangement from life the gradual deep immersion into the maternal abyss of the individual being the apocalyptic song of patmos is strangely related to the songs of retrogressive longing it enters as a dismal guest surrounded by the mist of the depths the gathering clouds of insanity bred through the mother in it the primitive thoughts of the myth the suggestion clad in symbols of the sun-like death and resurrection of life again burst forth similar things are to be found in abundance among sick people of this sort i reproduce some significant fragments from patmos near is the god and hard to comprehend but where danger threatens the rescuer appears these words mean that the libido has now sunk to the lowest depths where the danger is great faust part two mother scene there the god is near there man may find the inner sun his own nature sun-like and self-renewing hidden in the mother womb like the sun in the night-time in chasms and in darkness dwell the eagles and fresh and fearlessly the sons of the alps pass swiftly over the abyss upon lightly swinging bridges with these words the dark fantastic poem passes on the eagle the bird of the sun dwells in darkness the libido has hidden itself but high above it the inhabitants of the mountains pass probably the gods ye are walking above in the light symbols of the sun wandering across the sky like the eagle flying over the depths above and around are reared the summits of time and the loved ones though near live on deeply separated mountains so give us waters of innocence and give us wings of true understanding with which to pass across and to return again the first is a gloomy picture of the mountains and of time although caused by the sun wandering over the mountains the following picture a nearness and at the same time separation of the lovers and seems to hint at life in the underworld where he is united with all that once was dear to him and yet cannot enjoy the happiness of reunion because it is all shadows and unreal and devoid of life here the one who descends drinks the waters of innocence the waters of childhood the drink of rejuvenation so wings may grow and winged he may soar up again into life like the winged sun which arises like a swan from the water wings to pass across and to return again so i spoke and lo a genie carried me off swifter than i had imagined and farther than ever i had thought from my own house it grew dark as i went in the twilight the shadowy wood and the yearning brooks of my homeland grew vague behind me and i knew the country no longer after the dark and obscure words of the introduction wherein the poet expresses the prophecy of what is to come the sun journeys begins night journey in the sea towards the east towards the ascent towards the mystery of eternity and rebirth of which nietzsche also dreams and which he expressed 
insignificant words oh how could i not be ardent for eternity and for the nuptial ring of rings the ring of the return never yet have i found the woman from whom i wish children unless she would be this woman whom i love for i love thee o eternity herdelin expresses this same longing in a beautiful symbol the individual traits of which are already familiar to us but soon in a fresh radiance mysteriously blooming in golden smoke with the rapidly growing steps of the sun making a thousand summits fragrant asia arose and dazzled i sought one whom i knew for unfamiliar to me were the broad roads where from timolus comes the gilded pactole and taurus stands and Masagis, and the gardens are full of flowers but high up in the light the silvery snow gleams a silent fire and as a symbol of eternal life on the impassable walls grows the ancient ivy and carried by columns of living cedars and laurels are the solemn divinely built palaces the symbol is apocalyptic the maternal city in the land of eternal youth surrounded by the verdure and flowers of imperishable spring the poet identifies himself here with john who lived on patmos who was once associated with the son of the highest and saw him face to face there at the mystery of the vine they met there at the hour of the holy feast they gathered and feeling the approach of death in his great quiet soul the lord pouring out his last love spoke and then he died much could be said of it how his triumphant glance the happiest of all was seen by his companions even at the last therefore he sent the spirit unto them and the house trembled solemnly and with distant thunder the storm of god rolled over the cowering heads where deep in thought the heroes of death were assembled now when he imparting appeared once more before them then the kingly day the day of the sun was put out and the gleaming sceptre formed of his rays was broken and suffered like a god itself yet it shall return and glow again when the right time comes End of section 27